So hey guys, how are you all? Welcome to Unisafan Fiction 2M, so we are back with a brand new movie on what if Naruto was found and raised by Booster Gold movie but before we start, be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video, now let's begin the story. The man, the myth, the legend, Gold Roger had been captured by the marines, a pirate that had the skill and power to circumnavigate the dangerous stretch of sea that wound around the world known as the Grand Line reaching the final island there and attaining the title of king of the pirates so it came as a shock to the entire world that this man had been apprehended by the marines after evading them for so long with plenty of close calls along the way and now he was here about to be executed in logatown the place of his birth a fitting and ironic end as far as the marines were concerned this man was to be an example to all pirates to dissuade any that would believe that they could act outside of the world government's laws and disrupt public order the large man was walked to the top of the execution platform flanked by the two men that would be his executioners, despite being cuffed and with little to no chance of escape, the pirate king had a smile on his face, his mere presence had a gravity that silenced the usually bustling square as the bystanders watched with bated breath and wide eyes. The executioners made Roger kneel that way the grim affair could be done, all the while the smile on his face was still present, before the deed could be carried out, one brave soul spoke up from the crowd with a question that would spark a new era on the sea. The bystander asked Gold Roger, the king of the pirates, where he kept his great treasure. My treasure? Well, anyone that wants it can have it, but to find it you'll have to search the world. I left it all in that place. The pirate king's smile grew even wider from his declaration, watching the crowd go into an uproar at the world shaking news before his execution went through, and the pirate king officially died, but his words had kicked up a powerful storm in the world. The great age of pirates had begun, on a certain island in the Grand Line. On this island of soap bubbles near the massive red line, the landmass that split the world into forts in conjunction with the grand line running perpendicular to it, in a certain bar were two people that had just heard the news of the pirate king's passing. A woman was standing behind the bar's counter, cleaning the glasses and looking at the man that sat in a stool in front of her. A single empty glass was in front of the man, slight wetness in his eyes from the news of his captain's death but ultimately decided not to dwell on it. Roger would be laughing his head off if he knew his right-hand man, the dark king Silver's Rayleigh was crying over his death. The woman took her cigarette out of her mouth, put the glass away with her free hand, and let out a puff of smoke, looking to the man that had a solemn smile on his face, the woman leaned over the counter and addressed him. Wow, I never expected the great Ray Sand to be a crier, she teased the man in an attempt to lighten the mood. The man adjusted the glasses on his face and let out a wry laugh as he brought his head up to look the woman in the face, now, Shaki Chan, even I can read the occasion and act appropriately. He answered and pushed the glass to the now named Shaki, an unspoken request for a refill that she obliged. Does it hurt? She asked, turning serious as she placed the alcoholic beverage onto the counter. I'd like to say it doesn't since Roger chose this, but it does. Rayleigh lifted his glasses to rub his eyes and smiled. No use crying about it, though. Life goes on and he went out on his own terms. Not many men on the sea with our profession can say that. Rayleigh chuckled and got up from the stool. Well, Ray San. Shaggy put out her cigarette and looked to the man as he went to leave, what are you planning to do now? You are retired now, after all, she walked out from behind the counter and stood behind him, smirk still present on her face. I think I am going to go traveling a little to get my mind off things, Roger's death will change the world as we know it and whether it's for the better will be seen, the new generation will have to take the helm now, Rayleigh answered the woman. Traveling? You'd think that you had your fill of that, Shaggy quipped, don't you think you should lay low for a bit, Ray San? No doubt the Marines and the world government are still on the lookout for you, the woman pointed out to the man. Maybe they are, but I've still got fight in me, and how long do you plan on disappearing on me this time? She giggled at the look the man gave. I won't be gone that long, Shaki Chan, like I said, I am just going for a walkabout to get my mind off things, he defended himself. Your last one lasted for about a year, I believe, she teased the man harder and watched him sweat drop at the fact she used that against him. Sigh I was hoping that with you being forced into retirement. You'd finally make an honest woman of me, Ray San. The woman closed one eye and looked at the man that was unamused with all her teasing. An honest woman? Last I looked, you rip people off with this bar of yours, Rayleigh deadpan to the unapologetic woman. Gotta make a living somehow, Ray San. It's hard out there for a young lady like me, she shrugged. The former first mate of the Pirate King kept quiet, knowing that pointing out that the young lady wasn't so young would only end in pain. I am sure you'll manage without me for a bit, Shaki Chan. Rayleigh smiled and walked with a pack slung over his shoulder. Try not to stay out too long this time, Ray San, Shaki waved the man out. Come on, I am not that bad, four years later, today, October 10th. 
On an island in the South Blue Triplets were born to Minato Namikaze and his wife Kashina Uzumaki. The first to be brought into the world was Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze. An apparent carbon copy of his father complete with blonde hair and ocean blue eyes and oddly enough whisker marks on his face. The next to come was named Menma Uzumaki Namikaze who inherited the red hair of the Uzumakis only his was more of a blood crimson coloring that in the right lighting could appear black and he also had whisker marks on his face, and finally, the only girl of the triplets being Natsumi Uzumaki Namikaze who, like her eldest brother was with their father, was the spitting image of her mother with similar hair color and violet eyes. The three newborns were currently sleeping soundly after the ordeal that had befallen their island only a few hours prior, in fact, it had started mere minutes from their birth. Not even ten minutes of being in the world, the babes were stolen from their parents by a mysterious masked man that intended to steal the being known as the nine-tailed fox from within the container. Kashina, the fox was a rampaging beast made of energy that was found on their tiny island with its true explanation and origins being lost to time but believed to predate the Rakuto Senen. Somehow the masked man had located the expectant parents despite the great lengths they had gone through to hide the birth, knowing that Kashina would weaken during the process and her seal holding the beast along with her. The man had shown his ruthlessness as he killed the nurses that were attending, one of them being the wife of Hiruzen Serutobi, the third Hokage of Konohagakure, he threatened the children's lives without hesitation, going as far as to plant explosive tags onto the crib containing them forcing the father to get the infants out of range of the man before he could detonate them. Not too long after, through a series of events that allowed Minato to rescue Kashina and bring her to the children, he managed to use teleportation to move the great beast outside of the safe house he left his family, it took convincing, but the man had managed to get his wife on board with resealing the fox into their newborns. Unfortunately, the mon's sacrifice didn't come to light as his predecessor. Knowing what Minato would most likely be planning, had knocked him unconscious and decided to lay his own life on the line to protect his village and avenge his wife, hoping that he'd be able to see her again. The aged man used a powerful forbidden technique to seal the beast reluctantly into the infants, but the demon wasn't going to take being imprisoned lying down and resisted the man who was struggling because of his age. When it seemed that the Serutobi would fail in his endeavor, slowly dying from the strain that the technique placed on his old body and brought to a knee on the verge of losing consciousness. Naruto opened his eyes with a fussed expression and with no real way of knowing the situation and never having seen either of the two in front of him before the blonde babe was clearly perturbed and let out a cry, the cry while loud enough to draw the attention of the old monkey, had the odd effect of stilling the beast for a split almost imperceptible second which Serutobi capitalized on as he finished his technique. The man used this ability to split the fox into three pieces, the yin half of its chakra, the yang half, and the soul. An. Yeah, I know but it's for reasons. Reasons I tell you. The man hoped that the extraction of the soul from the chakra would protect the children from the influence that the fox could attempt to exert from within in them. The caveat to this was the fact that the soul would still need to be contained or it would simply join with one or both halves of the chakra effectively making the split a moot point. With the last of his strength, the former Hokage placed the young half of the fox's chakra into Menma and the yin half into Natsumi as the younger two had less developed coils that would allow them to grow accustomed to it over time, this left Naruto to receive the fox's soul since his coils at this point would have been too far along to handle the chakra, but the soul had its own power. It could overwhelm the babe and end his life, it could subjugate his soul and take over, or, the most unlikely event, Naruto could survive the soul of the fox and suppress it within his body but that would take an extremely powerful force of will and that is something that would be unheard of in an infant. Though the third had, for some reason, faith that this baby was far more than he seemed and would be able to survive. I am sorry, young one, this burden being thrust upon you and your siblings is unfair. But I am sure you'll all be fine, the former Hokage looked into the blonde boy's curious eyes. A sense of guilt burgeoning in the pit of his stomach when the small human gave him an innocent smile before he was forced to place the demon's soul into him tears coming from his eyes when the baby started to cry in. What he assumed was pain, but when the third steeled himself and calmed, the baby had too, an odd reaction as the baby seemed honed in on the old man rather than himself, before the man could contemplate this, he was met with his successor and his still weak wife standing before him. Here is an. What did you do? Minato asked, running to the old man and laying him on the ground. Konoha needs you, Minato an old man like me can't keep up with everything happening. I was able to seal the Kayubi into the children, they'll need you to teach them control. Kashina, and mini Minato here contains the soul of the beast, the man coughed before continuing, I've no idea what that could do to him, but he is special, these three will need you both to protect them from the mastermind of this attack and get them ready to face the world, and with that Hiruzen Serutobi died not knowing the future that awaited the young blonde with his family and the grand adventure had set out on. A few days later, come again, Tsunade. 
Minato asked in a hospital room where his wife was laying in a bed beside him, Menma and Natsumi in her arms as they watched the renowned medical ninja, who had been called back thanks to the catastrophe that had occurred, run her hands over the baby Naruto. It's like I said, this kid has the chakra necessary to live, but nothing else, Tsunade looked to the parents who seemed flabbergasted at this news. You can't be serious, Kashina was in disbelief, I am, he isn't going to be anything special in the ninja corp, he most likely wouldn't make it through the academy without a special curriculum for the civilian level ninja, the only thing he's got going is the soul of Kyubi in him, and even I can't understand how it was possible for a baby to overcome that, but it doesn't have any bearing on his skill, Tsunade explained turning to the family. How is he going to be the heir of the clan, then? Kashina looked to her husband, seemingly disappointed at this revelation. He won't, he can't, Minato frowned, looking to his other children. With what is going to be happening in the future we need the next generation of ninja to be the strongest yet. And with Menma and Natsumi becoming Jinchuriki they have arguably the most potential of the future genin. That masked man will no doubt be coming back for the Kyubi since he failed, not to mention staving off the bolder pirates that come through as well, everyone needs to be able to step up and having the eldest son of a well-known clan be unable to uphold and symbolize the will of fire and the strength that Konoha has won be a morale booster, Minato sighed and looked at the sleeping baby by Tsunade. So, what are you going to do? Tsunade asked, you plan on naming Menma the heir of the Uzumaki and Namikaze and what'll you do with Naruto? Tsunade crossed her arms with a raised eyebrow. He can join the academy and try and make something of himself, but in the end, hell hopefully throw in the towel rather than be an embarrassment, Minato stated resolute in his choice. Looking to his wife he saw her give a solemn nod in agreement. If you think that's for the best, Tsunade handed the baby back to the mother, and how do you plan on explaining the situation to the populace? They still want answers on what happened. We decided to say that someone from Iwa was the culprit behind the attack, it would be understandable that they'd want some form of revenge on us for the war and it's better than saying an unknown party had infiltrated the village and had managed to cause such destruction on his own, Kashina answered the question. Using the propaganda to sway the general public would cover up the real culprit and get them riled up to avenge their lost third Hokage and the myriad of lives lost because of the fox's rampage. A tad underhanded, but it would ultimately get people in the proper mindset to improve themselves and fire them up to protect their village and way of life. Very well then, quite a task lays ahead of us, and I feel like you'll need more sake to get through it, Tsunade groaned while rubbing her temple. Later that day, the fourth Hokage, Minato Namikaze finally addressed the Konoha shinobi and citizens on the crisis that had unexpectedly befallen them. To say that the populace was outraged by the attack from Iwa that made them lose their previous leader was an understatement. But they were calmed in knowing that he had given his life to ensure that the attack would be a failure in the end. If not for the two infants housing the halves of the demonic beast's chakra they would have been doomed, on the other hand, knowing that the beast essentially lived on within the Hokage's eldest didn't sit well with them having the demon possibly living among them as if its sins could be absolved by inhabiting the boy, it was wrong, and it would have to suffer for those transgressions. Eight years later, an. Yeah, a lot of time jumping but it's establishing, btw Luffy is seven right now. A young blonde was sent flying out of a ring by a punch from a now eight-year-old Menma, the younger brother sighed in disappointment at the heir of the Uzumaki clan and didn't regard his older brother in any meaningful way as the bruised blonde picked his up off the ground. Great job again, Menma. Uruka wrote down the prodigy's score on the clipboard in his hand before moving down the list and giving the untalented sibling a zero as was the norm in the academy. I don't even know why that loser keeps trying, Natsumi shook her head on the sidelines, her hair now in a ponytail as she watched through half-lidded eyes the blonde failure dusting himself off yet still had a goofy smile on his face. Ah man, I almost got you this time, Naruto walked up to his siblings seemingly not hearing the insult that his sister threw his way but was stopped by a wall of people. Step off. You get any closer, dead last, and that stench will rub off on Natsumi Chan. A wild looking boy snarled at the blonde, ready to get rough. You're so dirty, Naruto Baka. Menma kun can't be near you. A pink haired girl stood haughtily in front of the indifferent crimson haired boy that made his way into the academy building with his sister and the rest of the entourage. Yeah, I guess you're right. Naruto rubbed the back of his head, trailing behind the large group of classmates since there was no opening to walk with his family. The blonde was used to this. He was normally ignored in class and left behind in every subject. The nickname Dead Last stemmed from the fact that he was consistently at the bottom of the class without ever moving up in status. His parents had tried to dissuade the blonde from joining the academy in order to save face, knowing that their eldest would be far from extraordinary, but even they were slightly shocked at the level of inept he was. Naruto couldn't pass any of the Konoha history tests, missed all targets in weapons practice, and hadn't won a single spar, 
though he was normally pitted against his brother or sister which didn't do him any favors. Naruto truly was a failure as a ninja, yet the blonde still attended every class diligently and kept a smile on his face through the ridicule he endured. His classmates honestly wondered if the blonde was crazy with how optimistic he seemed despite the bleak future that would most likely meet him once the academy was finished. A lot had changed in Konoha during the siblings' formative years. For one the academy now had the children train until the age of 18 to ensure they would be in their prime once they became genin with the clan children practically guaranteed to rise quickly up the ranks, not to mention that the academy was much more rigorous now so the children would need to try all the harder to stay in the academy, those that couldn't handle it had dropped out of their own volition, our blonde had stayed even with his poor performance in the vain hope of improving. The reason for these changes, officially, the Hokage told his forces that the execution of the Pirate King had caused an influx of rookie pirates who were trying to make a name for themselves even though the elemental nations had a reputation in South Blue, being known for being unaffiliated with the world government and therefore had no marine presence, these pirates bit the bullet for a chance at fame. And officially, he was preparing Konoha for whatever the masked man could be planning and when the time came for Konoha to become the dominant village on the island, deflecting the nefarious plan of the masked man seemed to fade further into the background as there hadn't been hide nor hair of him since the attack eight years ago. That's it for today, class dismissed, Uruka released the students, watching as they all gravitated around the two Uzumaki Namikaze siblings with the only exception being Menma's self-proclaimed rival Sasuke Uchiha. The sole survivor of the Uchiha clan massacre and well-known brooder didn't fraternize with any of his class, which was fine by him, the boy was consistently third place in the academy, infuriating him as he devoted himself wholly to training but couldn't surpass the Hokage's children. Outside the academy, the children were showering praise on the two top students, an impenetrable mob hung off every word they spoke, offering their two cents as little as it mattered to the two. Man, Menma, you're amazing. Perfect scores again. This stuff is too easy, mom and dad's training is way harder than what we'd ever do here, Natsumi casually rebuffed the compliment, academy training was basic as hell to them, but even their powerful father couldn't keep them from going through the proper channels to become genin. Figures, you troublesome redheads have the hero of the third shinobi war and the red hot habanero training you, it's no wonder you'd think this stuff is easy, a pineapple haired boy sighed. Maybe if you applied yourself a little more, Shikamaru, you could be as good as Menma kun or at least close to it a platinum blonde girl rolled her eyes. Anyo, men Makun, maybe you could help me, with my taijutsu, a timid girl prodded her index fingers together, I am having trouble. Sure, Hanada-chan, anything for you, Menma answered the girl to the ire of the other girls. While this mob was chatting with the two siblings, the blonde brother was making his way out the door and took notice of the gathering, seeing that he had no chance to make his way to see his family. The blonde settled for the only light in the village that cared for him and it came in the form of a small wolf pup that ran up to him in greeting. Inu Chan. Naruto smiled, crouching to catch the small dog as it licked his face and making the blonde laugh, while an unoriginal name, seeing as the boy was young, the blonde cherished the small puppy as his only friend in the village. The blonde had been exploring the village late at night. Seeing as his parents were so focused on his brother and sister, they rarely noticed that Naruto wouldn't come home for days on end unless he needed a new set of clothing, on one particular night, the blonde came across the lost pup as it collapsed from exhaustion and wounds most likely being attacked and losing its parents in the process, Naruto took the struggling pup in and had nursed him back to health, eventually letting it go when he could take care of himself. Unfortunately, the blonde met with some of the ornerier citizens of Konoha that would assault him occasionally. Led by Iruka's assistant Mizuki a lot of the time, being used to the harm the blonde, curled into a ball and took the abuse never understanding the hatred or the words spewed from their mouths about him being the reincarnation of the Kayubi, from Naruto's perspective, his siblings were the containers of the Kayubi, so why was he targeted by the angry and bitter ninja and citizens of his home? Once they had their fill of beating the poor boy, he laid there waiting until the pain subsided enough so he could drag himself home, he never looked forward to those conversations with his parents, not after the first time. Mommy. Some sob people beat me up on the way home, the young Naruto cried to his mother. Sai Naruto, crying isn't going to solve your problems, Kashina dressed the boy's wounds, it just shows your weakness, and means that they'll just come back and do it again. Sob so, what do I do? Fight back, or grit your teeth and bear it, Kashina finished patching up the boy, got up and looked indifferently to the boy, and to make sure you learn, I won't be dressing any wounds from now on unless they're life-threatening. Since then the blonde had tried to heed his mother's words, but after failing to fight back he had come to fleeing whenever this happened or enduring the pain and that night was one where he had to take the abuse. Luckily for him, the small puppy had sniffed him out and with surprising strength dragged him to its home which, of course, was the well-known training ground 44 aka the Forest of Death, 
and that had become his camping spot whenever he didn't return home, which had become more frequent as the years went on, since the rescue, the two couldn't be seen without the other being close by as the pup would wait for the blonde outside of the academy every day. Nah, I still failed today Inu Chan, but I lasted a lot longer than normal in the spar. The boy spoke to the small animal as if it had asked him a question, I think we should celebrate, the blonde boy cheered. The students all looked at the pitiful display with raised eyebrows or outright disgust, watching the blonde talk to himself to offset his loneliness. What do you think we should have tonight? Naruto asked the puppy as it tilted its head in mock thought and yipped, No way, Inu chan. I can't get a hold of that without money, Naruto ruffled the pup's head. How sad can you get? Natsumi groaned in embarrassment, raking her hand down her face and watched between her fingers as Menma pushed his way through the crowd to his brother. When the blonde managed to get Inu off him, he took notice of his brother approaching and shot up straight, Naruto didn't really get to interact with his siblings outside of the occasional spar since his parents would monopolize their time by teaching them to control the Kyubi's chakra. Menma kun. H hey, what's up? Naruto was ecstatic but his companion was less welcoming as Inu growled at the boy. The boy simply tsked at his sibling and looked down at the puppy with a dead stare, scaring the pup behind the blonde but it didn't stop it from growling from behind Naruto. You know, you really got me again that time, Naruto ignored the stare that his brother gave him as he rubbed the back of his head, I don't think you'll ever be able to get ya, but at least I lasted longer, right? Naruto rambled on as he talked about how challenging the academy was for him, the blood-red-haired Uzumaki grit his teeth as his anger rose before reaching its boiling point. Why are you still here? Menma gripped the blonde's collar and got into his face, all you've been doing is failing since getting here. You're dragging mom and dad's names through mud each time you show up. Menma pushed the blonde onto the dirt, you'd do everyone a favor if you just disappeared, Naruto. I can't, I gotta become a ninja so mom and dad can be proud of me, I still have a chance to be a ninja, same as you guys, Naruto argued. You've got no chance, Naruto, mom and dad have already told us that you aren't gonna be the clan heir. Natsumi said nonchalantly, revealing the news but didn't seem to care since she was leaning against the wall with a side glance to her eldest brother. Naruto didn't seem shocked though, continuing to smile, if a tad more strained, with his head down and hair shadowing his eyes, the blonde boy thumbed his nose and looked back up. I know, it isn't that hard to figure out, I can't do anything right, but I thought if I did better, then they'd care about me and what I did, like with you guys. You'll never be like us, Natsumi leaned her head against her fist and with no emotion in her voice, uncaring of the emotional pain she inflicted on her sibling. Naruto's eyes widened and rather than say anything he ran out of the academy's clearing and into the village proper, Inu quickly followed him, hoping to comfort the boy, the assorted students weren't all that affected by the harsh words, the blonde was the dead last of the class and had shown time and again that he wasn't cut out for the harsh life of a shinobi, so it was for the best that he was made to give up. In the village, Naruto ran through the village with his head down, fighting back the tears that were threatening to come out as his mother's voice rang in his head, he rubbed at his eyes constantly to keep the wetness from spilling over, causing him to bump into someone. Hum, well, well, seems the demon's gone and assaulted me, the citizen, clearly drunk, gripped the blonde by the shoulder and kicked the pup away when it attempted to bite him. I am sorry, Naruto muttered, clenching his eyes shut in preparation for whatever was in store. You'll be sorry all right, you little brat, Hokage S.A. Mall probably be happy that I got rid of a stain like you, the man made to bring a fist down but it never came as he suddenly passed out, landing on the ground like a sack of dirt and foaming at the mouth. I don't think I've ever been to an island where a grown man would beat a child, a mysterious man with strawberry blonde hair and wearing small, round glasses in a cloak helped the young blonde up off the ground, are you alright? Naruto could hardly believe his eyes, someone had helped him, no one helped him, the boy looked at his savior in awe, believing him to be stronger than his dad, but that couldn't be possible, looking to the unconscious man. Naruto was hard pressed to disprove that idea seeing as even his father had to hit someone to defeat them. The blonde was snapped out of his headspace by the waving hand of the mysterious traveler, giving a smile the blonde boy was waved the mon's concern off and put his hands behind his head. I am fine. Thanks for the save though, Gramps, Naruto beamed at the man. Gramps? Rayleigh sweat dropped, he wasn't that old, and here was this kid calling him Gramps. Shaki would have a field day if she were to find out about this come to think of it had been on his walkabout for quite a long time, he was going to catch hell when he got back to Sabodi. Hey, Earth to Gramps, Naruto called, him and Inu watching the tall man stare into space. Oh, yes, what is it? Rayleigh asked the boy, I was asking you where you came from, I've haven't seen you before and normally people, well, I haven't seen you before. 
Rayleigh caught the blonde's slip but chose not to pry seeing as it wasn't his business, I am just passing through, I won't be here for too long, and with the trouble I've caused, it'd be best if I left sooner rather than later, Rayleigh answered the curious boy and continued to walk down the main road with the blonde and puppy following him while running in circles around him excitedly. I can help you out Gramps, Naruto said with a finger pointed to himself and a smirk on his face. Really? he asked skeptically with a raised eyebrow and a smirk. Don't doubt the great Uzumaki Naruto. Me and Inu-chan can take you to a safe place where you don't have to worry about anyone coming to look for you as thanks for helping me out. Naruto then ran off without waiting for an answer, stopped a good distance away and looked back, bouncing on his feet, come on, Gramps. The man chuckled good-naturedly and decided there was nothing to lose in humoring the boy, after all, it was either follow the young blonde to whatever haven he made for himself or shadily find a place to stay and pay off any hotel owner to keep his identity a secret, with that thought, the former pirate followed the young blonde, watching as the sunset rolled over to give way to the night. After a few minutes of walking the duo and pup were met with the encompassing fence of the forest of death, Naruto ran to the fence and peeled the corner of it back, showing a makeshift entrance that the boy must have used extensively due to the quickness he displayed in finding the close to invisible secret entrance. Want your parents be curious where you are? Rayleigh asked the excited blonde who hesitated and rubbed the back of his head. No, it's fine, they won't worry about me, I stay out here all the time, I only go home when I need something, Naruto answered without looking back at the curious man. And they wouldn't want to know about you being attacked? No way, I am tough so, they have nothing to worry about, Naruto Uzumaki is the toughest around the boy then tripped mid-sentence, stubbing his toe on a root of one of the giant trees, Ah, oh, my toe, he bawled. What was that about being tough? Rayleigh's sweat dropped. I am, I just got surprised is all. Naruto defended himself, instantly drying up as if the accident hadn't happened and the only evidence being the boy wiping his eyes. The former pirate raised his eyebrow at the unnatural speed at which the young boy had gotten over his fit and continued to follow him to a small camp. It was nothing special as it had some smaller branches from the tree propped up on each other for a tent with leaves on top to keep the moisture out in the event it rained. There was also a makeshift fire pit with sticks of varying sizes around it most likely to cook any food the blonde managed to catch. Honestly, it made the retired pirate wonder why this boy was apparently living in a forest rife with hidden dangers and didn't simply return to his home, to his family, to live, and why weren't his parents around when he was about to be beaten by some drunk stranger. Lucky for you, I've still got some meat I managed to get from the butcher and it's still good, Naruto started a fire while Inu dragged the meat to his side and the blonde proceeded to stab each slab onto a cooking stick. Well, that's very kind of you. Rayleigh took a seat across from the blonde, noticing the giddiness the child had while he waited for the food to cook, Inu leaning against his side. You said that you're a traveler, Gramps? Naruto couldn't contain himself and asked his burning question. That's right, I doubt there's an ocean I haven't sailed on. That means you've been to the other blues? You must be a pretty strong guy, Gramps? Naruto's jaw dropped. I am no one special, just trying to get in some sightseeing before settling down and retiring for good. Rayleigh held his tongue on his pirate status, if the boy found out about him being a pirate, he'd most likely shout to the heavens, and that would bring unnecessary danger to the island, looking at the boy, Rayleigh did wonder something that he voiced, why the interest? Well, the elemental nations are self-succulent, or something, so we don't interact with any other islands, there aren't even any of those seagull guys on the island cause we aren't part of that big team thing, so, I'd always been curious what it's like out there, I've even thought about traveling, too, Naruto looked into the fire, its flames reflecting in his eyes. Maybe they'd care then, Rayleigh was in his own thoughts at the same time, a hand on his chin and eyes closed, I think I remember hearing about this island before during the voyage, an island filled with people with abilities that could give devil fruit users an honest fight, powerful enough to resist the world government's hold, as well, what a nice island I've found myself on, Rayleigh raked his hand through his hair with a wry smile, you meant to say self-sufficient? So, what are all the places you've been to, Gramps, Naruto brightened up again, practically demanding for stories of the mons travels with Inu barking in agreement. Hum, why don't we hold off on that for now? Seems the food is done. Rayleigh laughed heartily as the blonde boy deflated, not knowing that the man was sparing him from knowing the truth for his safety. The two ate in silence, that is until the boy finished his food and started to talk about himself and what he liked to do with the former pirate politely listening. Rayleigh would chime in with little jabs at the blonde's expense now and then to the indignation of the young blonde. But the boy couldn't keep the smile from his face, he finally had someone to talk to, and he wasn't even from his island, Naruto was on cloud 9, if he could help it, he'd want the man to stay for as long as possible so he wouldn't be left alone again, eventually, due to being young, the blonde turned in rather quickly, 
passing out unceremoniously on the forest floor from trying to stay awake to speak with the man. Rayleigh sighed with a smile, feeling worn out from the blonde's exuberance, watching the boy and puppy snoring on the ground for a small bit before he put them inside the shoddy tent. Once the two were comfortably sleeping inside the abode, Rayleigh took his flask out and stared into the sky contemplatively before glancing back to the blonde boy. It's their world now, right, Roger? Rayleigh saw that the boy was tossing and turning in his sleep, appearing to be in distress until Inu sidled up to him and got hugged tightly which managed to calm the boy, again. The former pirate was curious about what has happened to this boy on this island to make him this way but didn't think too hard on it, deciding to sleep for the night. The next day, ah, I am late, I stayed up way past my bedtime. Naruto panicked as he shot up, jolting the pup awake and only getting an opened eye from the man. Should you really be yelling this early? I gotta go, Gramps. But it'll be back later. The blonde ignored the man and went to rush back to the exit but stopped himself, turned back to Rayleigh and jutted his hands out in the mon's direction, don't go anywhere. Rayleigh rose an eyebrow at the request, hearing the desperation he ultimately conceded with a sigh and a nod, I can't head out into the village anyway, so I might as well stay here. The smirked when blonde looked shocked and smiled brightly, Naruto then turned around and ran waving back to Rayleigh, he'll be back around late noon, Gramps, with a surprise for you, he charged out with Inu. That was how Naruto's morning started, and the boy was kind of surprised that for the first time ever he was going to be laid to the academy. Since the blonde's goal was to be recognized by his parents and siblings. He made it a point to be on time every day, boasting the only perfect record in attendance in his class, he always either went home or to the forest after the academy, though the forest would always be where he ended up by night, trained to the point of exhaustion, and normally fell into his tent to sleep, repeating the process the next day, as hard a worker the boy was, he hadn't improved much if at all but he threw himself into it all wholeheartedly. So why was he slowing down? Why did the bright smile he had, vanish once he got far enough away from the forest of death? His steps slowed down to a stop, looking down to the ground, hurt in his eyes, he remembered the words that were hurled at him by his brother, how he was told that had never reached their level, never be the same as them, and his parents would never acknowledge him. Naruto shook his head, trying to dispel those dark thoughts, Menma and Natsumi couldn't have meant all those things. They were just giving him tough love probably because his parents told them to encourage their older brother. That was it, of course his family cared about him. How could he ever question that? Sure, he may not be the clan heir, but that doesn't mean he couldn't be useful in other ways, if he couldn't be a genin, then he could get some other job to support his family. The blonde finally made it to the academy's entrance and felt his heart pound in his chest, that awkward feeling of being the late student to class made the boy feel like a frog was in his throat as he opened the door and was met with Mizuki. Oh, Mizuki sensei, sorry, I am late I overslept, the boy got nervous, knowing the mon's stance on him and standing out here on his own made him uncomfortable, Inu also growled at the mon's smug smirk as he lorded over the boy like some kind of deity. Naruto, I can't believe you'd blot you perfect attendance like this, the man played up disappointment. It happens, I didn't mean to oversleep, I just happened to stay up a bit later than normal, Naruto pleaded with the teacher, watching the cruel smile spread on the mon's face. I couldn't possibly ignore such a blatant disregard for your learning. You need the most improvement of the entire class, but you'd play hooky rather than try and better yourself. Mizuki crouched down to look the boy in his eyes, a cruel glint shining within his own, I am sorry, Naruto, but you'll have to stay out here for the day. The boy was dumbfounded at this punishment and before he could vocally announce his objection, Mizuki stopped him dead in his tracks. I don't want to do this to you, Naruto, but it's the only way you'll learn just how important education is. It keeps you from becoming the dreg that the village thinks you are. Mizuki even sold the pity by tearing up as if it hurt him to do this to the boy. Trust me, Naruto, this is for your own good. The door was then slammed into the boy's face. Unable to process what had just happened, he was shut out of school and forced to miss a day because he was late. It was his fault for staying out late welcoming Gramps and having that feast by his standards, so he technically couldn't fault his sensei. Dejected, the boy went to the lone swing in the academy's courtyard and sat on it thinking about the failure on his part, he'd have to try even harder to make sure this mistake never happened again, he owed it to his family to make them proud of him. The day went by relatively quickly for the boy as he forced himself to sit on the swing for the entire school day for punishment, he may have the freedom to leave, but he wouldn't learn from the mistake if he used this as a free day, Inu tried to get him up to play so the boy could take his mind off things, but the boy refused. Once the flood of students made their way out of the building the boy just rose his head and watched them filter out. Smiles on their faces as they discussed the goings on of the day, praise being showered on his siblings as they all laughed together, blinding smiles on their face with boys congratulating Menma and girls fawning over his ability. Natsumi stayed to the side, the more introverted of the two, 
and politely accepted the attention that was sent her way with exasperated sighs as if she was above it all. It seemed that they were livelier than ever without him there, so Naruto thought it best to sneak out of the courtyard lest he spoils the fun. The blonde quietly removed himself from the crowd, his siblings easily noticing the boy but kept silent as they believed he had finally decided to quit to save their clan's face. Naruto walked through the main road of the village again, berating himself continually for allowing himself to be late like that. Naruto slapped his cheeks to snap himself out of his funk and yelled to the heavens, causing Inu to shoot up from the abrupt yell. I can't let this get me down. Ill just try 20 number 200 times harder. Naruto energized himself. Now, what am I gonna get for that surprise for Gramps? Naruto wondered. He noticed that last night that the man seemed to be hungry even after they had eaten, so the boy decided that today he'd get something really good for them to share. Luckily for the dirt poor blonde, the overstocked butcher that he normally acquired his food from had gotten rid of a large roast made from a specially ordered pig but hadn't sold it in the time frame had wanted leading to it being chucked in its wrapping, sure, it wasn't glamorous or anything, but it's how the blonde kept himself alive, now, though, he was happy to snag a find like this since it would be the perfect thing to share with Rayleigh tonight. Gramps is sure gonna enjoy this, right, Inu-chan? Naruto asked the pup, then his eyes bulged out and his teeth sharpened when he saw the pup attempting to chew through the wrapping, Inu. Ya little monster. Stop trying to eat ahead of us. As the blonde tried to pull the pup from the roast, the two missed a group to the side hidden in the shadows approaching them. When Inu was finally pulled off the food, that's when the group appeared in front of the blonde with Inu getting in front and started to yip at the men in a vain attempt at intimidation. In the forest of death, Rayleigh was still situated in the forest, though there was some blood from various brave animals that had sensed his presence, he managed to frighten a few, but some were foolish enough to attack out of desperation and fear so he put them down and moved the bodies out of eyesight, it was a nice way to kill time while waiting for the boy, at least. He looked up and noticed that it was getting late, raising an eyebrow the former first mate of the pirate king got up from the ground, with furrowed brows, the man looked to the exit the boy used to get in and out of the dangerous territory and frowned to himself. Something isn't right, he muttered, he remembered the circumstances he found the boy in yesterday and a slight chill went down his spine at the possibility that appeared in his mind. Rayleigh closed his eyes for a few mere seconds, before opening them and rushing out of the forest. Back in the village, Rayleigh soon found the blonde in the middle of the dirt path, bloodied and beaten in the fetal position, not too far from the boy's body was Inu, and, unlike the boy the poor animal wasn't able to survive the brutal attack, most likely having taken the most damage while trying to protect Naruto, and with all this going on, bystanders were going about their day as if a child wasn't lying beaten in the middle of the road. Kid, hey, kid, wake up. Rayleigh shook his shoulder, doing his best not to disturb him too much in case his injuries were too serious. Cough G Gramps. Naruto woke up, struggling to lift his head to look at the man but felt a jolt of pain at the movement. Hold still, it'll take you to the hospital, no, they won't help me. Then it'll take you home. Rayleigh went to grab the boy only to be stopped by a bloody hand gripping his arm. No, Naruto didn't even give a reason this time, but it was clear to the man that he didn't want to go home, it's my fault cause I am weak. Hearing this, Rayleigh went silent, I always get attacked like this and mom told me I had to fight back, when I tried it just got worse, Naruto started to break down as he finally revealed this to Rayleigh, she said that if I couldn't fight, then I had to take it, cause I am weak and can't defend myself. Rayleigh's eyes sharpened, raining in his anger and was stopped cold hearing what the blonde said next. So, it's okay, I am used to this, and as long as I don't cry, I am still listening to my parents, Naruto smiled, trying to sit himself up. Rayleigh remembered back to the time the blonde had bawled from stubbing his toe on the tree root and realized, he used that as an excuse to cry. I wanted to surprise you with this, Gramps, Naruto brought his arms from behind him to show the roast. Me and Inu-chan wanted to eat this with you cuz I could tell you were still hungry last night, then those guys showed up and said I stole it, Inu-chan tried to protect me, Naruto looked down at the end, keeping his gaze from the pup's body. Naruto, how long has this been going on? Rayleigh asked seriously, calling the boy by his name. Since, I've been five, it's okay, seriously, Rayleigh then gripped the boy's shoulders lightly to get him to stop. No, it isn't, no one should treat a child like this, no matter the reason. But mom and dad said, they're wrong, and they should be ashamed of themselves for telling you those things, Rayleigh grit his teeth, they have no right to be your parents. Naruto was left speechless, trying to find some way to defend his family's actions toward him, but found he couldn't. As an outcast, Naruto had a knack for being unseen and had witnessed many different people's interactions with those that they were close with and saw a warmth that had never experienced, 
his family treated him as a hindrance, one that stained the reputation that his parents had built for themselves because of his continued failings to the point they distanced his siblings from them, his weakness, to them, was a sin, an unforgivable one that reminded them of how worthless he was. Thinking on this the blonde wanted to cry, but the instilled lesson of his mother kept him from doing so, that is, until Rayleigh embraced the boy. It isn't a weakness to cry, you're still young, so it's the way that you should cope when the world gets to be too much, Rayleigh looked ahead as he spoke, and you aren't weak, Naruto, the strongest people that I've known and in the whole world are those that can smile when the world stomps on them, Rayleigh didn't hesitate in his words, no uncertainty as he spoke, so, cry. Naruto allowed himself to finally cry, clutching the mon's shirt as he let the years of abuse and neglect crash down on him. The pain of the beatings he suffered that he squashed down to appear stronger so his parents would care, the loneliness he felt from being ostracized by his sibling and classmates that would stab his heart every day he was subjected to it, and the loss of one of his only friends, Inu, because he couldn't stand up for himself, that maelstrom of emotions was felt from the boy vicariously by Rayleigh who stood firm as the blonde let it out until his body couldn't continue and passed out. The man then took the boy back to his camp in the forest and used his cloak to bandage him to the best of his ability, when Naruto was comfortably in the tent, the roast had fought so hard for, cooking over a fire that Rayleigh made, and Inu was given a burial next to the tent. Rayleigh took his leave once more into the village proper, a stony expression on his face as he walked in the darkness towards a specific bar. Approaching the entrance, he heard the sounds of sick joy as three men, one being Mizuki, and one being the man that Rayleigh dealt with when had first arrived, sitting at the bar's counter bragging about attacking the demon, Rayleigh strode into the bar, all eyes going to the creaking door as he walked to the counter and stopped next to the three men. That'll teach that demon. The third man laughed boisterously with a wide smile, alcohol sloshing in the glass he held and a drunk flush to his face. Going around and stealing from hard-working citizens, and the nerve to assault us, the original assaulter roared in anger, his drink seen mostly around his lips. We did good work today, boys, that demon is finally getting the point, he's coming to terms with his existence. Mizuki took a sip of his drink, letting out a satisfied sigh, he was late to the academy today, and he didn't interact with any of the students after class let out, he knows he's alone in the world. You're the men that beat him? Rayleigh turned to them with a disarming smile. Yeah, you knew or something? Feel like I've seen you before, the original thug put a hand to his chin. Rayleigh knocked his knuckles against the counter to call over the bartender, I'd like to buy these men a drink. The men were shocked that this man would buy them more drinks since he didn't know them, the bartender went to get the drinks at the former pirate's behest, especially because the man overpaid for them by a large margin, not knowing the real reason why the man had overpaid. With the drinks in front of them, the men drank, all the while still eyeing the mysterious newcomer. Thanks for the drinks, but why do that? Mizuki, as a shinobi, was suspicious. Just wanted to let you three have your last drink, Rayleigh smiled, finishing the drink he had gotten with his calm smile still present all while the men looked at him, before I kill you. That statement made the three surround the calm Rayleigh, weapons at the ready and anger present in their eyes, the patrons all looked to the commotion but soon returned to their drinks, believing the older man to be outmatched by the three attackers. You're new here, so it'll give you a warning. That thing you're trying to defend is a monster, Mizuki said to the man, who was still calmly sitting without a care. Rayleigh then looked to the men and comfortably said, I've been around for a while, I've sailed along most of the world, and I've seen real monsters, some friends and some enemies. Suddenly, an intense pressure was felt in the bar, making everyone inexplicably pass out except for the three men, who hit the floor on their knees. Th, this is, you're the one that stopped me the other day, the first thug grits out, sweat pouring down his forehead. Nice to see you remember, Rayleigh stood above the men as they looked terrified since they were at his mercy, you call that boy a monster, and yet I've only seen a child being dealt abuse and ostracization, through all that hardship he's been dealt with, he still has the strength to smile and felt no malice towards anyone, he thought it was his fault, Rayleigh crouched down to meet their eyes and asked, so tell me who the monster is again. The men were frightened on a level they thought couldn't be reached, staring into the eyes of Rayleigh and felt that they were gazing upon an entity that could challenge their Hokage, perhaps even above him. It's easy, for an outsider to talk about matters they know nothing about, Mizuki growled out, glaring at the man and grew surprised when Rayleigh outright laughed in his face. You're right, I was comfortable just passing through and not getting involved in the day to day of this island, but that little kid endeared himself to me, so I couldn't help but get attached, and I'd do anything for my friends, at end of that sentence the pressure let up on the three. Picking themselves up the men backed away, unsure what to do as they stared down the man that said he'd be killing them. Rayleigh stood in front of them a lazy look on his face as he brought a hand up, waving it in a come-on motion. I am not a cold-blooded murderer, so I am going to give you a fighting chance, 
That way you won't have any regrets when it ends, Rayleigh really smiled. Once he finished his sentence, he quickly caught the large shuriken that Mizuki had thrown from his back using only his thumb and index finger before breaking it between them. The men were stunned, watching the pieces of the ninja weapon fall to the floor. The man responsible still smiling as if it was a simple feat for him. This act made the mean truly realize how outclassed they were. Grasping at straws to survive as the two thugs begged to be spared when Mizuki shakily walked forward. I am part of this village's military. You won't get away with killing me, and you'll have the entire village looking for you after this slight against an asset. And who exactly will be able to identify me? Rayleigh countered, pointing a finger to the unconscious crowd that littered the floor. Only cowards hide behind their faction. It shows they can't stand on their own. You have to live with the consequences that your actions have led to and fight for your right to have caused them. Rayleigh cracked his knuckles, ready to end these men. The next day, Naruto shot up. A quick pain shot up his shoulder from the movement and a hand going over his bandaged eye. Remembering the events from last night, Naruto scrambled out of the tent and saw Rayleigh in front of the fire. The man looked up to see the boy and smiled, watching Naruto sit across from him. It's about time you woke up, he reached behind him, pulling a stick with a large piece of the roast stabbed on it and handed it to the boy. You said that you wanted to eat together, and you make me wait a whole day, I am getting on in years. I need nutrients at every chance I get, Rayleigh joked, grabbing his stick. Naruto didn't know what to say, what could he say? What had happened yesterday, was an awakening for the boy, he realized his place in the village for the first time, and it hurt, he opened his mouth, wanting to talk about what had happened. Yes, it all happened, Rayleigh answered the question before it could be asked and stopped the boy again as he went to speak, but you should nt dwell on it, it wasn't your fault it happened, if anyone is to blame, it's the people, and those people specifically. You mean, my family? No, a family supports each other, allowing that abuse to happen to you for years on end, they renounced any claim they could have to be your family. Rayleigh told the boy in all seriousness. Naruto looked down, letting the truth sink in before raising his head, what should I do now? He seemed lost. You said you wanted to travel, right? Why not do that? Rayleigh offered. I kinda wanted to do that so they'd care about me, I dunno what I'd do if I went out there, and I am just a kid. Naruto then had a proverbial light bulb moment, you could take me with you. Gramps, Naruto was ecstatic. Rayleigh raised a hand to stop the celebration before it could truly start. Sorry, but I am gonna have to stop that, I have to tell you the truth, Rayleigh saw the boy look at him with hurt that he was lied to and with his track record in the village that didn't sit well with him, I am not just a traveler, kid, I am a pirate, or at least I was. A pirate? I thought they were supposed to be liars, plunderers, and thieves, you aren't like that at all. And villagers are supposed to be close-knit and care about each other, Rayleigh shot back, there are all types of people in the world. Some pirates are the textbook definition that the world has given them, and some are just people out for adventure. Rayleigh recalled the pirates had met on his journey. So, you can't take me with you cause you're still being hunted? Not really, but I wouldn't be surprised either, I was pretty notorious, so taking you with me is off the table. Then what if I go out on my own later? Naruto was grasping at straws, I don't want to stay here anymore, I'd rather be anywhere but here. It will be dangerous out there, you may have the heart but you do lack the physical strength, and you're still a little crybaby, Rayleigh laughed. Then I'll get stronger, if it means I can leave, then I'll do anything no matter how long it takes. And what will you do when you leave? Rayleigh asked. What should I do, Gramps? Naruto was lost, I can't tell you, he laughed, you could just leave this island and find a new one, one where no one would know who you are and get a fresh start. Join the marines and fight injustice across the sea, if you want, or become a pirate and sail the sea for adventure but no one will look favorably on that unless they know you, Rayleigh explained. But if first was a marine, I'd have to chase you, Gramps, Naruto was horrified at the idea, why would you want me to do that? I am not steering you in any direction, you should never regret a decision you make, so I wanted to give you all your options, as long as you're happy with your choice, then it doesn't matter what I think. If first was a marine, I'd have to follow orders and all that stuff, I've had enough of that here, Naruto didn't have any interest in that having been underfoot of superiors his entire life, I'd rather be a pirate. Then no one could mess with me, and I'd get to see the world, Naruto sounded excited at the prospect. Remember, that D make you a criminal, the world won't accept you, and you'll be on an island isolated from people simply because of that. I don't care, cuz, pirates are supposed to have crews, right? Rayleigh smiled, yes, traversing the world on your own when the world itself will be your enemy necessitates allies. My crew was made up of people that could watch each other's backs and make up for weaknesses, Rayleigh pointed out. Then I'll get the best crew any ocean's ever seen, Naruto affirmed. And what will you be looking for? Rayleigh asked, 
Seeing the dim look cross the blonde's eyes he chuckled, for a pirate, traveling island to island with no clear destination or goal is a good way to get stagnant or be captured, a goal would make you focused, you could be like a lot of pirates today and go after the title of pirate king, Rayleigh offered, wondering what the blonde would do. Pirate king? What's that? Right, you don't really know much about the outside, put simply, the pirate king is the person that conquers the stretch of ocean known as the Grand Line, claiming everything the world has to offer in terms of power, wealth, and status. Rayleigh explained in layman's terms. I don't really care for stuff like that, but if I am gonna be a pirate, then I want my goal to be an answer. Naruto got deadly serious as he spoke. An answer? The blonde nodded slowly, yeah, I want the answer to a question, Il set out to sea to find out that answer, I need to know if it even exists, Naruto affirmed. What question do you need answered? Rayleigh rubbed his chin in curiosity. Naruto then told the former pirate what his question was, and the man laughed lightly at what he was told. Getting away from here is the best option if that's what you need answered, and it seems to me like you'll need all the help you can get, Rayleigh subtly offered the blonde. You'll help me out, Gramps? Naruto grew excited, well, I can't very well let you go off half-cocked in a few years just for you to die before you get what you want, so I'll train you until I have to leave, the village is probably going to be looking for me. Thanks, Gramps, I'll be the best student you could ask for. If that's so, why not lay off the Gramps stuff? Just call me Sensei. Rayleigh stroked his beard and his ego, then donned a contemplative look, maybe ITD be better to be Rayleigh sensei? When do we start, Gramps sensei? Naruto asked, not paying attention to the deadpan look he received from the man. As soon as you are well enough to move, could you at least try to call me sensei? Rayleigh slightly pleaded but it was drowned out by the cheerful shouts of the boy. In the village, the bar that Rayleigh visited was a war zone. The floor was splintered and slightly caved in as if something of great weight had come through. All the bottles of alcohol were shattered with their contents being strewn all over the floor. The most horrific thing on the scene, though, were the three dead bodies inside. The original thug's face was put through a wall, his skull caved in upon impact with shards going into his brain. The other's chest had practically exploded out of his back, chest cavity completely on display with the insides not too far behind the fallen body, the mon's face a rictus of terror as if he didn't realize the deed had been done before fading, Mizuki, he had the worst of it, for his blood was splashed all around the bar, and from the evidence, this was done with such brutal precision it was certain the man had been alive for every moment until finally being beheaded to end his torment. And you say you have no recollection of the person who did this? Minato asked the bartender, a grim expression set on his face, he wasn't all that concerned with the dead patrons, more he was upset that some unknown had slipped its way into his village and caused a commotion while he was none the wiser. It's almost like this intruder thought he was a fool. Nothing, Hokage-sama, there was one older gentleman that had come into the bar, but he could never have taken on those three by himself, the bartender started to sweat when the stare of his leader fell on him. He was most likely the culprit then, looks can be deceiving, and that can be the perfect weapon on those that are prone to overlooking, Minato failed to realize the hypocrisy of that statement. Sensei, if this person had caused this much destruction, then there's no way he'd remain here, it would be foolish, Kakashi spoke up from behind. True, what a nuisance, Minato sighed and looked to the dead bodies those two won't be missed, and Mizuki was never a true boon to the shinobi program so it's no heavy loss, Minato didn't regard the dead men as worth anything, turning to leave the bar, clean this mess up, and do not speak of what was talked about here, no need to rile the citizens when the danger has already passed, and we shall pay for your silence as well barkeep, with that Minato and his former student left the wrecked bar. So, sensei, how is Menma and Natsumi's training going? Kakashi eyes smiled to the man. Very well, they remind me and Kashina of ourselves with each passing day, I have no doubt that they'll be able to lead this next generation into outperforming the previous, Minato smiled. Whistles that is some great praise, Sensei, I've overheard Aruka talking about them in class, according to him they're practically the leaders already. Of course, they come from great stock after all, Minato boasted, but the joy was killed at Kakashi's next words. What of the other one, Naruto? Kakashi flinched at the shift in his Sensei's demeanor at the mere mention of the firstborn. What of him? He has had every chance to prove that he's a prodigy like Menma and Natsumi. But he has constantly disappointed, they come home and talk about the mess he makes of himself in class, it's an embarrassment to our legacy, Minato pinches the bridge of his nose to rein in his anger, I am glad that he makes himself scarce around the village as I feel I'd strike him if given the chance, Menma told me that he'd even refrained from attending the academy the other day, so I hope he's come to his senses and given up, Minato smiled, a cruel glint in his eyes. I understand, Sensei. Ridding yourself of a blot must come as such a relief, Kakashi thought to his failure of a father, 
he was much happier with Minato filling that role in his life. He isn't removed just yet, Minato stopped walking and turned to his former student. As you know, Naruto isn't going to be the clan heir. He received a nod from the copy Nin, Kashina and I have talked, and we've decided to go a step farther, to truly remove that stain from our person, we are going to disown him once he comes of age, this way we can make the official announcement of Menma becoming heir, and any dissent will be silenced because we gave the boy all the time to improve and keep his position as a family member, Minato reasoned, adamant with the decision he and his wife came to. It's for the best, sensei. Hell have a much more fulfilling life being at the bottom as that is where some are just destined to be. Kakashi bowed slightly to his sensei and took his leave. This was the starting point for the story of a boy, a boy who was born under an unlucky star and deemed a failure by his family, a boy that survived on his own for much of his early life, before meeting the one man that could help him by complete chance. In the future, that boy will make a name for himself in the world at large and his family will come to regret the choices they had made towards him. The story of Silver's D, Naruto has begun, alright, since we're starting you from scratch, I'd say two years of hard training will get you to an acceptable level, Rayleigh walked with Naruto through the forest of death. The young blonde trailed behind the former pirate with a woven basket on his back, filled with stones, according to Rayleigh, this would be his strength training and the beginner level at that, once he'd gotten used to the stones, they'd work on building some muscle tone, then the combat training would begin. The impatient blonde wanted to dive headfirst into the combat training and was met with a smile from the pirate. Rayleigh allowed the boy to have one spar with him just to serve as an example, and Naruto was trounced in seconds. He woke in a few hours with no recollection of the man moving before he had gone unconscious, giving him a good measure of their gap in strength. Only two years? Naruto strained out, unable to lift his head to look at the man, each step exhausted the blonde. Sweat poured down his forehead and his teeth were grit. The training was no walk in the park. Gramps made sure of that, but he was determined to get stronger. Yes, if anything I am giving you too much time, the longer I stay, the worse off the both of us will be, two years is a good amount of time, and as I said, you'll be at an acceptable level, Rayleigh explained to the boy. If you say so, Gramps, Naruto grunted but grew a small smile on his face from a thought, he, I can't wait, he whispered to himself. For what? Setting out. Rayleigh rose an eyebrow, well, not just that, Naruto rubbed the back of his head and quickly put his hand back on the basket's strap lest he loses his balance, I was thinking how great ITD be to get stronger and beat up Menma, Naruto admitted. I want to stop you right there, Rayleigh stopped, turning to look at the blonde, he crouched down to eye level and spoke seriously, I know you want to get back at them for everything, but getting stronger for revenge isn't what I am training you for. I know that, but should NT they pay for all that stuff they did? Naruto was confused, if you were strong you got to do anything you wanted, right? That's them shining through you, I have no doubt that they'd try to get back at you for defeating them, and that would just lead to them trying to find you here, and therefore me, Rayleigh explained. But, dedicating your existence to revenge will only lead to pain, I want you to promise me that you won't be showing off what you learn here, keep yourself under the radar, that way they won't be watching you and wondering what's been changing, Rayleigh stuck his finger in front of his face while looking the boy directly in the eyes. I promise, Gramps, Naruto looked slightly depressed, but from the look in Rayleigh's eyes, he just didn't want to disappoint the only family he had. Don't look so down, I never said you couldn't fight them, I just said don't dedicate this training for that act. Rayleigh placed his hand on the boy's shoulder, this is to get you ready for that harsh world out there. Gramps, Naruto started tearing up, until, no crew would want such a crybaby for a captain, so I've gotta toughen you up, sigh for their sakes at the very least, Rayleigh shook his head with his eyes closed. Damn it, Gramps, I am gonna sock you. Naruto shed the basket so he could jump at the man, only for an impromptu game of tag to ensue. Both had smiles on their faces, even if the boy tried to keep an air of anger about him. After training for those two years, Rayleigh took his leave of the Leaf Village. Making the blonde promise him that he would keep training himself without the pirate mentor, Rayleigh also told the blonde to set out in eight years' time, knowing from the boy's info that his class would be graduating when he turned 18, a perfect time for him to disappear since he wouldn't be entering the shinobi force the final parting gift being an odd piece of paper that bore Rayleigh's name, the pirate telling Naruto to keep it on his person. It was a tearful farewell, with the blonde bawling his eyes out as he was left alone in a physical sense, but knew he wasn't alone in the world, promising Rayleigh that he'd meet him again once he'd made it into the Grand Line. And thus, our story begins eight years later, eight years later, Naruto age, 18. The older Naruto woke up from the renovated tent he'd made throughout the arduous training he'd had eight years ago. It now was made up of the forest's trees after he had trimmed them down to a more manageable level. He stretched, sticking his arms upward to get the kinks out of his back and giving a yawn, walking out of his abode, 
he dropped to a sitting position in front of a fire had left burning the night prior, rubbing crust out of his eyes. Naruto reached to his left and grabbed a much larger stick than had had as a boy. The utensil was now tied into a bundle of sticks so it could support the surprisingly large animal the blonde had defeated. A giant boar was stuck on the end of the object and had become a healthy red from being cooked throughout the night. The blonde's mouth watered at the magnificent sight and dug in. In only a few short minutes the poor animal was stripped to the bone, with the blonde teen laying on the ground and his stomach quickly digesting the food had eaten. Looking up to the sky, Naruto smiled, knowing what day it was and what awaited him, the last day of the academy, a day had dreamed of a lot as a young boy, and now awaited its end for completely different reasons as a teen, standing up from his position, Naruto walked to his tent, and knocked it down, he wouldn't be coming back here anytime soon. He then walked to Enos' grave, a small smile on his face, kneeling to place a hand on the dirt above where the body was buried. I am going now, Inu Chan, Naruto's smile got smaller as he continued. I don't know when I'll be back, or if I'll even come back here. But I'd never leave without saying goodbye. Naruto clutched the dirt, keeping his emotions in check. I wanted to thank you for being at my side and for protecting me back then, and what better way than getting out of here and being free and happy? Naruto stood up, the dirt still in hand before opening his hand so a small gust of wind could carry it from his palm. I'll become a great pirate, Inu, one that will shake the world that way there's no one who hasn't heard of me. With that affirmation, Naruto strode out of the forest, grabbing his old jacket that has torn from his growth and throwing it on, leaving behind the home had made for himself, ironically welcomed in the harsh environment that made many ninja tremble in fear and moved forward toward his goal, a place that had helped him grow in ways that he used to believe could only be achieved through the academy and his family. Once out of the forest, Naruto took a great leap forward with a fist in the air, landed, and then started to run to the academy. In the deeper reaches of the forest of death, one would find trees with deep gashes in them, some others had fist marks marring their trunks, the marks being much larger than the blonde teens, large trenches ran across the ground, running jaggedly and some meeting trees only continue upward. If any were to see these destructive markings, they would know that no animal from Konoha could cause them. Simply put, it would have had to come from a person. The academy, inside the academy, all of the now 18-year-old Genin hopefuls were seated, ready to take their final exams, and become a part of the shinobi force, all of these students were the best of the best, capable of withstanding the grueling training that the curriculum put them through and became better for it, they all grew exponentially from the children they had been Uruka couldn't be prouder. This class was shaping up to be the best that Konoha had ever produced. The only caveat, Naruto, the blonde teen was still at the bottom of the class, yet still attended each one, the difference was that ever since the incident that had resulted in Mizuki and two other citizens dying, Naruto hadn't paid as rapt attention to the lessons as he used to. He would normally sit quietly in his seat, content with the invisibility he had in class because of his status and would doodle on scrap paper during lessons, Uruka had caught a glimpse of the doodles, wondering what had the blonde's attention only to see different skulls drawn on it. The only aspect that the blonde kept his undivided attention on would be the combat. Despite the blonde not being seen training, he had gained muscle through the years to the point that he was the most defined of all the teenagers now, having muscles that weren't overly pronounced but were clear that he was no pushover with an emphasis on speed, his siblings, while having muscle, were made to use their agility and knowledge to outdo their physical betters especially since they had their own trump cards. Naruto, even with this increase in muscle, would still lose to his brother in their spars but would come away with less damage than he used to and leave the academy going who knows where to repeat the process the next day. Uruka had no idea why he kept returning, or why he even bothered to come to the final exams, but the Chunin was glad that the blonde would be out of his hair after today. Welcome, everyone to your last day as students, I have no doubt in my mind that most of you will be getting your headbands today and will be allowed to carry the symbol of our village, Uruka spoke eyeing the sleeping Naruto when he said most, after today, you will be adults in the eyes of the ninja world, able to take missions and be in charge of espionage, and taking lives in the name of Konoha. The students all nodded seriously at these words, knowing what would be required of them in the coming years, they would become the vanguard for their village, in charge of protecting the people and the interests of their home, putting this above all else, becoming a shinobi meant being ready to die for their village, whether from risking lives for information, putting them in danger, or even abandoning allies if it meant a greater boon for Konoha. Well begin with the written test, Uruka walked throughout the room, a smile on his face as he passed the test to each of his students, coming to Naruto, Uruka shook his head and placed the paper onto the desk and nudged the blonde awake. Rubbing his eyes, Naruto saw the back of Uruka as the man walked to his desk to observe the students, the blonde looked down to see the test, grabbed his pencil, and immediately started doodling, had been spending the boring moments in class conceptualizing the Jolly Roger had want to have to represent his crew when he became a pirate and he was sure that had finally come up with its final design. 
A big smile on his face, Naruto doodled away on the paper, it didn't matter if he filled the paper out or not, his string of failures in the academy guaranteed that he would fail even if he got 100% on each section of the final. So why bother with something, knowing that he wouldn't be staying here after today anyway? He was here for one specific thing and that came at the end of the exam. The others stared at the smiling blonde, frowns on their faces, and feeling insulted that this fool was still sitting in his chair, pretending that he was one of them, he should have been kicked out of the academy, but that was only possible if the student dropped out themselves so they could have every chance to become better, if only Naruto had gotten that information. In only an hour, the written portion of the final had been completed and the teens passed their finished papers to the scar-faced Chunin. The outlier was, of course, Naruto who had kept his paper, observing it with a wide smile and pocketing it. The next part of the exam was the ninjutsu portion, this was a section that Naruto would sit out of because had never been able to use chakra in any substantial way, he was told that he only had enough to live, so he couldn't do any of the flashy moves that shinobi were known for, meaning that he had a free pass for this portion. Everyone had passed the ninjutsu section, smiles on their face as they gathered around the wall that those that had finished leaned against, Naruto was separate from them, keeping his mind focused on what would be coming next in the exam and eyeing his younger brother in his periphery. The combat portion Moving outside the teens gathered around the sparring ring, giddy as their hard work was about to pay off, they could practically feel their headbands in their hands they were so close. The rules were simple, fight seriously, no chakra allowed, and your performance was what was being graded not whether you win or lose the fight, a test that they had drilled into their heads for years to improve hand-to-hand -hand combat in the former children and build up unique styles for the civilians who were at a disadvantage compared to the clan styles. With little fanfare, the battles had begun and been indicative of the improvements that had been reached by everyone, there was a good mix of brawlers that relied on instinct and force to overpower their opponents, and those that used their superior minds to outmaneuver and predict the opponent's moves to wear them down to an equal level. Now came the event that would end the exams, a fight that had been seen many times by all those present, Naruto vs. Menma, a fight that's outcome was clear in the minds of all present given the crimson-haired team was arguably the best in taijutsu and could end this fight in seconds with nary a hair out of place. Too bad they were going to be pleasantly surprised at the outcome of the spar this time. Time for the final spar of the exam, Menma vs. Naruto, Baruka sighed with his eyes closed, what a way to end this class stay at the academy, another lackluster bout between the two brothers with the outcome decided before it began. Alright, just what I've been waiting for, Naruto pumped his fist in the air and rushed to the center of the ring. Why is he so excited to lose? were the mutterings of the students, looking on with raised brows and sweat drops while watching the blonde bounce on the balls of his feet. Come on, come on, let's go, let's go, Naruto had a bright smile on his face so wide that his teeth were blinding, and his eyes closed. In a hurry to get beat again, Menma rose from his sitting position, a stern look on his face as he disdainfully regarded his brother while making his way into the ring. Nah, just excited to finally go all out, Naruto smashed his fists together, smile going to a smirk, and his eyes set in determination. All out. Hmm, and what would that look like? Menma looked condescendingly at the teen as they both got into ready stances. Naruto cracked his knuckles and looked his brother in the eyes, come find out, he challenged. Hajime. Uruka brought his hand down, beginning the fight. Menma kicked it off by rushing the blonde, quickly getting into Naruto's stance and bringing a fist toward his face only to have the teen catch the fist a short distance from his face. The impact resounded in the silent field. Mouths dropped in astonishment when the dead last caught the top student's punch, eyes were wide in disbelief, and none were wider than the offenders as he wrested his hand from the blonde's grip. He caught it, he's never kept up with me in any of our spars, and now he's catching my punches? Menma grit his teeth in anger. Naruto wasn't paying any attention to his opponent's dilemma, preferring to open and close his hand while staring at the palm. A smile grew on his face, making a fist and looking back to his brother. Whoa, even I am kinda shocked I did that, you were moving really slow, Naruto pointed out, inadvertently angering the Uzumaki. Slow, Menma ran into a kick, bringing his leg up to swing his heel into the side of Naruto's head. This was met with Naruto's kick meeting his in a stalemate, and angering Menma further in the process, this led to a flurry of attacks being launched by the incensed Uzumaki air that was dodged swiftly by Naruto who kept a calm smile on his face while doing it. Fight back. No failure is going to beat me. I am the heir of the Uzumaki clan, Menma lost his cool. Naruto hopped back, gaining distance from his brother and cleaned his ear with a nonchalant expression. Menma keep your head screwed on straight, you're letting your emotions get the better of you, Natsumi spoke from the crowd, leaning against the wall with a straight face while she observed the spar. Keep your comments to yourself, Natsumi. 
This gnat thinks he's hot shit cause he gained some muscle, but he's still the same loser as before. Menma disregarded the advice, veins bulging on his brow. Man, you guys sure have gotten different after all these years, I am glad I haven't been living in that house. Naruto looked away from Menma with his head turned over his shoulder. What's that supposed to mean? Menma took offense to that, everyone wished that they could be trained by the greatest Hokage in Konoha history and the best Kunoichi like he and Natsumi had. I mean, I am glad I could grow up to be a person, Naruto insulted the siblings and their upbringing, all while picking his nose. This little bastard. Menma raged to the point that the Kyubi's chakra began to leak out of him. Menma kun, stop. Uruka went to stop the match but was stopped by the cold glare of Natsumi. Uruka, surely you aren't going to allow an insult to be thrown at the progeny of your leader? That is tantamount to insulting our father himself, a punishment for verbal assault is well within our rights. Natsumi's eyes were set on the blonde, no emotion on her face as she watched her brother use the demonic chakra he contained. While the more emotional of the two, Menma wouldn't lose control of the Kyubi that easily, this was merely a response from his pride in their blood, blood that Naruto shared with them, unfortunately, yet still would disrespect it. He needed to be reminded of the hierarchy, surprisingly, Naruto got more excited when seeing Menma start using the demon's chakra in their fight and got back into his stance, his smile wide and eyes narrowed, ready for the attack that he knew would be coming at near blinding speed, the thing he wanted to do above all else was have a chance to fight Menma at his best. And do one, simple, thing. Menma moved so swiftly that the tiles of the ring broke from his foot kicking off them, his right arm coming to his side and his hand in a clawing motion with the red chakra gathering over his appendage. Naruto met Menma's rush with one of his own, feral smirk still in place, bringing up his right arm to go for a punch that seemed normal to the human eye, running to meet his younger brother, Naruto was ready for the clash. Both brought their arms up, fully intent on ending the battle with their respective attacks, and both were able to perceive the other's attack before it was made making them shift their heads away from the attack. Fist and claw barely skirted by their respective targets, the caustic chakra of the Kyubi slightly burned the cheek of Naruto and the blonde's fist was completely dodged by Menma, Naruto smiling, eyes looking directly into Menma's blue orbs that were slit and rage-filled, then filled with shock, Menma's face bent inward from the cheek, the same side that the fist of his older brother had passed. What? I avoided it. Menma looked to his opponent only able to see the smirk on the blonde's face as whose eyes were covered by his hair from Menma's perspective. Skidding back from the impact of whatever had hit him, Menma raised a hand to his cheek once head stopped, when his hand brushed his cheek, Menma felt the slight sting of pain that the hit had caused and raised his head, ready to get back in the fight and show this failure the error he had made. Winner. Menma. Uruka's shout stopped Menma in his tracks, looking across the ring he saw Naruto outside the ring sitting cross-legged and laughing boisterously with his hands on his knees. Welp, lost again, but at least I lasted the longest I ever had, right? Naruto brushed his pants off, a knowing smile on his face when he looked at Menma's shocked expression, just failed again. I missed, I missed, and he threw the match, he let me win, why? Menma ground his teeth, ignoring his gathering peers. I guess even a loser can get lucky. He managed to nick you. Natsumi leaned over, her ponytail hiding her face as she whispered to him, What happened? You missed. I know, but he still threw the match, does he think he can get away with that? Menma made to go after Naruto, but Natsumi put a stop to it. Why take it so personally? He's still nothing, and after today everyone will know it. Natsumi gave a cruel smirk, the type to enjoy indirect cruelties than instantaneous gratification. I still think he deserves more. Menma looked at the blonde's back, ultimately conceding to his sister. It would be gratifying to see the fool's face when his father gave the news today. Back inside the students were gradually called up to the front desk where Ruka handed them their official Konoha headbands, the proud smile on his face as each student that he brought up gave a wide range of emotions from happy to relief and more than a few tears of joy, this made the teacher feel like his time was worthwhile and had a hand, however slight, in bringing up the next generation of shinobi. He looked to the only failure of the group and couldn't feel more upset that his time had been wasted because the blonde had zero aptitude for the shinobi arts, Naruto was the only blemish on what could be considered the perfect class in Aruka's mind and could only imagine the pain that this boil had caused his Hokage's family, finishing his thoughts and giving the last headband, Aruka stood at his desk to address the newly made genin in his class. With this, you all are now genin of the hidden leaf, he announced and waited for the slight cheers and claps to continue. I am proud of each and every one of you. You've all come far since you were children and have earned your place amongst our military. Uruka ran his eyes over the classroom, he saw the many faces of his now adult students. The once unsure and fearful children were hardened and ready for the dangers that the world would throw their way. Naruto had his feet kicked up and lazily paid attention to the mon's speech, 
inflating the egos of the overconfident students since Aruka was the type that liked to be hands-on with learning and give answers directly rather than have them find out on their own, and their parents did much the same by handing them their training on a platter. He knew the man wasn't talking to him specifically, but Aruka's next words did apply to everyone present in the room. All of your futures are bright, and I know that you will become great that will have their names known far and wide, Aruka, unknowing of the double meaning for a specific student of his, gave one final smile as their sensei, this will be your one day of freedom, you will be returning here tomorrow for team formations and will meet your John and sensei on that same day. With that said, congratulations on graduating the academy, Aruka shouted. A chorus of cheers was heard ringing in the room, a few smirks from the more subdued Jenin, two sets of eyes were zeroed in on the blonde as he stood up, not taking part in the outcry and chose to leave without drawing too much attention from the rest, looking at each other, the two siblings stood as well to make an announcement of their own. Hey, everyone, Menma called above all the chatter, garnering the attention of the graduated class. Our father has an announcement to make in front of the whole village, something that has been coming for a long time and would like everyone to know, Natsumi spoke up softly, eyes closed, and a small known smile on her face, if you'd make your way to our home, there is a celebration going on that the village is a part of for this momentous occasion. Whoa, the Hokage's compound? Will there be great food there? Choji drooled at the thought. You're always thinking with your stomach. Ino rolled her eyes, inwardly happy that Shed have the chance to go to Menma's home. Pass. Sasuke scowled and left the room. He had no want to go to his rival's home and listen to the fourth prattle on about something that didn't concern him. His loss, it must be something big if your old man is inviting the whole village to hear rather than just have the Anbu announce it, Kiba pet Akamaru as he spoke. Any idea what it is? Shikamaru rose a brow, a smirk grew on Menma's face walking out with his sister in tow. You'll just have to wait and see, outside the academy. Naruto made his way out of the gate leading to the academy, a hand to his chin, and looking to the sky, he was leaving today, and despite his family not caring, he wondered just what they'd do when he left without so much as a word. I don't think they'd notice, to be honest, thinking about this stuff will make my head hurt, Naruto rubbed his temple, trying to understand his messed up blood was too much work. That was a cheap trick you pulled. Menma and Natsumi appeared in front of their older brother, Menma's arms were crossed and still steamed that the loser had hit him somehow, Natsumi stood straight with her hand behind her back with a bright smile, something that no one could say they've seen on the normally composed girl. Oh, it's you guys, need something? Naruto was unfazed but did wonder why they were in front of him, they never bothered with him in all these years, now they meet him outside the academy like they knew him. Father has something very important to say, and it wouldn't be right if the whole family wasn't there to hear it. Natsumi offered an explanation, and held her hand out to Naruto. Right, Oni-chan? That drew red flags from the blonde right away, she never called him that, not since they'd gotten to the academy. What the hell were they up to? Why do they suddenly want me around? Questioning us? Menma glared and took a step, calm down, Menma-kun. The sister never faltered in her smile, is it so hard to believe that father and mother would like you to come home? We just left you alone because we thought you wanted your space. Natsumi put a finger to her chin in mock thought. Really? Naruto sounded hopeful, but he was no fool when it came to these people, he had to deal with this for most of his life, after all. Of course, isn't that right, Menma-kun? Natsumi looked to her other brother. Yeah, sure, Ma and Pa want you home, what he has to say is really important, for all of us, Menma barely changed his tone to a more neutral one. Naruto gave a wide smile, well, let's go then, shouldn't keep M waiting. Naruto went in the direction of the compound, his mind firing off theories on what could be waiting for him, by the way, what I did was no trick, Naruto didn't give any more information than that, moving ahead of them to hear this announcement so he could get ready for his departure. Namikse Compound The large mansion that housed the Namikaze family was abuzz with the sounds from the vast number of villagers, citizens and ninja alike, filed into it for the celebration that was being held. The fourth Hokage decided to have a festival for his children to commemorate their accomplishment along with honoring their classmates as well. The great number of people had been packed into the courtyard of their leader, enjoying the food that was available along with the drinks that were constantly being replenished. Plenty of the newly made genin took advantage of their new status of adulthood by partaking of the alcoholic beverages and immediately becoming either inebriated or nauseous. In other words, it was a grand party, and this was the scene that the trio of siblings had arrived to. Ah, food. Naruto drooled when seeing the table that held the delicacies of the village, having to hunt for his food in the forest of death and stealing anything that was thrown out. The blonde would be pirate grew to enjoy amazing food rather quickly. Help yourself, Oni chan, we just have to let father know you're here so he can make his announcement. Natsumi kept that smile on her face. Yeah, sure, cool. Naruto sprinted to the table and dug in noisily, 
the scowls from the villagers were ignored as he stuffed his cheeks to bursting and swallowed the massive amount so he could keep shoveling more in. Disgusting, heathen, Natsumi muttered, guess even you can't hold it in, huh? Menma whispered, walking to his parents who were seated on a balcony overlooking the courtyard. When Menma and Natsumi strode onto the balcony, standing beside their parents, they let them know that Naruto had been lured, Minato smiled, got up from his chair, and moved to the banister, a mug in hand, looking down into the courtyard, he easily spotted the shock of sun yellow hair, a source of shame for the cage as his failure of an heir looked the most like him, a cruel smile worked onto his face, ready to make his grand statement and usher in a new age for Konoha. Everyone, Minato called from his pedestal mug raised in the air and getting the undivided attention of most everyone present. Naruto looked up from the food for a split second only to see who had shouted and when he saw who it was, he paid it little mind, not caring what he had to say, heedless of the whatever was about to be said, the blonde's noisy eating could be heard in the mostly silent courtyard. It's a momentous day we find for ourselves, my children, Menma and Natsumi have graduated from the academy and become genin. The cheers from the crowd were loud and boisterous, with this graduating class, we enter a new stage in Konoha's history, one where we can look forward to them all becoming powerful ninja in their own right with limitless potential capable of putting the old guard to shame. Minato roused the crowd more with his words, proudly talking up his two prodigal children and the genin. It was at this time that the atmosphere shifted as the fourth Hokage's smirk lowered into a grim line, his hair shadowing his eyes, taking one last sip from his drink, Minato raised his head and tossed his mug away, shattering against the floor of the balcony, all present wondered what could have soured their leader's merry attitude. But before that future can come about, there's a tumor that needs to be removed from our midst, Minato could tell that many were beginning to understand what he was getting at, the only blemish in the class that we are celebrating today, and one that I've had an unfortunate hand in bringing to our great village. Minato raised his finger and dramatically pointed to the blonde failure that had just stuffed the last of the food into his mouth. Noticing that all eyes were on him, Naruto took a cursory glance at his surroundings until they landed on his father, scratching the back of his head, Naruto looked confused, MRRMF, gulp what? Naruto frowned at the attention. The blonde's cluelessness made the crowd scowl with the disgust and disappointment being most evident on his family's faces, a storm of negative emotion that should have swallowed Naruto whole yet he didn't look the least bit uncomfortable as he looked his father directly in his eyes with no fear. You, Naruto, are the cyst that has grown in our great village for much longer than should have been allowed. You've been given every chance to reach a standard that would give the shinobi force the respect they deserve and have failed at every turn. Minato brought the weight of Naruto's failures down on him, feeling a small sense of satisfaction build as he got closer to his news, it isn't enough that you've been the consistent dead last in the academy throughout, but you have brought shame to your family name as well. Hum, Naruto then got serious, having an idea of where this was going, and thought that it would probably be better this way than disappearing suddenly. Menma has already taken the role of clan heir due to his exceptional record even considering the many other extraordinary genin in the graduating class along with Natsumi being the top kunoichi, it isn't enough to wipe the stain that you've given our military and more importantly our family name, and that is why I have come to the decision that I feel will truly erase this. Minato paused looking over the crowd as they waited in anticipation for the words that would leave their leader's mouth. I, Minato Namikaze, the fourth Hokage of Konoha, hereby use my power to excommunicate you from the Namikaze family and with permission from the last remaining Uzumaki, my wife Kashina, also remove you from the Uzumaki clan, Minato announced, leading to the cheers of the village. The adults were happy that what they believed to be the living embodiment of the demon would be removed from their great leader's family. And to them, this meant that their abuse could continue without the tiny amount of guilt they could possibly feel from damaging a relative of the Hokage, the new genin who'd inherited their hatred from their parents, felt no remorse for the loser as they felt it was a justified action since Naruto had lived up to the expectations set for the eldest child of a clan. And Naruto, he stood in the middle of the chorus of cheers, arms crossed over his chest and his hair over his eyes, accepting the ridicule, a frown marred his face, hearing the mocking laughs of the shinobi and civilians, food being thrown at the status strip blonde along with splashed drinks. You've been waiting to do this haven't you, Hokage? Naruto finally spoke up, looking straight at his family, seeing a smile and a hand covering Natsumi's mouth as she giggled. Fine by me, his words managed to silence the entire courtyard. All mouths were wide open in shock that this demon child could speak to their leader in such a way, and inebriated Kiba let this frustration be known as he walked up to the blonde and grabbed him by his tattered jacket's collar. You'd better watch your mouth. Hokage-sama is doing this to strengthen the village. You had no right to be a part of his family in the first place. Naruto didn't regard Kiba even with the proximity, keeping his focus on the Namikaze family as he was finally officially free from them. I was never part of their family, to begin with, 
Families lift each other up and care for each other. I have never been cared for by anyone in this village, so no one here is worth anything to me, Naruto said definitively with no emotion. A disgrace like you should be glad that they took care of you and put up with your bullshit for as long as they did. Someone shouted from the crowd. I am a disgrace. Frankly, I feel wrong just for having to share blood with these people. No excommunication will erase the bond of blood even if we don't consider each other family, but it's better that it ended this way because of what I want to do. Naruto closed his eyes. Do? Kashina spoke from the balcony, what can you do? I don't have any obligation to share that with you, we aren't family, and I am no ninja. All you need to know is I will be leaving the village, so I can get out of your hair. Naruto brushed Kiba off him, I have nothing for me here, no prospects, no future. And you'll find this outside? Menma chuckled in skepticism. I know I will, Naruto took a step forward, hands at his sides. I don't know where, and I don't know when, but I know that there are people out there that I can consider my family. And I am gonna find them, even if it kills me. Naruto declared with a finger raised in the air before he dramatically pointed to his former family, and you'll see us. When I find them, we'll be famous the world over and you'll realize how badly you messed up when you see my smiling face. Hum, and H how do you plan to do that? Minato held back chuckles like the rest of the assembled people. By shaking the world, because I have something to prove, not to you, but my gramps, the only family I've ever had, Naruto was resolute, remembering that he promised Rayleigh to see him on the Grand Line. When hearing this the laughter couldn't be contained, it was mocking, condescending, and filled with disbelief. No one present could believe that this failure had the guts to make such a declaration in front of the populace of the village in total seriousness. The foolish teen actually believed he could make something of himself. He wouldn't survive a second outside the confines of the village, and it would be a joy if he crawled back in tears after failing, or better yet died as punishment for his hubris. Then go ahead, Minato wiped a tear from his eye his mirth subsiding, show me how wrong I am, but don't come running back when you fail. I've no need for those that refuse to learn the place that the world's given them, and the only way for it to be taught to fools is through its fire. Minato finished with chilling words, just know that you are not my son when it inevitably happens. Naruto turned to leave the courtyard. The laugh still loud, face set in stone and stopped at the gate, and looking over his shoulder, the blonde smirked to the Hokage and his family and gave his own final words. And when I prove you wrong, you errand my father, with that Naruto left the village, the celebration became much rowdier with the black sheep of their village gone. The reminder of one of their darkest sections of history had voluntarily left and would hopefully meet his end somewhere on the island, only the creatures that would feed on his corpse would be thankful for his presence. Kakashi walked to his old sensei his mind on certain business that would need to be brought to the Hokage's attention, kneeling next to his leader, he noticed that the family seemed to be much happier with the looming cloud of Naruto being cleared. Kakashi, you should be celebrating with everyone, Minato looked to his former student. I know, sensei, but I have news, what kind of news? The land of waves has reached out for aid again, Kakashi revealed. HN, have they agreed to pay for our services? Minato asked. They don't have the agreed amount but are pleading that we come assist them, with the promise of paying us later. If they don't have the money then there isn't anything to discuss, Menma spoke up, sitting on the edge of the handrail. Menma Kun is right, without the money they have nothing to offer us, Kashina agreed. Actually, Wave has started to use their proximity to the ocean to bring new business from islands in the South Blue, and that is why Gato has monopolized the industry there, unfortunately, only a few ships put up with the Mons overpricing as goods from here are valuable due to us being isolationist. Minato educated the two on the situation. If that's the case, perhaps the money isn't such a big deal then, father, Natsumi had gears turning in her head. That's right, dear, huh? What are you two talking about? Menma scowled in thought. Wave's poverty is certainly a problem, but it hardly matters in the grand scheme of things, Minato explained. I have ignored multiple messages from Wave all this time with the intent of driving them into a corner that benefits Konoha in the highest capacity, Minato smiled. So, you mean, Either they raise the money to pay us and we save them, or they perish, and we take over? Menma asked. Close, Menma Kun. Father plans to get the wave citizens desperate enough that they cut a deal with us and we take control of their ports, Natsumi elaborated. Right, father? Natsumi looked to her progenitor for his approval of her theory. That's correct, sweetheart, at the end of all this Konoha stands to gain whether through sacrifice or cooperation. Minato leaned back into his chair, looking to his children the fourth told them. The messages have become more frequent, so I believe the situation is coming to a head there. Once you two get your team placement tomorrow, you will be going there to quell Gato's forces and put Wave in Konoha's debt, then we will have our demands met and they will be happy to oblige, it would be the least they can do for their heroes. Minato drank from his new mug, overlooking the party. Of course, father, 
quite the clever man, honey, the party continued on into the night, with no one being the wiser of the wicked and deceitful plan that had been hatched. Outside the village, the fresh air of freedom, Naruto shouted, finally out of the suffocating village that D stifled him and ready to work towards the first leg of his journey, okay, first thing first, Gramps said the nearest way to the ocean was the land of Wave Place, so, I'll head there first and grab myself a ship, Naruto grinned widely, and stopped walking. Which way is that supposed to be? Naruto scratched his head, confused about where his first step should go when he saw something carved into a tree. This way Bakagaki with a small Rayleigh pointing in the right direction. Ah, whatever, Gramps, I'd have figured it out. Naruto threw his hands up in the air and stomped his way down the path. Six days later, Naruto came out of the forest leaves in his hair from going through trees and bushes on his way to his destination. Shaking his head free of the forest debris, Naruto smiled as he came to a bridge with an archway that welcomed travelers to Nami no Kuni, with two small watchtowers bordering it. Paying little mind to the towers, Naruto bounded to the entrance in excitement, unable to contain himself as he approached his first new experience outside Konoha. He wondered what the people were like, hey, he wondered what the culture was like. Hey, you. He wondered how delicious the food would be. Don't ignore us, you bastard, huh? Naruto stopped just short of going through the arch and saw two guys looking down on him from the towers, what do you guys want? The better question is what you want, brat, one of them shouted with a scowl, leaning down to see Naruto. You're the ones that called me so you must be the ones that want something, Naruto shot back. You should nt make fun of us, boy, the other thug groaned. I am just saying, I am just going to stop by and wave for a bit and leave, Naruto answered. The two looked at each other and hopped down from the watchtowers as a form of intimidating the blonde, Naruto stood in the same place completely unimpressed with their feet and maneuvered his neck to look behind them impatiently. So, can I go now? I am trying to get out of here before the day is over. Hmm, you can go in but only if you pay the toll. The more violent thug slightly unsheathed a rough looking sword. 20,000 Ryo, the lazier one had a dagger in his hand. Uh, Naruto rubbed the back of his head, I don't have any money, is there any other way I can get in, I don't want any trouble, Naruto tried to compromise with the two. Hey, no other way, brat, well, there is one, the lazy one had a glint in his eye that his comrade understood. Really, what is it? Naruto obliviously asked as the two flanked him on his sides. You could try to beat us, the angry one smiled, having no qualm about killing the kid. Simple, right? The lazy thug passed his dagger from hand to hand excitedly. Naruto grinned at this knowledge and cracked his knuckles, giving a simple answer when he was ready. That's all? Okay. Don't worry, brat, the angry one dashed forward. This will only take two seconds, the lazy one didn't even raise his eyelids as he attacked. Two seconds later, Naruto wiped his hands of imaginary dirt, nothing on his person out of place, and no injuries on his body, behind him lay the two thugs, beaten soundly into dreamland welts and bumps on their bodies. You were right. Thanks for letting me in you guys. Naruto gave a two-fingered salute to the thugs as he ran ahead to the small settlement. Uh, that damn brat. He's actually really strong, the angry thug struggled to talk through his bruises. He could cause problems for Gato, and if he finds out that we let that kid get in here, then well get killed by that demon. The lazy one rolled over to prop himself upon his arm. He won't know. Well just call in the demon brothers to take care of him before the news can reach Gato. The angry one forced himself to his feet and limped his way to the village to find the demon brothers. Inside the village, all right, my first village, Naruto yelled to himself, earning looks from the gloomy residents. The village seemed to be in disrepair, the buildings having roofing shingles missing, cracks running down the walls, and windows were broken with these being mainly residences. The businesses looked slightly better, but there was a notable lack of flair that would entice potential buyers. The people all had frowns on their faces and deep bags under the eyes of the adults. Tiring work must have been a normal thing for the people. The children were sparse in the streets with the ones seen being clad in clothing that made Naruto's old jacket seem like a suit in comparison. Clearly, the money flow was very minimal, except in one aspect. The only pristine area of the entire village was the port, none of the building there had anything wrong with them and, unlike the other businesses, was bustling with activities as ships were coming and going, though not many, the only thing in common with the village were the tired workers that were hauling crates to and from the ships that had stopped by, miserable looks on their faces as they did the work. Though Naruto didn't take any of these subtleties, so focused on his own goals in this village, he explored the different shops, seeing clothes that had liked to buy and unique stones that were found in the waters near the shore, eventually, he made his way to the port and put a hand above his eyes upon seeing his goal here. There's the port, 
they're bound to have some ships lying around. Naruto smiled in satisfaction and heard the familiar grumble of his stomach, and now for food. I can leave after that, he ran around to find a restaurant. Running into one shortly, Naruto hopped into a seat at the counter and rapidly tapped his palms on it to get the attention of the lone woman in the restaurant. Hey, 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 lady, Naruto impatiently chimed, the woman had long blue hair with large bangs that framed her face and a good portion running to the middle of her back, she wore a pink shirt with a red collar, short sleeves with their ends being red, and a blue skirt. Calm down, young man, my name is Tsunami, the woman introduced with a smile, though it didn't reach her eyes which were drooping slightly. Hi, Tsunami, my name's Naruto, I want food, make me some, please? Naruto impatiently answered and went right back to tapping his palms on the countertop. Only if you sit patiently and ask nicely, she giggled. I did, I said please, Naruto reasoned, what would you like Naruto-san? She decided to ignore the disrespect. Anything good, ill eat anything, Naruto boasted, I am sure you will, she laughed good-naturedly. The teen proceeded to eat the entire menu and some change to satiate his gullet, plates and bowls piled up on the counter to the point they towered above the two people, leaving Tsunami astonished but inwardly happy that he enjoyed it but more because of the bill. That was real delicious. Naruto sighed, picking his teeth and somehow remaining the same size had been despite the vast amount of food that had scarfed down. I am glad you enjoyed it, Naruto san. Tsunami then handed him his bill, a slight ominous glint in her eye and a smirk. Erp. Naruto started to sweat profusely, remembering his current lack of funds. Uh, what if I can't pay? Can't pay? Young man, how do you walk into a restaurant, eat it out of house and home, but can't pay? Tsunami tapped her fingers on the counter. I can't help it, I was planning on leaving today, anyway. Naruto got in her face, oh, that's right, what if I put it on a tab, and come back to pay you later? Naruto put a fist into his hand as if he cracked the code, only for his face to meet with a rolling pin. I need that money, and if you can't pay, you'll have to work it off. Tsunami crossed her arms and stood above the cowering blonde. How long will that take? With all you ate, and the low amount of people that come in, you'll be working for me for at least five years, Tsunami reasoned with a finger to her cheek. I can't wait that long, look, lady, I just need a ship and it'll get enough treasure to pay you back later, I've waited ten years to get off this island. And I told you that I need that money, young man, Tsunami glared. Before the argument could continue, the door to the restaurant was slammed open, letting four individuals in, two of them were recognized by the blonde, and the other two were recognized by the woman. There he is, the angry thug pointed a finger to the blonde. Oh, it's you guys, guess you are tough, I thought you'd be out for way longer, but I did hold back a bit, Naruto sat back at the counter. You let this kid beat you? One of the new people asked, he wore a camouflaged suit and a rebreather mask with his odd accessory being a gauntlet on his left arm. He refused to pay the toll, so we were gonna teach him a lesson, the angry thug defended himself. And how did that work out for you? The other newcomer countered. He was wearing a similar outfit to the other guy complete with a rebreather of his own and a gauntlet on the opposite hand to the other guy. You told me I could go in if I beat you, Naruto said in his defense. You entered illegally? Tsunami was shocked, this could end poorly for her. I didn't know, they lied. Woman, stay out of this or ill have to take this as treason. The guy with the gauntlet on his left arm threatened the poor woman. I am sorry, I didn't know he was a criminal, she bowed and removed herself from the situation by diving behind the counter. Hate to break this to you, kid, but intruders aren't well liked around here, the one with a gauntlet on his right hand lifted it up in preparation. Why does it matter if I pay it or not? I am not even staying here, Naruto was unafraid even though he was surrounded. You're gonna get what's coming to you now brat, don't you know who these guys are? There. Kirigakir. Missing Nin Demon Brothers Gozu and Maizu. Let's see how tough you are, kid, Maizu cackled sadistically. Man. Why do I have to deal with this when it's their fault for letting me in? Naruto sighed. Okay, guys, how about, instead of fighting me, you let me go, and I get you your money when I circle back to the island? Naruto offered, his hand up in front of him. Why is that his go-to in this situation? Tsunami sweat behind the counter, wondering how the blonde could be so nonchalant in the face of the demon brothers, she just hoped they didn't destroy the restaurant, she couldn't afford repairs at a time like this. I think this kid is making fun of us. Maizu looked to his brother. Seems that way, Gozu sighed in response. Suddenly, Maizu went on the offensive and moved his gauntleted left hand to claw at the blonde, bringing the weapon down. Claws first, he expected to rake across Naruto's face and ending his life quickly. So, when the thunk of the counter was heard, Maizu was confused. 
Maizu's gauntlet had become embedded in the countertop, missing the blonde entirely as he swiftly dodged the monster attack. Naruto had flipped up onto the countertop, doing a handstand with his back facing the two missing nin and forcing him to crane his head to keep his eyes on them. Guess we can't talk this out then, Naruto spoke from his position, he propped himself on one of his hands so he could pivot around to bring his heel into the side of Maizu's head. With his weapon stuck, Maizu stared at the blonde's foot approaching his face in mild surprise, and just when the attack was about to reach the astounded Chunin rank missing Nin, Gozu came to his brother's aid by blocking the heel with his gauntlet. Damn, you guys actually know what you're doing, this won't be easy, Naruto spoke to himself, feeling the slight sting from kicking the metal apparatus. Maizu, having gotten free from the counter, and Gozu both went to slash into the blonde who was riding himself on the counter, with a coordinated clawing motion, the brothers crossed their gauntlets through the air with Naruto landing behind them. This one is slippery, Gozu looked behind him to see that the blonde had taken out the two thugs once again when they attempted a sneak attack on the rebellious blonde, team attacks are the way to go, he can't dodge forever, Maizu. Don't have to tell me, looks like the brat has a little up his sleeves after all, Maizu scowled. Taking advantage of the boy's lapse in attention, the two went on the offensive once again, Maizu again went over the teen and Gozu went low, cutting the blonde's maneuverability and locking him from dodging left or right. Naruto looked behind him to see the two upon him and jumped into the air while twisting his body into the slight opening that they had between them, while the two criminals whiffed the attack, looking to their sides as they passed him, they missed the blonde's legs as he brought them out in a wheel kick that slammed the two into the boarded floor of the restaurant. This is why I hate fighting ninja. All you guys do is sneak attacks, Naruto grunted as he landed. The two brothers pulled themselves up from the floor and with little warning other than a look to each other they fired a shuriken-like chain from a hole in the gauntlets that connected into one long weapon, guiding their weapon, the two men had their new weapon loop above the shocked blonde who lunged behind a table to hide from sight. Hey, these guys are pretty good, but that isn't gonna stop me, Naruto brought a fist up behind the table, a slight swishing being heard for those that listened. Hiding won't save you, Maizu growled his brother disconnecting his chain from his so they could retract them and fire them through the table and tear it apart. Naruto, avoiding the sharp chains, jumped from behind the table at the same moment the missing nin had torn it asunder, his fist at his side, Naruto smirked at the two and made a punching motion. What is he doing? Gozu narrowed his eyes, watching the blonde aim at his brother and thrust his fist forward. Kei's Ken, wind fist, Naruto shouted with his punch, a compressed air fist launched from his arm striking the wild brother in the chest and sending him flying back. A wind user, E.H. Gozu reasoned, cough it didn't cut me, though, it was all force, Maizu wheezed, wincing in pain. Not too good at using your chakra, brat. Nah, I don't use that stuff, I ate a devil fruit, Naruto smiled. A, a devil fruit? Gozu seemed shocked, I thought those were supposed to be a myth, Maizu stood back up. In the blues they are, I ate the K's K's no M.I so I can manipulate and make wind, Naruto explained. Unknown to him, while taking the time to explain his abilities the demon brothers secretly reconnected their chains behind the talking blonde, no opening could be made in a fight, that would not be exploited by ninja. If it's all the same with you guys, I am going to end this and get out of here now, I have waves calling out for me, Naruto summoned winding gusts around his arms, ready to end the fight between the three. Sure thing, kid. Maizu pulled his chain with his brother and wrapped the blonde up in the sharp chain pulling it taut and forcing his arms to his sides at the same time. You stepped on the wrong toes, kid, it's better that were the ones that kill you if Gato found out that you were running amok, head send a real demon after you. I don't even know who you guys are talking about, Naruto grunted in slight discomfort. Ignorance is bliss, I suppose, consider it a comfort on your way to hell, Gozu tensed his arm to pull along with his brother and shred the team. I don't plan on dying here, ya jerks. Without hesitation, no thought on his predicament and only on his escape, Naruto twisted quickly and yanked the two men toward him to the point they soared through the air. Releasing the wind around his arms in a burst, Naruto was released from the chains and immediately recalled the wind to his arms, circling his arms in front of him, Naruto held the palms toward the flying ninja and met them in the air before striking them with his palms while releasing the swirling winds as added force. Shoryu Fuyashi, Rising Dragon Wind Palm, Naruto called his attack appearing behind the struck ninja as they whirled through the air, a palm mark appearing on their chest from the force of the strike and coughing blood, their unconscious bodies fell to the ground shortly after, unmoving with whited out eyes. The demon brothers, Kirigakir missing Nin, Gato's third strongest defense in wave, had been defeated by a lone blonde teen. Man, so much for getting out of here without causing trouble, Naruto looked back to the fallen opponents, 
He then took stock of the destruction his fight had caused to the restaurant, and began to sweat, imagining the reparations the woman would extract from him. With that quick observation, the blonde beat a hasty retreat from the restaurant, fully intent on procuring a vessel before the woman could find him. The citizens rose a confused brow at the sweating and panic blonde as he ran through the village to get to the port. Don't worry, Tsunami. I promise I'll make my way back here one day and pay you back in full, Naruto resolved. Even if it takes months, or years, decades, Naruto's voice trailed off as he bargained with himself on the exact time that he might make his way back here from his journey. Back in the restaurant in question, the woman opened a clenched eye when she realized that the bout was over, tentatively raising a hand to the counter, she peeked over it to see if the poor blonde was on the ground beaten and bloodied by the demon brothers and hoped it was at least a quick death. To her shock, not only was the blonde teen not dead, or even in the restaurant for that matter, the demon brothers were on the ground defeated, the woman couldn't believe her eyes, that blonde lout that tried to dine and dash, was able to defeat chunin level ninja like they were nothing. Against her better judgment, Tsunami had a burgeoning sense of hope begin to blossom. Tsunami-san, what was that commotion? A concerned bystander ran into the business and his eyes widened when he saw the four unconscious bodies on the floor, are those the demon brothers? Tsunami-san, what happened here? Are you alright? He asked rapidly though it seemed the woman wasn't paying any attention. The woman finally registered that her patron had booked it once he had defeated the ninja and got a tick mark on her forehead in annoyance. He causes all that trouble and still doesn't pay me? That boy, Tsunami brought herself up and made for the door, intent on finding the team. Wait, Tsunami-san. What are you doing? Please tell me what happened. Turning to the man, Tsunami had a smile on her face even in this odd situation and answered, I think I've found a glimmer of hope for us, and I can't let him get away. Lock the four of them up before they regain consciousness. Tsunami ordered the man. What's gotten into her? Gato want like this, but this is a golden opportunity. I hope whoever this is, is up to the challenge. The man sighed and began to carefully tie up the four criminals. At the port, come on, old man. I just need a ship to get out of here. Naruto shouted to an old man working at the port, bargaining for a dinghy. And I told you, ya disrespectful brat, you need money. The man shot back, sick of dealing with the stubborn team. What is it with this place and money? If people need something should NT they just get it for free. What kind of fantasy world are you living in? The man was honestly appalled at how stupid this kid was. That thing looks like it's about to sink anyway, so why not just give it to me? Naruto argued in the face of the man. If you want it then the condition doesn't matter, it's worth something as soon as there is interest and when there's interest, there's money to be made, the man finished with a greedy glint in his eyes that man Naruto sweat drop. Everyone here is obsessed, Naruto crossed his arms, trying to think of a solution, he didn't want to just up and steal the boat from the man, but had gotten into way more trouble than he wanted in this village that was supposed to be a small stop. So, Naruto-san, money problems still plaguing you? A voice he recognized came up behind him a draped an arm around his shoulder. Naruto looked to his side and paled when was met with the sinister grin of Tsunami, dark shadows crossed her face and her hair seemed wild as she hooked her arm harder, making it choke the blonde. You know this hoodlum, Tsunami? The man asked, chucking while watching the blonde had been getting into it with, struggle when a woman had her sights set on him. Yes, I do, he tried to get out of paying for his food, she squeezed harder and watched the blonde turn blue. Uh, I told you I'd pay you back later, please, a hoodlum like you? You'd never come back if we let you go, the man growled. I wasn't raised to break my word, my gramps would kill me if I did that, one of the greatest measures of a man is keeping his word, it just would have taken me a long time. Any modicum of respect the man would have gotten from the resolute words of the blonde died right there. On the other hand, Tsunami's malicious smile grew into a genuine smirk at the blonde's words. Well, Naruto-san, today is your lucky day, Tsunami released the blonde who took a gasp of air. Huh? He asked confused along with the man, I have a proposition for you, and if you do it, I'll happily waive that bill of yours, Tsunami had the blonde hook, line, and sinker with the juicy bait she was waving in front of his face and she knew it. Nani? Naruto looked dumbfounded and tilted his head. Wasn't this woman just about to choke him to death and ironically not get her money from him? Now she wants him to do some job for her, something is fishy. I don't want to work in that restaurant for five years, lady, Naruto preemptively denied. Come now, that can be water under the bridge if you help me. Tsunami then offered something that she knew the blonde couldn't refuse. Why not come to my home and at least hear my proposal, we can talk about it over dinner. Okay. Naruto without an ounce of trepidation or indecision agreed at the promise of the woman's delicious food. Men's stomachs, the ever-reliable tool for a woman. The blonde charged ahead, 
not knowing where the residence was but with great enthusiasm and bouncing on the balls of his feet. Tsunami, are you sure that this hooligan can be trusted? Seems he has no problem in being a criminal, the man looked to the energetic blonde. That's all the better for us with what I have in mind, Tsunami strode away at that, not giving anything away regarding her plans for the blonde. At Tsunami's home, wow, a real table, this is great, Naruto jittered in place at the table, clanging his silverware together. This was a novel experience for him, sitting at a table, set for four people, waiting for a good meal, in a home. So, this is what it feels like, you know, Naruto-san, I don't think I have ever seen anyone be so excited over a simple dinner, Tsunami giggled as she started setting the plates of food on the table. One in front of Naruto, hers going next to his, one across from him, and another that went next to him. I don't think you give yourself enough credit, Tsunami, this food is delicious, better than anything I have eaten. Naruto dug in wholeheartedly. Glad to know that my food is so good it's worth trying to dine and dash, she teased and watched him freeze with his mouth full. Still on that, he looked to her in guilt, all right, guess that means we need to get serious, what do you want me to do? Naruto asked, still eating with gusto as he turned to the woman. At least it seems you are capable of grasping the severity of the situation, tsunami sweat dropped when an empty plate was thrust in her face, mostly. After getting the blonde seconds, Tsunami became grim as she began to get to business, nervously fiddling with her apron, the woman hoped that the blonde would accept the task. Tell me, Naruto-san, have you noticed the state of our village? At the question, Naruto stopped eating, his fork inches from his mouth, he tilted his head, racking his brain for the sights that had ignored upon his arrival, all the decrepit houses, the dismal expressions on the people's faces, and yet the port was immaculate. Oh, yeah, this place is kind of a dump, so blunt, Tsunami kept a small smile as she thought this but sighed to herself, she couldn't blame him for thinking this. But the port was great and way busier than anywhere else, ships were going in and out like crazy, what's with that? Naruto asked the woman. You're right, the port is the most important source of income that our village has, most of the younger, sturdier men work there day and night, they're lucky enough to come home for a day or two, Tsunami explained. Then should NT you guys be way richer? Everyone needs a way to cross the ocean for goods exclusive to islands, right? Naruto raised his eyebrow. Normally yes, that was what we expected when it was first built, but because of our island's isolationism, it was small and hard to start, and then Gato appeared. The guy those ninja claw guys were talking about. He had money, and he used it to expand the port to what it is now and of course, it enticed potential customers in spite of the subtle dangers that could be presented by docking on such a famous island. Tsunami looked to her lap, the business expanded at an alarming rate, and before too long it became a monopoly the only real way of making money here, and Gato knew this, Tsunami gripped her apron in frustration. The blonde, having finished his plate simply sat and listened to the distraught woman, not wanting to interrupt her as she poured her emotions out. He, he knew that he was our lifeline and that if he left, we'd be right back where we started, dying a slow death because of our small size and being unaffiliated with the hidden villages, he became our dictator, Tsunami put a hand to her mouth to stifle a sob. He must be a tough guy if you couldn't just take back control, Naruto spoke up, crossing his arms. Tsunami chuckled to herself, he's a little weasel of a man I don't doubt that he couldn't fight his way out of a sack if placed in one, so he hired his muscle to keep us all in line after, a failed attempt. You want me to take care of this Gato guy? Naruto scratched the back of his head, uh, no offense but I am just one person, shouldn't you look for outside help, maybe? Naruto tried to deflect. He was confident, given the quality of soldiers had seen already, that he could easily do it but that was something detrimental to him, his face be plastered all over the island way before he wanted anyone to know of him. We tried already, we've been in contact with Konoha. Konoha. Naruto groaned just hearing that name, just what he needed, the village he needed to depart from would of course be asking Konoha for help of, all places. Yes, they are close by and are supposed to be the strongest village out of them all, so it made sense to seek aid from them. HMPH, so where are they then? Naruto rolled his eyes and rested his head in his palm with his elbow on the table. They aren't coming, Naruto raised his head at that bit of information. Why weren't those guys jumping at the chance for increased income? If they saved Wave then they'd most likely be seen as heroes by the citizens and get them on the ground floor for something that could be big. How come? Naruto asked, we don't have enough money. Tsunami looked down once more, tears welling in her eyes. Our first correspondence was lucky enough to make it out of the village and our hopes swelled when Gato seemed to back off. Fearing the force that the greatest hidden village would bear down upon him. We waited with bated breath for the first sign of our saviors, but we received a message from them instead, Tsunami grit her teeth, 
it said that ninja wouldn't be deployed unless we could get the full amount necessary for an A rank mission, and our hearts sank, and Gato, after that scare, didn't want to take any chances so he hired four missing nin into his personal army and raised taxes to punish us for our transgression. Naruto growled at this knowledge, wondering how that place, being touted as the strongest village, would leave neighbors to suffer simply because they couldn't pay. Of course they couldn't pay. They were being subjugated purposely by a guy that hid behind money and status to keep people under heel. But we didn't lose hope, even with everything stacked against us. We all strove to make our way out of this agony, already on the edge of survival. We all scrounged up the money that we could sacrifice and pooled it together to begin building the fund for the Konoha Nin, we all have given up certain essentials in our lives just to have the chance, and throughout it all we've begged them to consider lowering the price or letting us pay the difference at a later date, only to be denied at every turn. Tsunami's tears couldn't be held back at this point, placing her hand on her forehead with them running down her arm. Hey, are you okay? Naruto reached to the woman in concern. We've suffered so much, and yet people with the power to do something are only thinking of themselves. We can't live like this any longer, so when I saw you, Naruto-san, and how you stood up to Gato's men I couldn't help but feel hopeful that someone had finally come through our home with the power to help us. Tsunami gripped the blonde's tattered collar, surprising him. Please, Tsunami's desperation was palpable, Naruto-san, you have to help us, Tsunami laid all her troubles on the table her strength going as she relived the torture that she and her home had to go through. Naruto placed his hands on hers, slowly taking them off his person and bringing them in between him, his face was stoic, and his mouth was in a thin line as he seemingly mulled over his answer. I can't, the woman's heart broke when she heard this. Naruto seemed a nice person, a bit rough around the edges but a clear moral code drove him, the blonde, with his power could have easily eaten at a restaurant and threatened her for pursuing the bill that he had incurred but had promised to pay her later instead. How could a person like that deny helping those in need? Don't get me wrong, I don't like what happening to you guys here and I want to do something, but I can't, Naruto let go of the woman's hands and finished with words that shook her. It isn't my problem, this made her livid, what about a man keeping his word, was that all a lie? No, I plan to come back with the money that I owe you. I am giving you a way out of doing that, why not take it? That puts me on the spot and in the limelight, I've told you before that I just came here to set off to sea and getting into trouble for a bunch of people I don't know isn't worth the heat, it'll be a target, sooner than I want, Naruto justified his actions. This stunned the woman into silence, and she found that she couldn't muster any more anger, his answer was simple, yet true, he would become a criminal in legal terms since Gato owned the port and its assets, Naruto would be throwing his future away for people that had only known about for a day and she was selfishly asking him to fight on their behalf, to save her people. In a way it was like Konoha, she was looking to waive a bill for him in return for him doing something for her. I am sorry, I should nt have gotten angry like that, she regretted her actions. It's okay, you've been through a lot, but if you really want to forgive me, Naruto started to trail off but the door to the house opened at that same moment. A young boy walked in wearing a yellow undershirt and green overalls with sandals and a bucket hat with a blue stripe across it, his eyes bore into the dining room as he stared at the blonde in Tsunami. Inari, welcome home. Tsunami called to the boy, TCH. Yo, what's up? Naruto offered a greeting to the boy as he sat next to the blonde, barely acknowledging him. Who the hell are you supposed to be? Inari asked rudely, not looking at the teen and starting to slowly eat his food. This is Naruto san, Inari, I was talking to him about our predicament and invited him over for dinner. Your mom makes great food, you sure are lucky, Naruto nudged the kid with a grin. Our predicament, huh? Inari sneered moving his eyes to regard the cheerful blonde, so what, you trying to be another hero or something? Inari frowned at the blonde. Well, you should just quit while you're ahead, fool. Inari. Tsunami raised her voice at the boy, Naruto-san has actually. You don't need to tell him anything, Tsunami, Naruto stopped the woman, nonchalant at the insult that had been thrown at him. I don't care what he did, mom, if he's going to go and get himself killed by Gato, then you should let him, only idiots try and be heroes. Inari looked to the empty plate that sat across from Naruto. Yeah, I am nothing special, I am just passing through, after all, and I am no hero, your mom asked me to help out with this Gato stuff, but I decided against it, they all seem to have a plan, so I think it's best they go ahead with it and hopefully, everything will work out, Naruto grinned at the end. Tsunami had a somber smile at that, even though the chances of them succeeding in gather the money before wave collapsed were slim, Naruto's optimism was comforting in a small way. You're smarter than you look. I wish everyone would get with the program, Inari grunted. Naruto rose a brow and pressed the boy, what do you mean by that? From what your mom told me, everyone here is working really hard to get help from, Konoha, 
they've sacrificed a lot just for that chance. Konoha hasn't come yet, so why would they come now or later? We're an out of the way village, we aren't worth the effort. Inari gripped his fork tightly to the point that his knuckles went white. That's why we should NT be wasting our time trying to defeat Gato, we'll only end up dead or worse. Well, your mom said Gato is weak and hides behind his goons, so you just need to go in more prepared, right? Naruto asked, wondering how the kid would respond. If you know what happened then you should know that won't do anything, they're idiots for trying, we need to keep our heads down and. What have you done? Naruto cut the kid off, what? Inari asked, his worried mother who had been sitting by and watching the debate was also curious by what the blonde was getting at. Everyone here is working hard to become free, cutting back their own needs and putting the village above them, Naruto looked to Inari seriously as he spoke his next words, and all I see you doing is whining about how useless it is for them to try, only people that have resolved to work towards something are allowed to speak badly about themselves, you're just a crybaby, Naruto ended simply. What do you know? Inari shouted and stood up from his chair, these idiots are just going to get themselves killed if they struggle, Inari growled. It's better to go down fighting than roll over and die, Naruto retorted, shocking the two, he then started to laugh at the kid, your problem is that you're a crybaby and a coward. What did you say? Inari clenched his fists, Naruto-san, he's just a boy, Tsunami defended her son. That's no excuse, when all you do is cry, that's when you've lost, Naruto said with a smile, I gotta say. I find it hard to believe that you're Tsunami's son if you're this big a baby, Naruto didn't seem to care about how his words affected the kid as he reached across the table for the plate that hadn't been touched. Don't touch that, Inari shouted, taking the plate out of the blonde's reach. E.H. Why? It's just been sitting there, so why can't I have it? Naruto whined slightly. It isn't for you, you bastard, Inari took the food and ran upstairs. This kid needs to chill out, what got his underwear in a twist? Naruto looked to Tsunami. Forgive him, Naruto-san, he's been through a lot, Tsunami sighed sadly, it's ingrained in me to make three plates for dinner all the time and it seems even with you here I can't shake the habit, that plate was made for my father, Tsunami looked to the space where the untouched plate had sat. Your dad, huh? Where is he, did he die? Naruto asked the woman and tilted his head when she chuckled dryly. A tear came out of her eye again just thinking about this issue, that's a great question, I don't know. Tsunami answered with a pained smile on her face. You don't know? He's been in prison for months, our first rebellion wasn't the only one, but it was the most devastating. Tsunami looked to the stairs, making sure that her son had left the lower floor before she shared this tragic story. Once the writing was on the wall, Gato's iron grip tightening ever more on wave, we didn't have a want to fight back. We were content on waiting for some kind of miracle to make its way to us as small a chance as it was, but one man riled us up and inspired us to fight, Kaiza. Tsunami smiled at mentioning the mon's name, Kaiza didn't mince words with us. He called us cowards that didn't have the spine to defend what we wanted to be protected and that was why Gato could control our lives as easily as he did, he would always be in the thick of disputes that would arise between the enforcers and villagers, defending them as if he was the one being targeted, he was inspiring, and it was because of that quality of his that our fire of rebellion was sparked, I loved that about him. He your husband? Naruto asked, was, with the people rallied, it seemed nothing could stop us, Kaiza led everyone to Gato's headquarters intent on dragging off his pedestal, only for them to realize only a fraction of Gato's forces had been active in the village proper, and they were decimated by the overwhelming force, knowing that ridding the village PF workers would only be detrimental, Gato ordered his men to injure the insurgents, not kill, the exception to the rule. The leader, that's how you kill the morale for another attempt, Naruto pointed out. Tsunami grimly nodded in confirmation, Kaiza was taken to the village square for all to see as Gato had his arms chopped off an insult to the man that would often say that you needed both arms to protect everything precious to you, before killing him for an example to anyone else, Tsunami shook, remembering the graphic image and covering Inari's eyes, the both of them screaming Kaiza's name in anguish as the portly man gave the finishing blow to the fisherman. That was when Inari became like he is now, Kaiza was my second husband, until I had met and married him Inari had never had a father, so Kaiza became Inari's world, the unkillable hero that could survive anything and be able to rescue anyone. Seeing that man bloodied and beaten destroyed him and he stopped believing in anyone that would say they would save Wave, including us, Tsunami revealed. And your dad? My father didn't want to put his faith in a hidden village coming to our aid. When Kaiza came along and rounded us up, my father realized that this was a problem that only we could handle. Kaiza dying and Konoha's repeated refusal without compensation. Only cemented that fact in his mind, Tsunami sighed, of course, Gato had gotten wise to our secrets and had more men watching us so my father's outspoken and stubborn nature had him make a rash decision to fight, 
and he was captured along with any that helped him, I haven't seen him since then, I didn't even know he was captured until two days later, and I kept making him a plate for those two days and since, I just wanted everything to be normal again, am I foolish for wishing that? No, but sometimes you can't go back to the way things were, Naruto answered her, speaking from his own experience and the changes he had to make when his normal was shaken. That's why I really wanted you to help us, but, I guess we'll have to keep working for the money that Konoha wants. You don't have to do that, Naruto smiled to the surprised woman. You'll stop Gato, but what about not wanting the attention? Tsunami was confused. I don't want it, and I am not doing it for you, Naruto answered simply. Tsunami got even more confused at that answer and saw the blonde almost pirate look to the stairs. The way I see it, that crybaby of yours isn't anything like the rest of his family or even his community, he gave up when the going got rough and now he's badmouthing the people that are fighting for what they believe in. Naruto then got a giant grin on his face that looked like it would split his mouth, never taking his eyes off the stairs, and his next words made the mother's eyes widen in shock. I want to see the look on his face when I prove him wrong, he's bound to stop being a big wet blanket if I knock that Gato guy on his ass, right? Naruto pondered with his grin. Tsunami couldn't believe the simple reason that the blonde teen had come around to helping her home, even if inadvertently. It wasn't the sob story that she had given him, the tragic events that had led to the desperate situation that the citizens had found themselves in, or even the promise of having an obligation had incurred being voided. He chose to do this because he wanted Inari to change for the better. Tsunami couldn't help but laugh at this revelation, Naruto was a man that didn't dance to anyone else's tune, he was the type to do what he wanted for his own reasons. What's so funny? You imagine the dumb face he'd be making, too? Naruto looked to the woman. No, I am just glad that I met you, Naruto-san, Tsunami wiped her eye of the now joyful tears. So, what can you tell me about Gato's base? Naruto asked. Unknown to the two, at the top of the stairs, still holding the plate, Inari heard the blonde's words. The next day morning, I don't want to spend the whole day talking care of this, so I am going to go early in the morning, Naruto spoke to the woman last night as they made a plan. That is a good idea, everyone will be sluggish from just waking up, Tsunami applauded. Naruto walked down a long road that led to Gato's mansion, prepared for the long day that laid ahead of him and a serious look on his face. When it comes to enforcers, my best estimate is around 100 men being in there, not including the ninja bodyguards, Tsunami pointed to a crude map that her father had made when he would plan for his uprising. Where are the prisoners supposed to be held? Most likely below the ground floor, why? If I am going in there, I might as well find your dad, right? Naruto offered with a smile. Yan man, why's Gato gotta make us get up so early? A random thug that stood in front of the mansion's door, rubbing his eyes. Long as he's paying, I could stay up 24-7, so, quit whining, another grumbled, leaning against the wall next to the door. With 100 men standing in your way, ITD be best if you circled around Gato's mansion, he's a coward, so he made a back entrance that is built into the lowest floor's back wall to bail out in any situation. Tsunami circled her finger around the map and pointed to the secret escape. Naruto nodded, if you take that escape away from him, hell be trapped, your focus should be on his bodyguards. I don't know anything about one of them, but the one you can't underestimate is Zabuza Momochi the demon of the hidden mist. He's a missing nin that was brave enough to lead a coup against the Mizukage and a former member of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, just talking about the man made her shiver, with these two, it's best to sneak in and save your strength to fight them, if they're defeated, the grunts won't take much more to either scatter or give up. Okay, gotcha, Naruto nodded again, a hand on his chin. At this point, the two grunts saw a shadow coming down the road. Huh, who's that? The more alert thug rose a brow, stop messing around who's dumb enough to stroll up on Gato's doorstep? The drowsy thug yawned again and tried to straighten his view on the peculiar shadow. Up above all this, in his private room, Gato stuffed his face and smoked a cigar while ranting to himself, and the two Kiri missing Nin that were ignoring him. I can't believe those fools got captured, what the hell were they doing? Gato shouted, having got the news of the Demon Brothers imprisonment but no detail on who had put them there. Why does it matter? We can go get them anytime we want, Zabuza told the man. It matters because it means some other fool is going and getting too big for his britches again. Gato shouted to the man and gulped when the masked ninja glared at him. Hasn't there been any news? Anyone suspicious? Gato grasped at straws. No, but given our bridge guards were also captured we can't tell who had come into the village, Haku spoke from a corner. Whoever did this most likely made his way out of here once they realized what they had done, the smart move, Zabuza spoke. Had better be glad that he left, then, if he was here. 
I'd be dancing on his corpse for trying to undermine my authority. Gato said haughtily. Hey, is Gato in there? A loud voice was heard. The two hardened ninja just perked up in response while Gato yelped in fear and ducked down with his hands over his head. W what? Who is that? The coward gulped in fear. Looks like whoever had caused all that trouble had got guts, but as an idiot, Zabuza walked to the window to see who was brave enough to come here. He looked out and saw Naruto standing in front of the mansion, with Gato's army scrambling outside to meet the threat. Well, that's a surprise. Gato peeked out the window next to Zabuza and upon seeing the teen gained his confidence back, letting out a small indiscernible sigh to himself. He was glad that it wasn't anyone strong or dangerous coming for him. Hey, shorty, are you Gato? Naruto called, and what if I am brat? Gato smirked, smoking a new cigar and trying to be intimidating. I came here to kick your ass, Naruto called. That declaration made everyone assembled laugh their head off, the only exceptions being Zabuza and Haku. That's rich, brat, you can go ahead and do that, but I don't think my associates will let you. Gato let out a puff of smoke, tell you what, you beat all of them and it'll let you see me, if not, your face can get acquainted with the bottom of my boot, Gato chuckled. Naruto looked in front of him to see that all of the grunts had come out with cocky smirks on their faces, a variety of weapons were in their hands from swords, brass knuckles, and clubs all of which were slung onto their bodies for casual intimidation. Hey, you'd have been better off keeping to yourself, kid, Gato's in charge of this village. Not for long, Naruto ran forward and socked one of them in the face so hard that he flew through and collided into more grunts. The thugs were all shocked at the blonde's strength, looking at him with a cold sweat running down their foreheads. Gato's glasses slid down his face with a dumbfounded face and snot hanging from his nose. If you guys want a chance, Naruto cracked his knuckles, you better come at me all at once. At this provocation, the fodder all jumped into action. That's more like it, Naruto ran to meet them, wind gathered around Naruto's leg in preparation before he brought it up in a kick as the large group was approaching him. Kyofu suipu, gale sweep. The wind whipped from Naruto's leg almost like a snake, knocking into the grunts and sending them flying away from the concussive force. Huh? Gato gulped. A wind user? Haku asked, I didn't see eye hand signs, that brat must have gotten his hands on a devil fruit, and here I thought they were just a myth. Zabuza smirked beneath his mask, looks like fighting this kid would be a lot of fun. What'll I do? He's plowing right through them all, what kind of monster can do that? Gato cried pathetically. Go to your panic room, Zabuza ordered the man, you're our employer so I am obligated to keep you safe, even if it makes me want to vomit, Haku, get the seals. Zabuza had his charge scurry into a panic room head had made in case something like this happened. When the door closed, Zabuza and Haku put their hands onto it with seals being left behind, chakra running through the door, and pulsing with power. A dead mon's seal that would basically be invincible, locking out any outside persons as long as the seals were in place, to remove them, the ones that had placed the seals would have to either die or be incapacitated so their chakra would case to run through the seal. Simply put, Naruto would have to defeat both Haku and Zabuza to get to Gato. Go and meet that kid, Haku, he'll stay here, Zabuza commanded. It will be done, outside, Naruto had just finished with the grunts and made his way to the mansion entrance. Excuse my intrusion, Naruto called and opened the door, the blonde was met with a long, empty corridor, oh yeah, Tsunami said that there were a hundred guys, he looked back outside and gave a quick glance, that's about a hundred, pretty sure, so, it'll be those two ninja, then. Naruto strolled into the hallway, and upon the door closing the temperature inside dropped to the point that he could see his breath. Whoa, it got cold. Naruto pointed out, he then started to mess around with the temperature change by breathing harder to see more of his breath. While he played, the condensation on the walls began to coalesce and freeze into needles, before flying in Naruto's direction. The deadly ice needles, once they had solidified enough, quickly shot toward the distracted blonde from the wall, his unprotected back made for the perfect target and would incapacitate the rebellious youth so Gato could decide what to do with him later. While Naruto messed around, his ears perked up when he heard the slight sound of the wind displacing around the projectiles coming toward him, given his abilities, the blonde had become very good at picking up subtle attacks such as this. The wind was his ally, after all, Naruto ducked down just as the needles were about to reach his back, making them soar over his head, with the danger averted, Naruto quickly turned in the direction that the attack had come from and let loose a wind fist in retaliation, to his surprise, no one was there to receive the blow as it harmlessly hit the wall and left an indent of his fist. Ah, ninja tricks. Damn it, why don't you guys ever fight fair? Naruto grumbled, crouched on the floor, and kept on alert, waiting for the next attack. He didn't have to wait long as his eyes widened in pain, looking down, Naruto saw a spike made of ice impaled through his foot, 
Realizing what was about to happen, the back flipped out of the way as more spikes began to jut from the floor, trailing after him. As he avoided the spikes from the floor, Naruto caught another group of needles in his periphery that came from the wall, managing to catch him in the side but not slow his escape. The icy spears stopped following the blonde after a bit, leaving him to catch his breath and take the needles from his side. Small trickles of blood left the tiny puncture wounds, but the teen was otherwise fine, had dealt with worse training with Rayleigh. You're quite quick, aren't you? A voice said from the cold hallway, appearing from the wall next to Naruto. Bam the blonde had immediately kicked at the unknown figure with zero hesitation, unfortunately, it seemed it hadn't affected the person at all, and now that he looked closer, Naruto saw that he lashed out at some kind of ice film that had formed over the wall. And impatient, Haku said from behind the blonde, Naruto shot a back kick this time, only for the same result, this ice was tough enough that he couldn't crack it, and the ninja appeared in both the ice constructs. A reflection? Come out and fight me already, Naruto growled impatiently. Do you take me for a fool? Haku tilted his head when asking the question, I know that you were able to defeat all of those brutes with ease, so I hold no delusion that, in a physical battle, you have me outclassed, though, seeing as you have devil fruit abilities, I would hazard a guess that you haven't trained in any ninja arts. Nope, even before I got my powers, I couldn't do those, Naruto answered. And you would let your enemy know that? Haku rose a brow that was unseen behind his mask. It won't make a difference, cause I am still gonna kick your ass, Naruto smirked confidently. The masked ninja brought a hand to his mouth area and chuckled. You keep becoming more interesting, just who are you? I am Naruto, he answered, arms crossed, and what village do you belong to? Haku asked, the hallway gaining mirrors of ice on both sides. I don't, I am no shinobi, Naruto grinned, I am a pirate. A pirate, eh? Peculiar for one so young, Haku vanished, his image being projected on all the mirrors. Maybe, now get out of there and fight me. Naruto punched another mirror. You won't be finding me that way. A rain of ice needles met the blonde, shredding his already ragged attire along with his body, while not overly harming. The attacks were made to weaken the powerhouse rather than instantly kill, for the moment. Eventually, the blonde had gotten sick of the needles and released a dome of wind from his body, knocking them back into the wall or bounce harmlessly into the mirrors and onto the floor. Man, all those needles are annoying, and I can't tell the difference between all these mirrors. Naruto put a hand on his chin. Speaking to yourself. It's how I think, Naruto lashed out and hit the mirror that spoke to him. It was a bad decision, as Haku used that to his advantage. Freezing the blonde's hand to the mirror, the blonde was then stabbed in his side and through the shoulder by more spikes coming from said mirror, the force of which shot him backward into the opposite wall where a mirror greeted him, the mirror that his back impacted, of course, was ready for him with a bed of needles for him to land on, hitting the trap. Naruto grunted in pain and made sure he landed face down to keep the needles from going any deeper. I must say, I find it odd that someone such as you, a pirate, would risk his life for an out of the way village like this, Haku wondered aloud, they must have offered you something substantial. Naruto slammed his hand onto the floor, raising his head to look at the mirror that he assumed the masked ninja had talked from, a smirk on his face despite his unfavorable situation, and blood staining his jacket. Pirates don't need a reason to do things, I am doing this because I want to, it's as simple as that. Naruto jumped up swiftly and shot to the mirror, calling wind to his fist once more only keeping it swirling around his fist, bringing his hand up to the mirror, Naruto barreled his fist into it and shattered the construct along with severely damaging the wall behind it, using his powers, Naruto had condensed the wind around his punch and released it on the point of impact adding the power of the compressed force to his fist. Tempestotopanchi, Tempest Punch, Haku's eyes grew wide behind his mask, watching as his most powerful technique had been broken for the first time ever, even Zabuza, as powerful as he was couldn't so much as crack on of his ice mirrors, this boy was more dangerous than either of them had given him credit for. I think I am getting this technique of yours, Naruto turned to another mirror, you've still got one body, even if it's being reflected by all these mirrors, so all I have to do is keep breaking them until I find ya. Naruto reasoned with a positively devilish smirk on his face. Haku got serious at this point, with the knowledge that this teen could break his mirrors, he could no longer take him lightly, and this meant that the masked missing nin would have to commit an act that churned his stomach, kill the blonde. I won't be allowing that. Haku's reflections all brandished Senbon between their fingers, ready to end the blonde's journey on its first leg. My job is to incapacitate you and protect Gato, and if an opportunity to end your life is presented, I won't hesitate, Haku threatened. Fine by me, Naruto smiled, hope getting your ass kicked is worth it for that little shrimp. Naruto jumped at the nearest mirror and shattered it with another wind augmented punch. I am not scared of dying, ITD make me slow down, if I am gonna risk my life on the ocean, 
something like death can't spook me. Come, brave words, Haku smiled behind the blonde and showered him with even more needles. And ill have you know that Gato is nothing but an employer. My being is devoted to being Zabuza Sama's tool, as long as he wants us to work for Gato, I will do so, if he tells me to end Gato, I'd turn on the rodent in a heartbeat. Haku faded back into a mirror at speeds that Naruto couldn't keep up with, that is my repayment to the precious person that gave me purpose, your flimsy result, simply floating adrift on a ship, beholden to no one, you can't understand what it is to protect your precious people. Naruto stood, bleeding from his wounds with his arms crossed to protect his face from the hail of needles had his brow furrowed, he lowered his arms to stare in the mirror before him, a frown on his face. This Sabuza guy, he's important to you, but he treats you like a tool? Naruto asked in disbelief. He didn't do it out of kindness, but he saved me because of my usefulness, this ice you see, is my keke jenke, it was something I was almost killed for and Zabuza Sama saw my worth and nurtured me to be his weapon. Hearing this Naruto grew angrier and angrier, and the final words took it over the top. The least I can do is serve him until my last breath. That's a bunch of bullshit. Naruto punched the mirror with all his strength without using his powers but still managed to crack the ice in his anger, bloodying his fist in the process. Him saving your life doesn't mean that you owe him it. No living person should ever be used as a tool. Naruto thought back on his own life and Rayleigh. The real world is never rose tinted. Saviors like you hardly appear in times of need. Haku countered after getting over his shock. I am not disagreeing with that. Heroes are few, and I am not trying to be one here. I just want to see the look on this stupid kid's face when I prove him wrong and knock Gato on his ass. But now, I want to meet this Zabuza guy and talk to him, Naruto said with deadly certainty. I've already told you, my job is to keep you here, Haku dashed out of the mirror, ready to end the battle with the pirate, only to be taken by surprise when the team turned to the masked ninja and brought his hand up to grab Haku. Narrowly avoiding the outstretched hand, Haku receded into a mirror and panted from the shock of almost being caught by the rookie pirate. A nervous sweat broke on Haku's forehead, this boy had not only broken his mirrors but seemed to discover the trick of his technique. He couldn't have, under these circumstances, I am not gonna die here, and I've already figured out how to beat you, Naruto had his mouth set in a thin line, I am gonna move on and take out that Zabuza guy, so let's finish this, he stood with his arms to his sides practically goading the masked nin to attack. That overconfidence of yours will be your undoing, even if you were to defeat me, Zabuza Sama is untouchable to the likes of you and he won't be merciful, Haku rose to the challenge, rushing the blonde and pushing himself to the limit. All the while, Naruto was rooted in his spot not budging an inch as the senbon and ice needles cut him or stabbed him, only gritting his teeth at the feeling, eventually, the blonde did get a tad overwhelmed and took a knee, leaving himself open, Haku took this opportunity, ready to finish his fight with the would-be pirate, coming from behind him Haku readied the needles in his hands. Only for the blonde to disappear from his sight, I realized, when you were throwing all those needles, Naruto had appeared above Haku, looking down at him with a haunting gaze, I could hear something whooshing through the air along with them larger than a needle should be, so I figured, that you were hit and running me from those mirrors and moving fast enough that it just looked like there was a lot of you, Naruto gathered wind to his feet enough that the gusts were audible. I really hate ninja tricks, Kei's Ochi, windfall, Naruto slammed down onto Haku with enough force that the mask on his face was destroyed on impact along with the floor beneath them giving way. The two soon crashed through the ceiling of the basement, Naruto landing on top of the defeated ninja, the shards of Haku's mask were strewn about the floor, with him lying underneath the victor completely unconscious, eyes whited out, and blood trickling from the corners of his mouth and head. After composing himself, Naruto took a seat next to Haku and looked down to his face. Ino, for a ninja you are not so bad, Naruto ran his hand through his hair and gave the older boy a sideways glance, even though you talked that big game and all, you were never aiming to kill me, you are pretty soft for a killer, but I kinda like that, Naruto looked up through the hole that had made and beyond, imagining Zabuza on the top floor. You probably wouldn't have ended up here if it wasn't for that guy, and he doesn't care? I can't believe that. Naruto stood up at the end of his thought, and finally took notice of all the eyes that were looking at him behind bars. Gato's basement doubled as a prison for all the citizens of Wave that had rebelled against him and currently all those miserable, broken people had their eyes on the blonde. He came crashing through the ceiling. He took out that ninja that's always following Zabuza. Who is this kid? The murmurs of the prisoners filled the space as they all flooded to the front of the cages to get a look at their presumed savior. Are you here to rescue us? One of them asked, Hmm, yeah I guess so, Naruto rubbed the back of his head. Really, you don't sound like a very convincing savior. To be honest, I kinda forgot about you guys, I was just gonna get rid of Gato, Naruto laughed. A blunt and forgetful savior at that. The prisoners shouted with their eyes bulging. 
Naruto then perked up and looked at the prisoners, that's right, is a guy named Tazuna here by any chance? Naruto asked. I am Tazuna, Brad, how do you my name? An older man came to the front curious about the blonde. Tsunami told me that you were too stubborn and got yourself caught, so I told her that I would run by and grab Ya if the chance came by, and because of him, Naruto pointed to Haku's downed body, I ran into you. Let me get this straight, my darling daughter got some kid to come and save Wave from Gato, who's helping you? I am on my own, Naruto answered simply, looking down at the keyhole. His nonchalance shocked the assembled prisoners, they all risked their lives to try and take Gato down and were painfully dealt with and locked away from their families, now a kid just pushing into adulthood waltzed in and said he was going to get rid of Gato. You guys know where the keys are? Naruto asked, who else would have them but Gato? He never lets them out of his sight and he likes to gloat about it, coming down here waving them in front of us, even opening the cell just to beat on us for fun, knowing we couldn't fight back. Tazuna growled. So, my goal's the same, I just gotta beat Gato. Naruto jumped back through the hole had made and looked over the side, I'll go take care of that ninja Zabuza, and then I'll come back to let you guys out. He disappeared and made for the stairs. That kid's got serious balls to do this, but he doesn't look like he'd be able to. A random citizen looked at the hole. Whether he can or can't is irrelevant, he has to. Tazuna crossed his arms, placing his hopes on the long shot that his daughter had brought to their doorstep. Happening at the same time, Upstairs, the sealed door to the panic room had one of the seals lose its energy and become a worthless piece of paper, flitting to the ground, this caught Zabuza's eye as he sat at the table in Gato's room, only giving a side glance to the door. Haku lost to that kid? Should have known that he'd go easy on that brat, Zabuza got up from the chair when he heard the hurried footsteps of the teen, I won't be so kind, Zabuza prepared himself for the battle ahead. Hey, I am coming in, Naruto opened the door seeing no one inside and taking immediate notice of the suspicious door on the other side of the room. He'll probably be on guard, he knows that I am somewhere in this room, and his best bet is to approach the room Kati. Weird door ahead. Gato's probably hiding in there, Naruto ran right into the room, heading right for the panic room door. Zabuza's sweat dropped at the boy's lack of caution, and it didn't help when he watched Naruto try and force open the door. Ah, damn it, this thing is shut tight, must be this weird paper. What was it called again? Naruto wondered to himself. That would be a seal, kid. Zabuza's voice rolled in along with an odd mist that obscured Naruto's vision. That door'll only open when you beat me. Zabuza stalked around the room silently. Ice and now mist, and both of you guys like to hide rather than fight fair, huh? Naruto turned around, walking carefully to the center of the room and keeping his senses sharp. Ninja don't need to fight fair, kid. All that matters is eliminating your enemy as quickly as possible and with my silent killing technique it's all the easier. Naruto was nonplussed with the swordsman's words, picking his ear with a deadpan expression while Zabuza spoke, oh yeah? Naruto inspected his finger as he pulled it from his ear. Do you realize in just how many ways the human body can be killed instantly? You'd be dead before you'd even hit the ground, brat, Zabuza taunted, sneaking ever closer to the blonde. For a silent killer, you sure like to talk, Naruto muttered pouting his lips, but if you like to talk so much, Naruto started, appearing unaware that Zabuza had stalked behind him, tell me about that guy downstairs, do you really only see him as a tool? The blonde's question didn't halt the seasoned ninja nor take him off guard, only a sentimental fool would be knocked off balance by words, what did manage to surprise the demon of the mist, was the blonde's duck under the swipe he had aimed to cut him in two with. Naruto had merely bent his knees to avoid the large blade and looked at the large man in his periphery, a hard glare in his eyes. The split second of surprise was gone when Zabuza adjusted his grip, bringing the sword down where the blonde was. Naruto countered by rolling out of the way and bringing his fist around, turning to face the former Kiri Nin. Kei's Ken, Wind Fist. The attack flew at Zabuza, the man quickly used the flat of his sword to block the fist-shaped wind blast, pushing him back towards the panic room door, hefting it over his shoulder the man stood to his full height, the corners of his bandages rising in a smirk, before addressing the blonde pirate. You mean Haku? What else would that kid be? He said you saved him and gave him purpose, all because of some ice blood, or whatever. Hmm, you don't seem to realize how hard it is to come across a bloodline where I come from, especially one that powerful, Zabuza pointed his sword at Naruto. Just look at what it did to you, Brad. You may be tough, but even you couldn't come out of that battle unscathed, and seeing as Haku couldn't finish the job, it's up to me to kill you. Zabuza ran to the blonde and used his great strength to swing the great blade swiftly to decapitate Naruto, in response. The blonde brought his arms up and miraculously blocked the blade, sparks coming from the point of contact. Naruto had called the wind to his forearms, but unlike his previous moves, 
he had made the gusts thinner and faster, creating sharp wind blades, if he made the wrong move against Zabuza, he could end up dead. But that thought was the furthest thing in his mind right now. So he's a tool, and that's all? He was down there fighting for you? Haku knew what he was getting into when I saved him, I never lied, I told him that he could come with me if he would be ready to give his life for me, to give any semblance of living up, to become the perfect weapon. Zabuza drew his sword back, causing Naruto to fall forward and leaving the blonde open, wearing your heart on your sleeve is a weakness, brat. Naruto was slammed into the ground, held down with Zabuza's free hand while bringing Kabikiraboko's hole down around the blonde's neck effectively pinning him. No matter how you look at it, a ninja is a tool of death, of destruction, attachments dull the weapon known as ninja, you must realize this, look at yourself, Zabuza sat atop the blonde, you came here on your own, no help, and you've accomplished something that lesser ninja could not, the only problem is that you let them all live. I am no ninja, I don't care about what makes anyone the best ninja or tool or whatever. Naruto, despite his disadvantage, glared right into the eyes of the demon, I came here because I wanted to, I don't have anyone to walk with yet, either, but I know they wouldn't be a weakness, Naruto grabbed Zabuza's forearm, they'd be my strength, so, seeing someone that would go out of his way to disregard the bond I know he has, makes me feel sick, Naruto growled, and began to lift the arm, removing the blade from his neck, and if you aren't a ninja, then what are you, Zabuza remained calm if a little uncomfortable from the blonde's grip, once the blonde had forced himself up, he released the mon's arm, calmly looking into his eyes, a pirate, Zabuza chuckled at that, hopping back to the panic room door and rapidly going through hand signs, stopping on the final sign. Hey, pirate, huh? Well, pirate, I hope you realize what happens when two men meet on the battlefield with opposing ideologies. Zabuza looked to the calm blonde with bloodshot eyes, one of them has to die. That's the ninja way of doing things, always have to have the last word. It'll let you know something, brat, just because devil fruits aren't regular in these parts doesn't mean the weaknesses aren't known. Sweden. Swiryuda no jutsu, water release. Water dragon bullet technique. Zabuza gathered moisture from the air, formed it into the shape of a dragon, and launched toward the starstruck blonde. Whoa, that's awesome, Ak, wait a minute water's bad. Naruto snapped himself out of his odd state and moved away from the liquid reptile, only for it to follow him. You really think, I wouldn't be ready for that? Naruto turned to the dragon, thrust his hand toward it, before taking his arm and rotating it in a circle while calling on his powers, quickly. A swirling tunnel of wind came from his arm and shot out toward the incoming attack. Uzu, Vortex. The attacks collided, knocking the blonde into the floor from the resulting explosion of water and wind pressure, he landed on his feet just to be taken by surprise by another torrent of water that slammed into his back. Sweden. Sweden no jutsu, water release, water bullet technique. The orb of water slammed the blonde into the wall, splashing all over the ground with him following, Naruto hacked and spit water while trying to get his bearings back. Hard to believe Haku lost to you, but he managed to be a good tool in the end, seems it was worth saving him. Naruto growled and shot back up, wind encircling his crossed arms. I've got news for you, my powers still work when I am wet. Naruto uncrossed his arms, unleashing wind shards at Zabuza, Furyu no Yuroko, wind dragon scales. The small projectiles zipped through the air with a slight whistle from their speed. Think I don't know that? Zabuza blocked the scales with amazing precision. I know you've got to be submerged, Zabuza looked Naruto in the eye. Naruto had used his attack to distract the swordsman and appeared in front of him instantly, staring right back into the killer's orbs. Naruto's fist barreled straight into the face of the man, and proceeded through it. A water clone, that's why I doused the room, Zabuza appeared next to the pirate and thrust his hand at him. The droplets of water that were scattered around the room were drawn towards the two, specifically Naruto. The water formed a sphere trapping Naruto who barely had enough to take a breath before the prison enveloped him. Swiro no Jutsu, Water Prison Technique, Naruto froze within the water sphere, unable to move his body and forced to wait as he slowly drowned. Looks to me that ninja have proved superior to pirates, after all that fighting, you're going to die here because you chose to fight for the citizens of Wave, in the end, you didn't save anyone. Zabuza looked to the helpless blonde, you're going to drown. And Gato's going to grind his heel into your worthless corpse before he parades it around the village for those sheep to see and lose any hope they had left. Hell probably kill those prisoners as salt in the wound too. No need for the people to have any delusion of getting them back. Zabuza taunted Naruto further, watching the blonde lose consciousness. And, I don't think I could leave Haku alive either. A broken tool needs to be discarded, and I am sure he would agree with me. Naruto's dimming eyes hardened when he heard that. The blonde forced himself to glare in the swordsman's direction and settled on a gamble that he hoped would work. Using the last breath that had taken, 
Naruto used his powers to amplify its force which caused the sphere to expand, Zabuza's eyebrows raised, witnessing the blonde risk his life on the off chance that this scheme would free him, clearly, he was struggling to continue expelling air, but didn't stop. Eventually, the sphere grew to be larger than the both of them and Zabuza found it difficult to distribute enough chakra for it to keep its shape, this led to the bubble bursting, the wind pushing Zabuza's back to the sealed door and Naruto landing shakily on his legs. I am sick of hearing you lie to me. Naruto's clothes and hair dripped with water that ran down his body, the blonde pirate brought his lowered head up to look at Zabuza through the curtain of his hair, if you really thought of Haku, of all ninja as tools, then wouldn't you have just let him die? The question silenced the swordsman, even if Haku has some weird, valuable bloodline ability, for a hardened ninja like you to take him in, no matter how I look at it, it seems more like a weakness, you would have to train him to survive, take care of him, and that db time wasted while on the run. Naruto brought his head all the way up at this point, just how many times have you had to run because Haku couldn't handle something? How many times has he screwed up and almost gotten the two of you killed before you reached this point? You the fact is, Haku is still here and alive, because of you, and I can't stand that you'd put on this act for someone you've only met today. I'd rather the entire world know that I care for those precious to me than spend one second acting like they errant. Naruto huffed and then smirked, the way I see it, by your own definition of a ninja, you're a failure. Zabuza chuckled to himself, looks like the kid had him pegged from the very start of this little fight, but that doesn't mean that he didn't have a job to do right now, he and Haku need that money, it's the only reason they took the job, and whether he was beginning to like this runt or not didn't change that fact. A failure, huh? Well, failure or not, I have a job to do, Zabuza quickly went through more hand signs, landing on the bird sign, let's see how you deal with this entire room being underwater, Sweden. Daibakufu no jutsu, water release, great waterfall technique. A great vortex of water materialized in front of Zabuza, rushing forward with such amazing force that it was ripping up the tiles from the floor and fully intent on drowning the young pirate. Naruto stood unflinching while staring at the volume of water bearing down on him. All with a calm look on his face, with eyes shadowed, Naruto widened his stance and spread his arms out, setting his hand into claws, he called the wind up his arms, the left arm's current going clockwise and the right's running counter, bringing them in front of his body in the shape of a mouth, put simply imagine he's firing a Kamehameha. The opposing currents collided with each other, creating ripping, powerful sharp gusts for anyone unfortunate to be caught in it. And it's my job to kick your ass. The wind around Naruto's hand took the shape of a dragon's head, Fu Ryu, wind dragon, the dragon-shaped current shot at the water and tore through it easily, splashing the water all around. The dragon's maw opened wide, engulfing the shocked Zabuza and tearing into him as he made his way through the current that made up the dragon's body. The attack ended with the now unconscious ninja crashing through the panic room door, frightening the hold-up rat known as Gato. Zabuza's cut up, bleeding unconscious body stood for a few seconds before falling forward. The demon of the mist had lost, Zabuza? You lost to that runt? Thunk the blonde stepped into the panic room, letting out a sigh of relief as he rolled his shoulders and cracked his neck. Tough bastard, oh, you're Gato, right? Naruto took notice of the man huddled in the corner of the room sweating bullets. Naruto stalked up to the tiny man and grabbed him by his suit's collar. You've given me a lot of trouble this morning, shorty. Naruto bonked the coward on the head. No, please, what did those villagers give you to do this? He'll match it, double it, if you work for me, Gato pleaded. I don't work for anybody, and I don't break my word, I said that I'd kick your ass, and that's what I plan on doing, Naruto smirked. Suddenly, the building shook, shocking the blonde who started looking around the small room trying to figure out what the problem was. What the hell is going on? Hey, I knew Zabuza and that idiot that broke my arm wouldn't be able to cut it, and I don't plan on having some Brad take me in. Gato laughed, running out of the panic room. Wah! How did Naruto look to his hand and only saw the mon's jacket, he slipped out of his suit, the little weasel. Naruto dashed out of the room, chasing the man. Don't you think you should give up on chasing me and save yourself? This whole mansion is going to go up. Gato taunted as he ran. No way. Not until I knock you out. You're just going to leave all those guys outside? Zabuza and Haku, too? They worked for you, Naruto screamed. Thugs are a dime a dozen. And the way I see it, when those two die, I save money. Gato cackled, reaching the stairs with a window behind him. The worst position, after what had just said, throwing them away because they failed. You're no leader. You're just slime that runs through people's fingers when they grab you. But you aren't slinking away this time. K's Ken, Wind Fist. Naruto's attack soared into the mon's face, knocking Gato off his feet and through the window with its incredible force, an object jingling out of his pocket and falling onto the stairs. 
in the village main road, next to Tsunami's restaurant. Tsunami couldn't slow her heart all day, she had no way of knowing how Naruto's one-man battle against that tyrant was going, and even though she witnessed his strength, nothing could be certain. I hope Naruto-san is alright, tch, serves him right if he dies, I told him that Gato has too much strength to challenge, he's just like the rest, Inari frowned to himself. A boom was then heard outside that shook the ground and startled all the citizens, soon, everyone was out in the square gasping once they saw just who had caused the tremor, Tsunami and Inari had to push their way through the crowd to see the spectacle and when they did, their eyes widened. Laying in a small crater was Gato, foaming out of his mouth, glasses broken, and a fist mark visible on his swollen cheek. It's Gato. Who could do this? Did Konoha finally send Ninja to deal with him? All these questions and more were running through the crowd, but two people knew who had done this, and where he was now, Inari looked in the direction that Gato's mansion was and ran straight there, his mother following behind him. No way. He couldn't have. Inari mumbled, wait, Inari, Tsunami called. The crowd saw the two of them and decided to follow the mother and son as well, Gato well and truly unconscious, he wouldn't be waking up anytime soon. Back at the mansion, hey, that felt great, Naruto smirked but was shaken from his thoughts when the building shook harder and the walls began to crumble, uh oh, better get everyone out of here. Naruto grabbed the keys from the steps and made to go down the stairs, but stopped and looked back to Gato's room. In a split second, Naruto made a new plan of action. First, he went back up the stair and made a hole through the floor directly above the hole had made while fighting Haku, with that, Naruto created a gust of wind to carry the keys down into the basement prison. Hey, old man Tazuna! Naruto shouted down, hum, old man! Hey, Brad I am not old, and what do you want? Take the keys and free everyone down there, the keys? You managed to steal them? Tazuna asked, grabbing them. Nah, they fell out of Gato's pocket when I knocked him out the window. Out the window? A random villager asked, to do that, so, you defeated the demon of the mist? Another asked. You mean Zabuza? Yeah, he was tough, now get out of here, the building's going to blow. Naruto shouted down. The prisoners all dropped their jaws when they heard that, causing Tazuna to drop the keys in shock. You should have led with that, brat, we've gotta get out of here. Tazuna started opening cells at breakneck speed and ushering everyone out. Old man. Pick up Haku before you go. Naruto told the man as he mad to leave. You can't be serious, he isn't a bad person, he fought me, but he made sure to avoid killing me. I don't think that's enough of a reason, but if you say so, you've done right by us. Tazuna slung Haku's arm over his shoulder and made his way to ground level. Naruto turned back to Gato's room and into the panic room to save the last person, the blonde pirate went to the downed missing Ninnamon's arm over his shoulder, before making his way out of the building with him. Zabuza grumbled opening his eyes only to see the brat carrying him through the mansion, taking note of the rumbling and cracked walls, it didn't take a genius to figure out what was occurring. You should nt, be saving me, kid, I tried to, kill you, Zabuza said lowly. Yeah, I know, but I am not trying to kill you, that's ninja rules, plus, Haku would be upset if you died, Naruto smiled widely. Hey, so naive, just like Haku, the mansion started to shake more powerfully at this point, making Naruto pick up the pace as he quickly ran down the stairs and to the entrance, the explosions began and were hot on the heels of the two, but never touched them as Naruto dove out the door, the two landed on the lawn, Zabuza face down and Naruto face up, the mansion burning to ashes, surrounding the two were the knocked out thugs, the prisoners and the arriving villagers. Naruto tilted his head back in the grass and locked eyes with a certain boy. Inari had his eyes wide open in shock and disbelief, watching the symbol of Gato's power burning right before his eyes the bodies of his men all over the ground, his neighbors freed, and Inari, his grandfather, who just placed someone he didn't recognize onto the ground, the man approached his grandson, unable to believe his eyes as his daughter met him as well, the family was reunited, and tears were streaming uncontrollably from their eyes, and snot down Inari's nose. All in all, the boy looked terrible as he bawled his eyes out at the impossible become possible before his very eyes. And when he caught a glimpse of the kid's face, Naruto laughed heartily being heard by all the assembled villagers, they all gathered around the injured blonde, a lot of them wondering who he was with the prisoners explaining. Naruto-san. Are you alright? Tsunami ran to him and saw the cuts littering his body. Yeah, I got the face I wanted, look how ridiculous he is. Naruto teared up he was laughing so hard. Seeing the blonde laugh made Tsunami smile, turning to her happily crying son she wiped her own tears and looked to the blonde. Yes, he does, now, I should patch you up, nah, help Zabuza and Haku first, they aren't bad for ninja. 
Whoa, kid it's one thing to save them, but heal them? Tazuna scratched his head. It was just a job to them, I can't blame them for that, that's the price of being a ninja, you've always gotta follow someone, Naruto looked up to the sky. If Naruto-san is sure, then he'll do it, Tsunami acquiesced. A few hours later, are you sure about leaving like this? Tazuna asked at the port with his family and the same old man that had denied Naruto a ship originally, what if those two wake up and take revenge on us? I told you that they aren't like that, to tell the truth, they're probably the nicest ninja I've met, so, unless they get paid for it, they won't have a reason to come after you guys, plus at this point, I can say with certainty that they are a bunch of softies in a hard shell, Naruto laughed, bandages the cuts that littered his body, but the would-be pirate was in high spirits with a full stomach after a pick-me-up feast. The demon of the mist, the old man's sweat dropped at the teen essentially telling them a hardened killer, was nice. Thanks for the ship, old man, Naruto turned to the man. It's the least I could do for everything you did, but are you sure this is all? Yep, everything LL fall into place after that, Naruto said optimistically. You you should stay, what if something else happens? Inari spoke up, blushing in embarrassment, what'll we do if it's even worse than Gato? Nah, I already stayed here longer than I wanted, besides, I am sure that you guys will figure everything out, this port is supposed to be a moneymaker, after all, Naruto stuck his tongue out with a grin. But Wave needs a hero, and that's you, Inari started to cry. Crying again. Naruto laughed, watching Inari furiously wipe his eyes, I told ya, I am no hero. I beat up Gato cuz I wanted to and saving you guys happened because it was in the process. Naruto stared out to the ocean, if you want a hero, instead of waiting for one, you should become your own hero, there never seems to be enough, right? You mean get strong, like you? You'll never be as strong as me, but you'll get close, I am going out into the world, everything will be harder out there. That's one question you haven't answered yet, Naruto-san. Tsunami said her curiosity rising, you've been pretty adamant in leaving the island since day one, why is that? Naruto rose a brow in confusion, oh, I never told you, Naruto smiled with his arms crossed, I am gonna be a pirate. His declaration had the assembled people confused. This good-hearted blonde, wanted to become a criminal? Naruto laughed at their faces, shocked huh? I've been training for ten years to get ready. But, if you do that, everyone will think that you're a bad guy, they'll hate you. Inari shouted. Well, who cares about that? I don't know everyone in the world, but I know you guys, do you think I am a bad guy? Naruto's simple answer struck their hearts, long as you guys don't hate me, the world can think whatever they want, and I won't be on my own, the rare guys out there that I'll be able to depend on, I just have to go out there and find them, and when I do, we'll be able to take on whatever the world throws at us, they'll be my crew. Naruto then rapped against his head with his knuckles, I forgot something. Hum, what is it? Tazuna asked, Naruto places a finger to his lips in a shushing motion as he explained, I need you guys to keep it under wraps that I was here, don't mention my name or what I look like to anyone, at least not until I start getting famous. But everyone should know what you did, Inari protested. Well, this is another favor I want, then, why? Even if someone knows about you, wouldn't they be proud that you saved a village? Tazuna asked. Naruto turned back to the ocean and gave a hollow chuckle, proud, huh? Nah. They'd do anything to find and kill me probably, but don't worry about it, it doesn't concern you. The two looked like they wanted to ask more questions, but Tsunami stopped them, having had the chance to talk extensively with the blonde pirate, she had an idea of what, or rather who he wanted to stay hidden from. We won't say anything, Naruto-san, Tsunami smiled to him. Thanks, Tsunami, Naruto smiled, we are, plays, well, time to set sail. My adventure starts now. Naruto opened the sail on his dinghy and set out onto the ocean. Turning around he waved with both hands to the family on the port. Don't die out there, brat. Take care, Naruto-san. When you come back, it'll definitely be stronger than you. I look forward to it. Guess I have to keep myself sharp, Naruto called back, disappearing over the horizon. He managed to catch a glimpse of two figures that made their way to the port behind the family. Zabuza and Haku, the blonde grinned harder and waved more enthusiastically, unable to say anything that they'd hear. Music fades out. HMPH. That brat sets out without seeing me first? I have a couple of things to say, Zabuza growled. Tazuna, Inari, and the old man all flinched, like what exactly? The way Naruto-san speaks of you, you're nothing but a marshmallow afraid to show how soft he actually is, Tsunami smiled. Wanna say that again, Zabuza made to grab his sword. Zabuza-sama, I think retaliating will only prove her point, Haku stopped the man. Naruto-san said that you were more in touch with your softer side and well-mannered as well. Tsunami spoke to Haku who bowed. 
Thank you very much, she's talking to the demon of the mist like it's nothing, what do I miss? Tazuna was amazed at his daughter's bravery. If you're Naruto's friends, then I guess you can't be all bad, Inari walked up, attempting to be brave. Friends, Zabuza growled, hum, yes, friends, Haku laughed. Hard to believe that kid wants to go out and be a pirate of all things, he's way too good for that, Tazuna came to stand with everyone, nervous. He better toughen up, it won't be easy out there, probably will end up dead, Zabuza sat down to relax his injured body. Naruto won't die, Inari retorted, I think you should take that as the marshmallow being concerned, Tsunami giggled at the mon's indignant face. Tsunami, did you grow a pair of balls while I was gone? Tazuna asked, off to the side. Before the antic could continue, a villager ran up to them all, freezing at the sight of Zabuza, but shook his head and continued with his task. Tazuna, hum, what is it? They're here, they came from the bridge, the man panted. Huh, who's here? Tazuna asked, Ninja, from Konoha. All present widened their eyes at that. What reason did they have to show up here now? They didn't get their money, so why come now? Appearing in front of them with ninja speed, was a team made up of Kakashi Hitaki, Menma Namikaze, Natsumi Namikaze, Sasuke Uchiha, and Sakura Haruno. Hello there, we're the ninja from Konoha, we were told that a man named Tazuna is in charge, Kakashi waved with an eye smile. The happy mood soured at their presence, I am Tazuna, now what do you want exactly? We don't have the money to pay you, Tazuna narrowed his eyes. The fourth Hokage took it upon himself to waive the fee, that is, in exchange for a cut of the profits that your port makes when it gets back up and running, Natsumi smiled. How, generous of him, Tsunami strained a smile, yes, he is very nice, your plight had touched him, but he didn't have the resources at the time, but now here we are, Kakashi lied through his teeth. Well, as happy as that makes me, I hate to tell you that Gato has been taken care of, so, we won't be needing your services, Tazuna shot them down, taking pleasure in seeing their faces. Excuse me? Yep, in custody right now, already contacted a larger prison to extract him when they get the time, Tazuna jabbed a thumb in the general direction of the prison. HN, that's ridiculous, just who was it that came to this backwater village and saved you all? Sasuke narrowed his eyes. A real hero, brat, and what did he ask for in exchange if I may ask? Kakashi mined for information. Hey, all he wanted was for a food bill had incurred to be annulled, Tazuna answered, keeping the ship a secret, he took care of everything only a few hours ago and went on his merry way. A food bill? What a slob, how much did he eat that he needed to do taking a rank mission to pay for it? Sakura asked, furrowing her brow in disgust as she imagined the man. Watch your mouth, he at least did it, unlike you guys, what good are you? Inari stuck his tongue out. Who do you think you are talking to? Menma, hands in his pockets, took a threatening step forward. Did you manage to catch what village he hailed from? Natsumi stopped her brother. Wasn't a ninja, Tazuna kept the answer short, it's unfortunate that he left, then, we could use a man that could destroy an entire organization in a single morning. He wouldn't work with you in a million years, Inari grit his teeth at her. Natsumi laced her hand in her knees and leaned forward, her eyes closed, we can be very persuasive, boy. Inari hid behind his mother's leg at the aura he felt. Well, with Gato taken care of, you'll need different protection for your port, correct? Kakashi didn't miss a beat, Konoha would be happy to offer our ninja up, well just keep the same conditions for the A rank we missed. That won't be necessary, Tsunami spoke up, and just why is that? We've actually gotten two ninja to become security around here, Tazuna motioned to Zabuza and Haku, a slight pleading look in his eyes. Yeah, that's us, Gato's gone. So I've got no problem working for whoever pays, Zabuza answered. You're the demon of the mist, a missing nin, perhaps we could offer you amnesty, Natsumi looked to them. No dice, I don't plan on working for any hidden village again, I am fine with this small job, Zabuza noticed the look of the Namikaze twins. We aren't going home empty-handed, Menma sneered, perhaps if you Hokage had answered sooner, you wouldn't find yourselves in this predicament, Tsunami said, she gasped when Menma went to slap her for talking back only for Zabuza to block it from where he was sitting. Attacking a defenseless woman for speaking the truth? Shameful for a great Konoha ninja isn't it? Zabuza glared. You Menma. Kakashi stopped the boy, I apologize for my student's temper. I want you gone. That's my daughter you just threatened, Tazuna yelled. And I am sorry, perhaps we can, get out of here, we don't need you. You had your chance. The villagers had all converged at the port when the news had spread, and began jeering at the Konoha ninja. If you want any chance of doing business with us, you'll leave and go through proper channels, Tazuna said. 
Or maybe, ill just Menma started, Menma Kun, maybe we should get out of here, Sakura sweat at the enraged people. Sakura is right, sorry to have bothered you, Kakashi bowed, keeping his embarrassment in check, it wouldn't do to run afoul of the people here, they were a burgeoning enterprise, they had time to put them under thumb. TCH, don't get comfortable, Menma glared behind him as Team 7 left. That was frightening, those were supposed to be the Konoha ninja, Tsunami fanned herself to calm down. I don't see a difference from Gato, Tazuna rose his brow. Zabuza kept quiet, maybe they realized and didn't want to humor the idea, or maybe they didn't notice at all. Those two redheads, were related to Naruto, are they the reason why he wanted to get out of here so fast? Thank you, Marshmallow, seems we can rely on you, Tsunami smiled. Long as you pay me, Zabuza grumbled, Tsunami looked to her father, he had a hand on his chin and was in deep thought. What's the matter, father, it's just, is that all? What a ya mean grandpa? Inari asked. A bill waved, a dingy ship, is that all well give that kid for helping us? The brat didn't want anything else, right? Who cares? I care. This is a new chapter for Wave. Gato's gone. Business will boom when there are more reasonable prices. Wave can be a thriving village if we manage it right. Naruto gave us a lot more than freedom. He gave us a new beginning. Tazuna swept his hand across the assembled villagers. Don't you all think he deserves more? His question was met with cheers, I say we rename this port, from now on, it will be the great Naruto port. No, you can't use Naruto-san's name, father, ah, uh, right, then, Tazuna decided to translate it then, Maelstrom port. I think that kind of still counts, but I do like it. I hope you are ready to have your work cut out for you, Zabuza, there's no way Konoha will take this lying down, not to mention other ninja and pirates, Tazuna said. Let M come, Zabuza said confidently. I shall be ready as well, Zabuza sama, Haku affirmed. I want to help too, Zabuza, train me to use a sword or something, Inari said. No, try something else, maybe you could use that bow that Kaiza taught you to fish with? Tsunami offered, while trying to come up with something that would technically keep Inari far from the action. Yeah, all you have to do is keep this place safe for as long as possible, Tazuna held a devil smirk on his face, if Naruto goes out there and gets famous we can have a crazy amount of tourism and notoriety for being his starting point. Was naming the port a marketing ploy? Tsunami's eyes shined in ager. Not completely, Tsunami. Wait what are you doing? Stop. With Team 7. How dare they? They should be happy we find them valuable enough to rescue. Menma felled a tree in his anger. Hokage-sama will be upset, Sakura mumbled, worried about his reaction. We should have forced them into submission, Sasuke sighed. Happy workers are better than miserable workers, Sasuke, not to worry, we just need to make sure they never realize how important they could become, Kakashi placated. Aren't you all curious about their mysterious stranger? Natsumi asked. Yes, but without any evidence, we can't do much about him. Well, that's just it, no evidence, not even a description, I find it suspicious that they'd keep it under wraps like that. They were unhappy with us, Menma pointed out, Kakashi sensei, we receive world news, correct? Natsumi asked. No, we have no real need for it, only the biggest happening reach our ears, or any newspaper we get from a pirate ship, why? I'd like to have news coups delivered to Konoha, why, becoming interested in the larger world? No, just a hunch that has a slim chance of being true, nothing to concern yourself with. The team continued home, unaware of the person that they had just missed, the person that had made the first mission of the Namikaze siblings, the children of the Yellow Flash, a complete failure. On the ocean, we are, starts back up. Naruto stood on his boat, the wind blowing through his hair and eyes closed, breathing in deeply. Ah, the salty sea air, just like I imagined it, the sky and sea on the open ocean are way bluer than I could have imagined, too. Naruto smiled, looking ahead, all right, time to go out and find my crew, then to the Grand Line. Just you wait, Gramps, it'll become a great pirate. When you can be proud of, Naruto shouted to the heavens. Across the ocean in different areas, certain individuals went about their regular days not knowing of the violent wind that would blow through or sweep them up. On a certain island, on an island in the South Blue, completely cordoned off by a gate surrounding the island an empty city is found. A city made up of a small residential area with rural houses, and large structures that shot into the sky. Wind blew through the empty streets, wafting papers and bags through them, these were the only inhabitants that could be seen out and about. Suddenly, a large shadow ran across the roofs of the great buildings seemingly running from something, behind the shadow, a human-sized shadow followed behind it. The large shadow was a beast that was capable of easily outrunning the average human and overpower them, 
Looking behind itself, it noticed that its pursuer had disappeared. Dropping to the ground the beast trudged through the empty city, aimless, for it had nothing to feed on and escape was impossible for it because of the giant gate around the island. All T could do was run and survive, its grotesque kind on this island was almost extinct, because of the figure that had been chasing them, the only truly living thing left. And it appeared above the beast. Hey! The beast looked up in shock, revealing a white bone-like mask covering its head, before it was slashed through by a sword. A large sword resembling a kyber knife cut through the mask like butter, the wielder landing on the ground and the corpse of the beast dissolving. The wielder raised his head, revealing a shock of orange hair, watching the monster disappear, he took a book of names and crossed out another as he quickly flipped through pages and pages of X's showing that had killed most of the beasts. Closing it without a word, the teen wrapped his sword in bandages and headed home. Within the once bustling town, the lone living citizen awoke from his slumber, rubbing his eyes, the orange-haired teen pulled himself out of bed and made his way downstairs while grabbing his blade on the way and passing two empty rooms. His home was small, the common areas being downstairs and the residence rooms being upstairs, a small clinic could also be found downstairs that was fully equipped for minor injuries but no major surgeries, or it would be, but it seemed that the teen had used a lot of the supplies, the kitchen was in a similar state with most of the perishable foods being eaten, leaving canned foods for the teen's breakfast. He opened a can of cold beans, not bothering to heat the contents as he had other things to worry about that day and hastily downed the slop while shuddering, after having his delicious breakfast, the teen went outside to his backyard with a solemn frown set on his face, looking out to the vast expanse had created so long ago, the home's backyard had been opened up by the teen, remnants of the fence that the neighborhood used to separate the homes could be seen. The reason for the renovation? A vast number of graves that were shoddily made with most having headstones made from the bark of trees and names carved into them along with mounds of dirt heaped in front of each one, a mass gravesite, all created by the orange head, but for what purpose? He walked to the first row of graves and knelt in front of a specific three that did not yet have mounds, these three graves still had holes in front of them yet to be filled with anything and further back, almost out of eyesight, was another empty grave. The teen closed his eyes, his sword stabbed into the ground, standing next to him while he was in his thoughts, thinking back on the long road that led him here, and how close he was to being finished. Just a few more, and it'll be done, and I can avenge you all, the teen opened his eyes, got up, and pulled his sword from the ground, placing the great blade on his back using a red cord while its bandages wrapped around it as a sheath. He smirked and looked up to the sky, a cloud that had been obscuring the sun moved to cause its bright rays to shine onto the island, psyching himself up, the teen went back into his home and grabbed his book of names, putting it into the robes he wore and exited his home. Time to go hunting. The teen took to the rooftops, heading towards the city. Resident of Karakura town Ichigo Kurosaki, out at sea. Naruto had his feet kicked up on his dinghy, relaxing since his departure from the elemental nations, the blonde pirate yawned kicking his feet in boredom while watching seagulls overhead. Man, two days of nothing, I thought that being a pirate was supposed to be constant adventure, I haven't even seen an island yet. Naruto stood up and shouted to the heavens. The seagulls looked down to see the commotion but ultimately ignored the odd human. Um, what I wouldn't give for an island or at least someone to talk to, I gotta find crewmates to share adventures with, after all, it's no fun if I am by myself, Naruto sighed, plopping back down onto the ship and rocking it slightly. As if fate was answering his prayers, the small boat knocked into something which the grumbling blonde failed to notice in his anguish, cracking his eye open, Naruto was met with a big gate that, from what he could see, was surrounding an island. An island? He broke out into a grin at the great find, completely ignoring the fact that the gate had the symbols of the marines and the world government as a clear sign that the two powers considered the island dangerous. Finally, an island, Naruto looked up, seeing the top of the gate, but what's with the gate? How's anyone supposed to get in, unless, this place is so dangerous they have to keep everyone out? Naruto oddly deduced, he, that means adventure, and if this place is dangerous, then there might be strong people that could join my crew. Naruto pumped his fists at his amazing detective work before he started to stretch his legs and giving small hops on the boat. Then it's settled. Time to find myself a crewmate. Using his powers, Naruto boosted himself to the top of the gate and perched himself on one of the posts, placing a hand above his eyes. Naruto made an O with his mouth in amazement while sweeping his view across the horizon. Naruto took in the view of Karakura Town, not that he knew its name, his eyes shone in amazement as he took in the sight of the first new place had visited since leaving his island. Whoa, this place looks great, I bet a lot of people live here, it's the biggest village I've ever seen. Naruto laughed before he jumped from his perch onto the island with an audible boom. Hey, anyone here want to come be a pirate with me? 
Naruto yelled only to be met with silence, it's more fun than you think. I promise, more silence. Naruto scratched his head in confusion at the lack of reaction to his loud announcement, tilting his head when there wasn't so much as a peep from any living thing. Where is everyone? Naruto wondered aloud, walking into the town. While walking in the middle of the street, Naruto took notice of the different shops, all of them empty, the businesses were devoid of anyone and looked to have been emptied in a hurry as, in some, the goods were scattered onto the ground and some had their buildings wrecked as if an explosive had gone off inside, when the blonde went to check food shops most of the food had either been spoiled or ransacked for non-perishables. No one's around, maybe I scared them off when I jumped in? Naruto cupped his chin, looks like I picked a boring island to stop at. Above the blonde, the orange-haired teen leapt from one of the roofs, intending on attacking the perceived threat to his island, bringing his blade overhead, he planned to cut the intruder in two down the middle so it came as a shock to him when said intruder stopped his sword by catching its tip between his hands. Is that any way to treat a guest? Naruto grit his teeth, slightly struggling to hold the sword away from his forehead. There aren't any guests here, especially some weird suspicious guy like you. The island's been declared off limits, Ichigo, also gritting his teeth, struggled against the blonde. Hum, oh, the gate, I jumped it, Naruto answered simply. Then you'll have no problem jumping back over but I just got here, Naruto whined, you don't get to tell me what to do, he added insult to injury by sticking his tongue out. TCH, how old are you, Ichigo yelled back, also showing his immaturity. Unable to overpower each other the two got ready to disengage, too bad for Ichigo, Naruto got the idea first, the blonde shoved the sword to the side, taking its wielder with it as he fell forward, Naruto took this opening, whirled around, and delivered a back kick aiming for Ichigo's stomach only for the orange swordsman to deftly right himself and bring the flat of his blade in front of him and block the kick. Narrowing his eyes, Naruto pushed off the blade to make distance between them, gathering wind around him, Naruto used his signature attack on the attacker hoping to catch him off guard with his abilities, the wind fist traveled quickly to his opponent. Ichigo skidded to a stop and saw the intruder punch the air in front of him, making the swordsman raise a brow in confusion before noticing the barest hint of the concussive wind force shooting toward him, realizing what was heading his way, Ichigo took his sword and batted the attack to the side, flinging it into a building and causing an explosion of debris which obscured Ichigo from Naruto's view. The blonde waited, his intense gaze focused on the dust cloud, soon the unknown swordsman burst from the dust with his sword at his side readying for a slash to the blonde's midsection, once had made it to the blonde, Ichigo swung the mighty blade but did not feel the distinct resistance of human flesh, looking down Ichigo saw the pirate had bent backward to avoid the slash. With no hesitation, Ichigo maneuvered his sword with its point directed at Naruto's chest and stabbed down, from his position, Naruto flipped backward and used his heel to kick the blade away, and while staying in a handstand brought his other heel around to kick Ichigo in the ribs. The orange swordsman ground his teeth in pain, but not from a kick to the ribs, rather a kick to his bicep as had raised it to block the blonde's attack. With that block, Ichigo had also used the opening to wrap the bandages of his blade around Naruto's leg ensnaring him before using his strength to pull the blonde from the ground. Naruto was surprised when he was yanked into the air and swung around by the swordsman, the force put into the swing making it difficult for the blonde to attempt to counter, before long, Ichigo swung the pirate into a building and retracted the bandage, rushing into the cloud that was kicked up to press the attack. As Naruto pulled himself up, rubbing his head in pain, he saw his opponent through the dust ready to bring his sword down on the dazed blonde, reacting quickly, Naruto brought a hand up with wind swirling and managed to block the sword, for the most part as the blade did manage to leave a small cut on him despite the defense. Ichigo, while shocked, paid the unexpected move little mind as he withdrew the blade from an overhead slash and decided to bring its back end into the blonde's ribs, Naruto, instead of focusing on the impending attack, chose to use the wind on his defending hand to punch the swordsman. Tempestotopanchi, Tempest Punch, both attacks struck their intended targets, marking the first major hits scored on their opponent, Naruto had blood fly from his mouth, the giant knife's blunt side bashed into his midsection, cracking some ribs, Ichigo grunted in pain, blood also flying from his mouth and was then blasted from the building when the compressed wind around the blonde's fist exploded outward, forcing Ichigo to fly into an adjacent building across the street. Naruto got up, holding his side and ready to continue fighting, but the building that they'd fought in took too much punishment from them causing it to collapse on top of the blonde who had yelped in surprise. Across the street Ichigo had tossed the debris off his person, equally ready to continue fighting with the intruder but did not see him anywhere, seeing the destroyed building that the blonde was in, Ichigo sighed and wrapped his sword up. Who was that guy? He was tough, tougher than any hollow I've fought here, Ichigo wiped his mouth, smearing the blood, whoever he was, it doesn't matter, I don't have time to be screwing around with a stranger, anyway. 
Ichigo caught his breath for a few seconds and perked up instantly when an inhuman shriek was heard from far off, with that, Ichigo kicked himself into high gear and left the scene of his short-lived battle with a pirate, a serious expression on his face as he sped through the city, leaping back to the rooftops as he made to find the source of the mysterious roar. Almost done, just this one, and, them, Ichigo thought, ready to hunt down the beast. Back at the battle site, Naruto finally burst out from underneath the rubble with his fists up in a fighting stance to continue the battle. All right, come at me. Naruto looked to his left and right, he left. We weren't done fighting yet, Naruto grumbled, crossing his arms in a fit and sitting on the ground tilting his head, what was his problem anyway? I may be a pirate, but I haven't done anything, if someone's going to attack me, I at least want a reason for it. Naruto winced in pain and held his side, but he was strong. He kept up with me like it was nothing. He was even faster than Zabuza was back in wave even with their swords being so similar. Naruto thought back to their fight and the fact that the orange-haired swordsman was strong enough to block his attack with minimum effort and the two of them had to struggle to overpower the other, not only that, but the guy had managed to catch Naruto off guard during their skirmish when had managed to cut his hand through his wind. With that Naruto grinned and put a hand on his knee, pumping his other fist in determination, a guy like that has to be on my crew. We may have gotten off on the wrong foot, but once he sees that I am not a bad guy, hell be dying to join up, Naruto reasoned. Wind blew in the empty street, now, where'd he go? The pirate didn't have to wonder for long, because he heard crashes off in the distance, with that, Naruto sped through the streets on a mission to recruit the swordsman that had had the honor of fighting against. With Ichigo, the orange-haired swordsman was hopping from rooftop to rooftop chasing a bat-like creature flying above him, the teen swordsman had attempted to hit the beast, but it was swift and had evaded each of his attempts. Damn, all this time and I've never had to deal with one that flies, Ichigo groaned continuing to chase the creature. Hey! The pursuing orange head heard a familiar voice call out to him, looking over his shoulder while continuing to roof hop. Ichigo saw the blonde pirate on the street waving to him and grinning. You again? Sorry, we got off on the wrong foot, I am Naruto. Didn't I tell you to leave? Ichigo asked with a cold look. Naruto rubbed the back of his head, yeah, you did, to tell the truth, this place was so boring, I was probably gonna leave if you hadn't shown up, lucky, huh? Is that what you'd call it? You're really strong, you know, Naruto hopped up onto the roof next to Ichigo with the swordsman only giving the blonde a glance as they ran. Sure, I guess, so, I was thinking, since you're so strong, why don't you join my pirate crew with me? We can go on adventures together, Naruto offered with an innocent smile. Ichigo frowned, looked to the blonde, and said, I refuse. Ah, how come? Being a pirate is fun, you get to do whatever you want with a bunch of people watching your back. I don't want to be a pirate, and even if I did, I have something I have to do before I can leave this island, Ichigo looked ahead with determination set in his features. Naruto frowned at his cryptic answer, crossed his arms, closed his eyes, and tilted his head all while still running, what do you have to do? TCH, like I am telling you, it's none of your business, with his answer. The creature that Ichigo and the unknowing pirate had been chasing let out a shriek as if to remind them that it was present. When Naruto looked up to see what had made the noise, he finally took notice of the odd animal. Whoa, what the heck is that? Naruto asked shocked. You've been chasing me, and you didn't even notice that? Ichigo asked shocked at the oblivious blonde. The cogs in Naruto's head began to turn, looking to the creature then Ichigo and seeing the swordsman's intense gaze on said creature, a hand on his chin and his eyes closed. Naruto worked out the intricacies of Ichigo's words and the oddly empty town. I got it. You're hunting down these things to protect your island, huh? Naruto put his fist in his other hand in realization, if that's all you have to do before you can leave, he'll help you. What? Why? In return for my help, you join my crew. That's a dirty deal, and I already said no, Ichigo's eyes bulged in indignation at the laughing blonde. This'll be a piece of cake, he'll knock that bat down, and then we can hunt the others and leave. Naruto flew up to meet the creature and earn a crew member. Hey! Guess this explains why he could block my sword with his bare hands, he's got devil fruit powers too, Ichigo mused as the blonde flew to the bat. Hey, bat! I am knocking you down, Naruto yelled, why do you give away your element of surprise? Ichigo shouted angrily. I want him to know what's coming, Naruto reached the bat and reared his fist back to punch it down. When it heard the blonde's shout, the creature turned to Naruto and shocked him with its appearance, the monster's face was bone white and seemed to be more of a mask than a face with thick teeth for a mouth, a skull-like nose, and a half-circle indented forehead, the odd being gave a shrill shriek, fully turning to confront its prey. Whoa, weird bat, but I am still gonna take you down, 
Naruto brought his fist into the bat's chest, pushing the creature back and knocking its balance off. You want to aim for the mask? That's its weak spot. Ichigo informed the blonde, destroy it, and its body will disintegrate. Huh, the mask? All right. Naruto flew to the bat as it regained its balance, intent on defeating it in one hit. But missed an important detail that Ichigo had shouted. Attack from behind, never the front, unless you can get it in one hit. Ichigo desperately yelled. Okay. One clean hit. Naruto's fist barreled into the monster's eye, but he winced in pain when his knuckles met the mask. A crack ran up the forehead of the creature to denote the small amount of damage the impact had on the beast. This thing is tougher than I thought. Naruto saw that his knuckles were bloodied a bit. He couldn't do it, Ichigo commented, though he couldn't blame the blonde for not knowing of the creature's resilience. The monster shook its head to clear the cobwebs when its brain got rattled and opened its maw, spewing from its mouth, came leeches that latched onto Naruto who recoiled in disgust when they latched onto his arms and chest. Ew! What the hell kind of bat spits out leeches? Naruto stuck his tongue out, freaked out as he tried to brush the parasites off him only to be met with a great amount of resistance. Leeches? Is that its ability? Will they suck him dry, or is it something else? Ichigo continued his pursuit, taking an in information from below while watching the battle. While the blonde frantically tried to remove the small parasites from his person, his opponent once again opened its mouth and stuck its oddly forked tongue out toward the pirate. The bat then gave a high-pitched whistle, causing the leeches to vibrate on the pirate, making him wonder what was happening until suddenly the leeches detonated on his body. Bomb! Ichigo sped up when he saw the blonde begin to fall, seemingly knocked out. Hey, you alright? I told you I didn't need help. Ichigo jumped up and caught the blonde. Cough damn, that caught me by surprise, must be some kind of mutant or something. Naruto seemed unfazed from the bombs other than a little blood and scuffs on him. You never said the mask was so tough, Naruto pouted. Don't pin this on me. Blunt force isn't as effective unless you pack serious power behind it. The best way to destroy the mask is with a cutting attack. So why don't you stand back and Ichigo made to grab his sword, but Naruto got up instantly. I can cut. Don't worry about me. The captain's gotta be tough. Naruto gave Ichigo a thumbs up. I am not joining your crew. Ichigo shouted after the blonde had already made back up into the sky. All right, bat face. I've got you this time. Naruto had his hand out to his side, fingers extended and together, and wind swirling around it. The pirate blonde brought his hand down in a chopping motion. Kazakiri, wind cutting. The blonde's hand released a sharp wind as it was swung toward the creature. Being cautious, the monster moved its head away from the blonde's limb as quickly as it could, but the side of its mask had been caught by the tail end of the gust causing the cracked part of its mask to come off, the monster then fell from the sky and landed in the street due to being swept up the force of the attack and the pain from its face being injured, the blonde followed the felled beast, ready to end the skirmish. Still in one piece? Naruto saw the creature scuttle in place, looking confused and on its last legs, guess I didn't cut enough, well, sorry to say, but I've got to take you down, Naruto cracked his knuckles to give the finishing blow. Then the monster turned its head to him, Naruto froze at what he saw. Underneath the mask of this monster, was a face, a human face judging from the eye that Naruto could see, it looked to him frantically, afraid of the pirate's approach as it, he, whoever feared its impending doom, so shocked was the blonde, he was taken off guard when the thing had spat its leeches back onto him in a greater volume than before and brought its tongue out to detonate them, fully intending to obliterate the pirate. Before the deed could be done, Ichigo appeared from above the beast and ran his blade through its mask completely bisected it, with that, the creature let out an ear-piercing shriek as it slowly began to disappear into dark flecks that floated into the sky, the leeches following suit. I told you, attack from behind and end it in one strike if you have to attack from the front, Ichigo watched the particles as the corpse completely disappeared with a somber expression, he turned to the blonde who clearly had questions he wanted to ask but held his tongue, Sai come on, you need to rest and heal up, and the best place to do that is my house, and when you are rested, you need to leave, Ichigo started to walk, leading the way to his home. Kurosaki Clinic. The walk to Ichigo's home was silent, both teens not knowing how to strike up a conversation after what had happened, they trudged through the empty streets of the ghost town, the unsettling silence only broken by the trash that the wind would occasionally blow past them. Naruto's questions only grew the more and more they passed through, wondering where everyone had been this entire day and why they hadn't come out of hiding, he watched Ichigo's back as they walked, his hand behind his head as he observed the empty town, he wouldn't pry since it wasn't any of his business. Ichigo had taken his book out during their trek and had crossed another name from it, with that name eliminated from the large list, only three remained on the very first page of the entire book, and they were names that the orange-haired teen dreaded reaching but knew that they were necessary before he could leave the island. 
Finally stopping in front of Ichigo's home, the duo walked in with Naruto curiously gazing around the abode in slight wonder and Ichigo leaning his sword against the wall by the front door. Make your way to the room on the right, it's where I keep all the medical supplies. Where's all the food? Naruto rummaged in Ichigo's kitchen, looking for sustenance and angering his host. Who do you think you are going through someone else's kitchen? Ichigo growled. I have to heal somehow, Naruto shook his head at the swordsman's blunder. What idiot heals by eating? Go into the patient room and ill dress your wounds. Ichigo shoved the invader into a room akin to a doctor's office and forced him to sit on a gurney. In a matter of minutes, the swordsman had disinfected the blonde pirate's wounds and wrapped them tightly with gauze with clear familiarity. When he finished the task, Ichigo set his supplies on a small table on wheels and wiped his forehead. Whoa, I am good as new. Naruto hopped off the gurney immediately and started to swing his arms around and stretch. Are you a doctor swordsman? No, I've just seen enough idiots get patched up over the years that I know how to dress wounds, at least, and sit down. Ichigo sat on the doctor's chair, resting his forearms on his knees, and sighed to himself. No doubt you've got questions. He'll tell you what happened on this island, but tomorrow, if you understand the gravity of what I am going to tell you, you'll leave. Ichigo brought his head up and saw the blonde spewing blood and bleeding again. I twisted too much, Naruto fell face first on the ground. I told you to sit. After redressing the blonde's injuries, the atmosphere once again grew heavy with the weight of the incoming conversation. I am sure you've noticed that no one has been around the island all day, Ichigo finally started the tough talk. Yeah, everything was completely empty, Naruto rubbed his chin in recollection, where is everyone? You took out that monster, so you'd think they'd come out of hiding. You've already seen one of them, Ichigo answered, a dark look in his eyes. What? was the pirate's response, tilting his head. Remember what happened when you broke the bat's mask? Naruto's eyes widened when he thought back, there was a human eye underneath it. You don't mean to tell me, Naruto let the question hang in the air. Ichigo gave Naruto a solemn nod, that creature was once a resident of this island, and everyone on this island other than me has met the same fate, Ichigo revealed. How did that happen? A devil fruit. Ichigo shook his head, no, ten years ago, a virus swept through the island in only about two days, it didn't take long at all for everyone to become infected, and they became those monsters, hollows. What kind of a virus can do that to a person, and hollows? Naruto gripped the gurney tightly as he listened. A virus made to, bring something out of people that has always been there, but forcibly, without their consent, the removal of what's inside mangles their bodies and manifests itself into those masks they wear and the loss of their humanity, they become nothing more than beasts, looking to fill the void that has been left by the absence the virus created, Ichigo explained. How come you weren't infected, then? You've been around these, things, the word didn't sit right with the blonde, but they couldn't be called human anymore, for ten years, wouldn't you have, why no become a hollow too? The reason I am not affected is the same as the reason you want be, we have devil fruit powers, Ichigo revealed. You're a devil fruit user, what kind, Naruto asked, curious about the other devil fruits out there. The Rei Rei no mi, spirit spirit fruit. It made me a spirit human, it's almost as if I was dead, in a way, I am able to use abilities that spirits can, that's where my sword came from, it's a manifestation of my soul, so I am the only one that can use it, Ichigo looked to the sword. Whoa, cool, but how do our powers protect us from being infected? It's because the thing inside us has already been brought to the surface, only naturally, Ichigo saw the blonde's confusion, I am sure you know the story of devil fruits. Yeah. They were supposed to be cursed by sea devils and we lose the ability to swim because the ocean wants to punish us for gaining the abilities or something. The way I see it, the power inside us is malleable and devil fruits shape it into something that our bodies can handle and use in a natural way. This virus attacks what's inside us before it can be brought out through devil fruits and forms it violently while bringing it out of us. Not allowing our bodies the proper time to acclimate to the power and destroying it in the process, it transforms humans into a new shape that can handle the incredible power destroying everything that made them human and often giving them unique abilities as well though there are common traits shared by all of them, the masks, great strength and speed, tougher skin to name a few. So that's why you want to stay here, to put everyone to rest? Naruto crossed his arms, knowing the severity of what he was just told. Exactly, and after 10 years, I am almost finished, until I've cleansed everyone, I refuse to leave the island, that's why I can't leave with you and be a pirate, Ichigo finished. All the more reason that I stay and help you out, Naruto smiled. Ichigo grit his teeth in frustration, I thought telling you would make you understand, this is something that I have to do alone, and you'll just get in the way. If you're talking about today, I was just caught by surprise, he'll be ready next time, Naruto assured. No, you want, 
I told you to rest up and leave tomorrow, that's the deal. Ichigo got up and made to leave. Why are you such a loner? I can help you, and then we can leave together. Naruto shot up, arguing adamantly. Because this is none of your business, I don't need or want a pirate's help anyway. I've been doing this for ten years, alone, and I've been just fine. Ichigo turned back to the blonde, a frown on his face. No, you haven't. Naruto grabbed the swordsman's collar. No one in the world is alone. You had help to get to where you are now. Your family, your friends, they helped make you who you are today, and you carry them with you as long as you are alive. Your devil fruit helped you survive this long on your own, and now, I am here to help finish it all and take you away from here. Naruto got into Ichigo's face. This isn't something that you can help me with, no one can, I have to do it myself. Ichigo, in turn, grabbed Naruto's collar and got into Naruto's face just as intensely. Why? Why, just you? Because it's my fault. The house went silent, Ichigo huffed as he came down from the emotional high that the argument had caused. Naruto loosened his grip and let his hand fall back to his side, eyes wide at the revelation that had been revealed to him and unable to find words to say. The virus, it's my fault that it spread around the island as fast as it did, there was no chance for defense against it, because I tried to stop it, and I lost everything because of it, I have to fix my mistake and let everyone rest. Ichigo looked to the floor, remembering everything. I don't believe you, Ichigo looked up to the blonde, who had a straight face and looked directly into Ichigo's eyes. Whatever happened here wasn't your fault. Someone who'd spend 10 years of their life to save the people from a fate worse than death could never do anything to harm them, accidental or otherwise, Naruto crossed his arms, he remembered a certain boy lying in a street, beaten, blaming his own weakness before a certain someone had shown him that his weakness wasn't any fault of his own, it was something outside of your control, so it couldn't be your fault. Ichigo was speechless, it was like the blonde had become a different person from the goofball that had been all day, he had a commanding air about him, and despite having no real knowledge of the swordsman, Naruto had a look of unshakable faith in Ichigo's character. The blonde didn't seem to even entertain the thought that Ichigo could have caused the outbreak in Karakura town. Ichigo couldn't come up with anything to say in his defense at this point, all he could do was turn away and make his way to his room upstairs. Just go to sleep and get out of here, Ichigo stomped upstairs, passing the pictures on the wall, stopping in front of one that had him and three other people on it, two girls and an older man. You just don't get it. Ichigo's shoulders slumped and his normal stern look became softer as he looked at the photo. Naruto watched the swordsman disappear up the steps before huffing in exasperation, hopping back on the gurney for a makeshift bed, and placed his arms behind his head. He's just like that duck-haired kid back in the elemental nations, Naruto sighed, he then smirked when he looked down at his bandages, only difference is, he's a jerk that actually cares, unlike that kid, he just wants me gone so I don't get hurt. Naruto closed his eyes, I am not going anywhere until all those things are gone, hell be mad, but hell thank me. Eventually, the blonde conked out and was idly snoring in the clinic while Ichigo sat in his room looking out his window, he gazed at the moon solemnly, knowing that with the coming days he'd have to hunt the final hollows, and wondering if he was truly ready, sighing to himself, Ichigo heard the snores of the blonde coming from downstairs and cracked a small smile. Idiot! Ichigo looked back out the window and thought about the blonde, it was, nice to have someone to talk to again after so long even if he got on his nerves, for a pirate. Naruto wasn't so bad and packed a mean punch, but he couldn't allow himself to lose focus on his mission and he couldn't have more blood on his hands. Just then, a shadow ran across the dark streets, catching Ichigo's trained eye, he pressed his cheek to the glass to continue to watch the large dark shape move further away from the Kurosaki clinic, the team knew what this meant, and he hopped into action immediately jumping from his bed and running down the stairs swiftly, and grabbing his blade and heading out the door. When the door closed, Naruto cracked one of his eyes open. Karakura Streets. Ichigo's heart was beating heavily from running so fast as well as his nervousness, he knew what he was going to do tonight, and he hoped he was ready for it, he had to be. It could be any one of them. Attack from behind, destroy the mask, Ichigo chanted in his mind, clicking his teeth, he'll save you, he'll fix this. Ichigo, unbidden wandered back to ten years ago, thinking about how he got here. Ten years ago Karakura Dojo, pow, asterisk a young Ichigo had been punched in the face during a spar and fell back onto the mat, after the initial shock of the blow, the young orange head began to bawl his eyes out. Hey, Ichigo's crying again. Turning back the clock, we come to a bustling little island known as Karakura Town, a town that spanned all the island, buildings and rural areas as far as the eye could see, and friendly citizens by the handful, just about everyone on the island knew each other creating a welcoming and encouraging energy, they enjoyed a peaceful life, thanks to being so out of the way, meaning that pirate attacks were few and far between. 
It is because of their innocuous, unassuming lifestyle that made the island the perfect target for the dark force that was slowly making its way toward them. And no one would have expected from where such a threat would come. Karakura Dojo. Pow, asterisk hey, Ichigo's crying again. A young girl with dark hair, garbed in a karate gi and a sparring gear, pointed to a downed Ichigo Kurosaki who was crying his eyes out after getting punched by the girl. Another win for Tatsuki. A young tanned boy with shaggy brown hair in his eyes sat on the sidelines with other children and two adults. What were you expecting? Ichigo never wins, another young girl with a round head and dark hair sighed with a stern look on her face. Rukia chan. You should nt say things like that. You have to be nice or Kurosaki kun will feel worse. A girl with orange hair parted to the left with a beret admonished the girl. Gaining a ditzy smile, she placed her hand near her mouth to project a shout, Good job, Ichigo kun. You lasted much longer than before. She crossed her arms and looked to her friends with a triumphant smile, believing she accomplished something great. Ichigo seemed to cry even louder when he heard that. Yeah, Orihime chan, that seemed to make him feel better. A five year old girl sat cross legged with her hand holding her head up and her elbow on top of her knee, an apathetic look on her face while watching her older brother cry. Ichi ni is hurt, Karen chan. You could try being a little nicer. A girl of similar age shook her sister by the shoulder. Isn't he a boy? He should NT be crying after getting his ass kicked anyway, Karen calmly answered her sister, ignoring the shaking. Seems Ichigo chan is the same as ever, a young man's sweat dropped, watching the fiasco and turned to the assembled children, and no one seems to care about his pain either. Sora. Is that a slight against my parenting? A man shot up with a loud shout, finally deciding to take action in an over the top manner, Karen. He pointed dramatically at the girl. Karen looked to her father with the same apathy she had for most things. The man walked next to his daughter and put a firm hand onto her shoulder, a resolute and hardened look on his face as he stared off into the distance, ironically the direction where his son was still crying but had at least worked his way to his knees. Men are allowed to cry all the same as women, I'd say that real men have to cry, it shows their sensitivity and that they are in tune with their emotions. My son may have lost the battle, but his war, Ishan began to cry soft tears, his war has already been won. Shouldn't you go help him or something? Karen pried her father's hand off her with nary a look in his direction, she would never humor his stupidity as long as she lived. You're right. Ishan hopped over the children in front of him and ran to his son, Ichigo, don't worry, daddy's here to make everything better. Ishan made to envelop his son in a bear hug to comfort him. Wham! Only for his face to meet the soles of Ichigo's feet as the child drop kicked his father, an angry expression on his face. Keep away from me, ya creep. I don't want any comforting from you, Ichigo shouted angrily. Ishan flew back, going past the group as they had prematurely moved aside since they were used to this occurrence, when he hit the tatami mats behind them, Ishan painfully crawled to a specific mat, set it aside, and pulled out an enlarged picture of a woman with wavy brown hair before beginning to cry over it. My dear Masaki, do you see how our children treat me? How many of those have you hidden around town, Ichigo shouted, grabbing his dad in a headlock. Two san. Yuzu whined, haven't we gotten enough complaints from everyone about this? He won't be satisfied until we rip them all up, Karen looked her father in the eyes and ripped the picture of her mother, a sadistic smile on her face while watching his. Karen, how could you do that to your mother? Ishin cried out. Because it isn't her, and it isn't healthy for you to be projecting on these, anyway. She punctuated her point by fully tearing the photo. Masaki. Who is supposed to be the adult here? I honestly forget. Tatsuki watched with the crowd as the Odd family messed around, the spectacle a regular occurrence on the island. All right, you three, time for lunch, you can go back to beating up Ishin San later, Sora calmed the children. Yeah, lunchtime. All the kids cheered at the promise of food and hanging out with each other. The group then made their way out of the dojo to get their food, walking through their town with smiles on their faces as they all waved at the passerby who gave their own smiles in return. The children running ahead and playing with each other under the watchful eye of the two adults. Soon the group of children was sat under a tree, eating the food they had gotten and talked about their day. All done. Onigiri dipped in wasabi with just a hint of natto. Orihime held her concoction up, the dish radiating an oppressive, dark aura that frightened her friends. There are so many things wrong with what she just said, Rukia sweat. I feel an ominous presence from that thing, Ichigo shuddered. Is it alive? Yuzu asked her brother innocently. I wouldn't rule it out, Karen backed away. Even bugs won't go near it, Chad saw flies fall to the ground when they approached the food. Tatsuki chan. Want some? Orihime turned to her best friend expectantly. The assembled all turned to Tatsuki, 
wondering whether she'd give in this time and try one of the girl's weird combinations, Tatsuki, herself, gulped when Orihime began to edge the dish closer and closer, the aroma practically making her gag. Uh, maybe another time, Orihime, I wouldn't want you to miss out on a new flavor, Tatsuki maneuvered herself out of the minefield effortlessly. Ah, thanks, Tatsuki-chan, you're so considerate, Orihime bit into her treat with a smile, missing her friend wipe her brow and sigh. The others gave claps of amazement, it never gets old, Ichigo applauded his friend. Basically an art form, Rukia nodded her head with her eyes closed. Shut up! Tatsuki growled at them, they all fell into a comfortable silence after that, eating their lunch before laying in the grass in a circle and staring at the clouds, though young Orihime broke that silence, a finger on her chin as she decided to voice something that had been bothering her. Say, Tatsuki-chan, how many times have you beaten Kurosaki-kun? Orihime turned her head to the tomboy. It must be been a lot, Rukia spoke up, itd be easier just to say that Ichi Ni has never won and leave it at that, Karen picked her ear insensitively as her words stabbed Ichigo. I think it's been about, 300 times since starting at the dojo, the little crybaby hasn't even hit me once either, Tatsuki stuck her tongue out. Rrrgh, just you wait, when I beat you for the first time, you'll eat those words, Ichigo sat up. Gotta beat me first for me to do that, Berry boy. Tatsuki got into Ichigo's face and the two glared intently at each other. Yuzu pulled on Ichigo's pant leg, wanting to ask her own question. Ichi ni, why did you want to learn how to fight anyway? Yuzu asked innocently, her brother, from what she remembered in her earlier years, hadn't really cared about fighting or strength, but then, well, something, someone, she could vaguely remember was lost, and he changed. Cuz I have to be strong, Yuzu chan, Ichigo assured with a smile. And how's that working out for you? Rukia smirked evilly. It's a work in progress. Ichigo whined, Ichigo, Chad put a hand on his friend's shoulder, coming to his defense. Thanks, Chad, at least you, you have no skill in the martial arts, Chad said bluntly with his ever stoic face. Chad, you've been at it for two years, Ichi ni and you haven't made any progress, your time would be better spent doing something else, Karen chimed in. I know, but it's the best way to get stronger on the island. Ichigo sat with his knees to his chest and looked to the sunset. You and Yuzu probably don't remember too well, cause you were so young, but mom was great, she could quiet you guys no matter what had started you crying, I could get hurt while playing and she'd be there in an instant to patch me up, even dad was less of an idiot, but not much, Ichigo smiled in remembrance. His friends and sisters simply sat and listened to the normally closed off Ichigo share with them, Yuzu and Karen couldn't remember their mother very well, without their father's vast amount of, creepy, pictures of her. They probably wouldn't even know what she looked like, all the two could remember was a kind figure being there for their family, the center of their universe. Then pirates attacked, the older children remembered the panic and surprise on the adults' faces as they frantically ran about the island, trying to save themselves and each other while scooping the children up as they ran. Their peaceful island's first and worst attack, but the crew had been desperate and didn't care whether they attacked a well-known or piddly island as long as they could restock and plunder. Dad took the two of you, but I was out, walking home from playing with everyone. So I was alone, when everyone started running, I was confused and made my way home, and ran into one of the pirates. Ichigo bit his lip, he didn't care who he attacked and pointed a gun right at me, and I froze. Ichigo gripped his pants and his hair covered his eyes, I thought I was going to die, right there, without getting to see you guys again and no one would find me, then mom pushed me out of the way, she covered me from the bullet and told me to hold still, the pirate thought had got both of us and left, by the time I got the courage to move again, she was gone, Shed died while protecting me and smiled the whole time so I wouldn't be scared. The group all looked down at that, Yuzu and Karen finally learning what had happened to their mother since Ishin had kept it from them until the girls could handle it and the older kids got to hear of the event from the only one that was there, having attended Masaki's funeral but never knowing the cause. I couldn't help thinking, that if I was stronger, I could have saved mom instead of her dying to save me, it's because of me that she's gone, and you haven't gotten to truly meet her, Ichigo then got up and crossed his arms, but then the marines showed up and drove the pirates back. They wiped the floor with all of them in no time flat and saved everyone, and that's what I want. Ichigo looked to his friends and his sisters with a wide smile, I want to be strong so I can protect everyone, and when I am old enough, I'll join the marines and go out and save other people from pirates, too, so no one will have to lose their loved ones ever again. I'll become the strongest marine in the world, Ichigo shouted resolutely. PSHT, you, a marine, what are you going to do, cry on them, Tatsuki teased the orange-haired boy. Shut up, Tatsuki, I'll show you, just watch me become a marine, I'll make time for all the little people, like you, Ichigo shot back. 
You'll be a marine when Orihime eats normal food. Tatsuki glared. I think Kurosaki kun can do it, Orihime spoke up. Huh? Everyone smartly asked. I mean, Kurosaki kun has dedicated so much to do this, it's hard not to believe in him, you know, so, ill root for Kurosaki kun. Orihime, Ichigo smiled softly, and ill come with you. Uh, what? Ichigo tilted his head along with the others. Well, being a marine is bound to be dangerous, and I couldn't bear the thought of you being hurt, so ill be a marine with you and be your doctor. That way you'll be in one piece when you come back here. Orihime beamed so brightly that the children had to turn away lest they be overcome by the cute. Orihime, I could never ask you to do that, Ichigo told the girl. You errant, I want to, Orihime bluntly replied, ill come too. Chad chimed in with a smile. Chad, you are reckless, Ichigo, you'd probably jump headfirst into danger without thinking about the consequences and end up getting into trouble, so you'll need a shield to watch your back. Chad stuck his fist out to his best friend who bumped it with his own. I wouldn't have it any other way. Guess that means I have to come too. Rukia spoke up with a knowing smile and giving a side glance to the three. You wouldn't be able to get anywhere without a navigator and I've always wanted to see other islands, Rukia said casually, but with a genuine smile in her face. They all looked to Tatsuki at that point, expecting her to join in on the tender moment only to see her look away with a scoff. I am not joining the marines and working under a guy that can't beat me in a spar. Tatsuki scowled, now, joining the marines and having the crybaby be my cabin boy, that would be worth it, Tatsuki smirked, imagining that future where she ordered Ichigo around. What the hell kind of fantasy is that? Ichigo slapped the girl's fantasy out of the sky and into the stratosphere, I am gonna be in charge, and maybe it'll let you be my cabin girl. I refer you to my previous statement of Orihime making a normal meal before that happens. Tatsuki butted heads with Ichigo, let's agree that the stronger of us gets to be in charge of the ship, then. Berry boy. Tatsuki smiled with Ichigo following. It's a deal. The boy then grabbed his friends in a group hug, a big smile on his face, will be the best squad that the Marines have ever seen. Il join too. Ichi ni. Yuzu cheered. Yeah, no, I am not letting you do that. Yuzu chan. Karen pulled her twin down when she made to join the burgeoning Marines. But why not? We don't need him worrying about us while out at sea, for one, Ichi ni has enough on his plate. But at least he's got everyone watching him, so you don't have to worry, Karen whispered the last part to her sister. While the children talked about their futures, Ishin and Sora stood by listening with smiles on their faces, the bond that they shared was endearing, and they were sure that they would be able to survive out there if they were together. My little boy is living up to his namesake, I am so proud of you, Ichigo. Ishin popped out to grab his son but was kicked once again. Back off, old man, Ichigo proceeded to grab his father's legs, sit on his back, and pull. Ah great submission hold, son ah, um, come along, you all, I'll be taking you home, Sora, being the responsible adult ushered the children away, leaving the Kurosakis to their antics, or he may, I'll be working late again tonight, so I need you to be a big girl, Sora told his sister. Okay, Oni-chan or he may saluted, then turned to speak to Tatsuki, so, Tatsuki-chan, I was thinking, when I am a marine, what if I upgrade myself and become a robot girl, then I could fight and heal people, she smiled. Orihime, whatever world you live in, I don't know if I am fascinated by it or afraid of it, Tatsuki shook her head. The group dispersed with all the Kurosakis waving goodbye as they made their way home, when the family of four made it to their home, a box of fruits met them at the doorstep. Ah, looks like our payment was delivered, Ishin rubbed his hands together oddly. It's just fruit, Karen kicked the box to the side, making her way inside. Wrong, Karen Chan. This is payment from a grateful patient because of a job well done. I thought it was payment because he didn't have any belly to pay you with, Tu San? Yuzu questioned innocently, freezing her father in place. That's beside the point, Yuzu Chan. Ishin fell to his knees with tears running down his face, then instantly grew serious when turning to address his son, Ichigo, you can bring the box in. Why can't you do it? I am tired from sparring all day, Ichigo whined. You mean tired from being a sandbag, don't you? Karen poked her head through the doorway. Just do it. Men don't complain, Ichigo, and as the physician here my word is law. Ishin grabbed his bicep and stuck a pose. I hesitate to call you that, Ichigo grumbled, grabbing the box and putting in their kitchen, upon placing the box on the counter, Ichigo decided to get back at his dad by eating one of the fruits that he was so proud of forgetting. With a mischievous smile, the young orange-haired boy reached into the box, dug around, and pulled out an odd-looking fruit, had never seen a fruit like this before, it had odd swirls around it and a curled stem and as the boy stared at the fruit it felt as if there was a presence coming from it, 
compelling him to bite into it. Ichigo dazedly brought the peculiar thing up to his mouth. And bit into it, Bleg. He shouted in disgust, Hey, Ichigo, what's going on? Why do you yell like that? Ishin and the girls appeared in the kitchen with curious brows raised. It was this thing. That guy must be been messing with you, old man. The boy wiped his mouth, trying to forget the taste of the fruit. Ishin examined the fruit and grew puzzled, I am not sure what this is. Ishin took it from his son's hand to have a closer look, looks like you just had bad luck, son, everything else in here looks fine, maybe this one just went bad, and it serves you right for trying to eat these before everyone else. Ishin laughed at his son's misfortune and tossed the spoiled fruit into the garbage. No, it doesn't. I was just trying to teach you a lesson. Ichigo jumped up and grabbed his dad's collar indignantly. Okay. Girls, time to get washed up and ready for bed. Ishin ignored the boy shaking him and addressed his girls nonchalantly. All right. To San. Yuzu saluted. Yeah, yeah. Karen trudged away. Now then, Ishin grabbed his son and began to wrestle with him. Who do you think you are trying to teach a lesson to, brat? I have to repeat myself. Losing your hearing, old man. Ichigo shot back. Out on the ocean, near Karakura, a marine ship sailed smoothly through the night's dark ocean, ferrying many sailors that were moving about to keep it running. At the bow of the ship stood three men. I dunno about you too, but I am getting a bit bored of sailing around, island to island, a smooth voice said sarcastically. We shall sail as long as the vice admiral wills it, you know this, if you want the mission to be over, perhaps you should do a better job at scouting potential targets, another voice reprimanded. Below the ship, Held in its bowels, an unearthly wail could be heard along with crashes, despite the circumstances that should stir the sailors, none of the deckhands had seemed frightened by the commotion or even jarred, they all kept about their business. He's getting antsy again, guess we'd better get to that next island sooner rather than later, the first voice looked to the ship's wooden floor unconcerned. And tell me, what is that next island? A deep voice asked, coming from the leader, the vice admiral. That would be Karakura, think we'll be finishing our research this time around? Whether it ends in success or failure, something is learned from each attempt, I get one step closer to perfecting the virus, though I cannot lie about wanting more definite results, the vice admiral nudged up the glasses on his face. Look on the bright side, sir, we'll have a small reprieve from testing for a while, we've received correspondence to return to the grand line, the second voice said. True, though that only annoys me, release it, the vice admiral commanded a random marine. A hidden door appeared on the ship's hull releasing something too hard to make out in the dark of night, it dove into the ocean, making a beeline for Karakura, its bubbled trail the only evidence that it was approaching the innocent, unknowing populace. Well arrive officially in the morning, call headquarters then, let them know that another outbreak has been found, and we will attempt a suppression and rescue. At once, Vice Admiral Eisen, the two voices nodded their heads as the moon shone on their superior officer, showing a gently smiling face. The next day, ah, Ichigo flew headfirst into the wall of the dojo, losing once again. Another win for Tatsuki, Rukia made a tick in a small notepad, along with terrible drawings of rabbits. Still have to admire the resolve, Chad crossed his arms. Hang on, Kurosaki-kun, or he may yank the boy out of the hole. Not even a second later, he sprung back up on his feet, a bloody nose, and fired up for yet another spar. Another round, Tatsuki, he'll be ready this time. Ichigo wiped his nose and walked back into the ring. Tatsuki shook her head and turned her back to the boy, placing her arms behind her head as she walked out of the ring. Nah, I think five times is enough today, Tatsuki waved him off. We didn't spar five times today. Ichigo raged behind the girl, watching her grab her stuff to go change out of her GI. Um, Ichigo, you did. Chad spoke up, Ichigo turned to address his friend for not taking his side in the argument, but before he could begin to speak, Chad rose his finger and pointed behind the orange head. Looking behind himself, Ichigo saw a row of holes in the wall, five of them, a shadow cast over Ichigo's face at being proven wrong, and the fact Tatsuki had beaten him headfirst into the wall each time today. Let's do five more, Ichigo shouted, acting like he didn't see the evidence of his loss. Is Ichi knee punch drunk or something? Karen whispered to Yuzu. Maybe it's how he shows that he likes Tatsuki-chan, Yuzu whispered back. I do not like her, him. The two answered angrily at the girls, having gained a sixth sense as they were often accused of having a crush on the other. See? Yuzu giggled at them. What? Karen saw the two look ready to rip each other's head off, taking their comments as meaning that they weren't good enough for the other. Just as Ishin and Sora were about to break the children up, a commotion was heard outside as a drove of people ran past the dojo. Shopkeepers left their shops unattended, 
Children stopped playing in the streets and started dragging their parents toward the spectacle. Ishin grabbed one of the bystanders as he passed by the dojo's doorway, deciding to ask him what was happening. Hey, buddy, what's going on? Where's everybody headed? Ishin jabbed his thumb in the direction that his fellow islanders were heading to. It's amazing, Ishin san. A ship from Navy headquarters just arrived, and it's carrying a vice admiral. The man spoke out of breath, everyone's heading that way to see what he's here for. When he finished, he went back to running with the crowd. Something serious must be going on if a vice admiral of all people was sent. Ishin rubbed his chin, I think we should all head home as soon as possible and stay out of their way, whatever they're doing, we should steer clear, Ishin reasoned. Wait, dad? Ichigo went to his father, you called me, dad? Ishin cried. This is my chance to see a high-ranking marine, I don't want to miss this chance, dad, it shows me where I need to get, Ichigo said with resolve shining in his eyes. My son, Ishin cried and hugged Ichigo, if you keep calling me dad, I'd do anything. Don't push your luck, old man, Ichigo deadpanned and moved out of his father's arms with the man freezing in place as a solitary wind blew through the now empty dojo. It has to be fast, all of you, I need to work late tonight, Sora called behind the excitable children. This is a great chance, Ichigo cheered, yep, you get to see someone actually strong in person, right? Tatsuki teased. Yeah, Ichigo didn't rise to the provocation, too excited to get angry. Yeah. Tatsuki smiled, coming into view was the crowd gathered around the port, a large white and blue ship was docked there with the regular sailors furling the sails while the three men were greeting the islanders. One of them, being surrounded by children, was a black man with his dark brown hair being done into braids. Making up a ponytail behind his head and a few loose strands falling over his face, he wore a standard marine uniform, but over it, he wore a haori with the marine symbol on its front over his heart and the marine's blue coloring found on a pattern lining the bottom of the haori. The mon's most interesting features were his blank lavender-colored eyes behind clear sunglasses and the orange scarf tied around his neck reminiscent of a noose. Whoa, are you blind? How can you be a marine if you can't see? He must be really powerful if they let him in with that handicap, or he may whispered to her friends. I assure you, little one, I am, and it isn't as big a handicap as you'd believe, the man turned to the group. Ah, oh, you heard me, or he may hid behind Shad in embarrassment. Of course, when one sense is taken, the others are heightened to compensate, I can tell a lot more about you than just your position. Really, like what? Orihime walked forward, I can tell that you bathed recently from the smell of the soap that you used, and from your voice, I know you are young, possibly around 9 years of age, and from another feeling I am getting, you are in love with someone, the man was silenced when he was hit in the face by an enraged Tatsuki. Back off, creep. Tatsuki huffed, standing in front of the flustered girl. Sorry. Sometimes I overstep my bounds, my name is Konami Tosin, he introduced, nonplussed as a welt formed on his head. Creeping the children out again are ya, Tosin? Another of the men came over from his position, though he seemed all too happy to interact since people seemed to be avoiding him, and for good reason. The man had short silver hair and wore the same uniform that Tosin wore, but the thing that set him apart from his fellow marine was his thin appearance and the unsettlingly wide grin that stretched his face to the point that his eyes were narrowed to slits. This combination gave the man an unapproachable, creepy air about him that made others steer clear of him. I would think that's your job, Jin, Tosin looked to his ally. Now that ain't true, kids love me, Jin crouched down to look into Rukia's eyes, isn't that right? You look like you'd stab me in the back, Rukia crossed her arms. No need to be afraid of that, sweetheart, unless, of course, you were a pirate, Jin said with shadows stretching across his face, scarily. This made Rukia hide behind Chad much like Orihime did only driven by the uneasy feeling the man had given her when had said that. Why does everyone hide behind me? Chad's sweat dropped. See, Jin, Tosin pointed out to the man. Guess you might have a point after all. Jin chuckled while keeping his gaze on the unsettled kids. While his friends interacted with the two marines, Ichigo had his eyes on the man that was surrounded by the most people, all with the kindest smile on his face. Ichigo was certain that this man had to be the man in charge of all these sailors. He had an air of power about him yet seemed so personable. He wore a howry similar to the other two, but on its back was the word for justice and vice admiral. The man had brown hair and wore square glasses, giving him the look of a brainiac. His kind smile was his selling point as it calmed those around him and made them lower their guard around him. Seemingly noticing the young orange haired boy, the vice admiral pulled himself away from the children that were admiring his unsheathed blade. Under a watchful eye, Ichigo watched the man sheathe his blade. A normal katana nothing special about it barring its guard which was an octagonal shape. Hello there, 
The man smiled softly to the young boy who blushed slightly when he was caught staring at the high-ranking officer, and what is your name? I, I, I am Kurosaki Ichigo, sir, Ichigo stiffened when addressed by the tall man. He who protects, E.H., a very strong name for one so young, the marine pushed up his glasses. Thanks, I am gonna be a marine when I grow up, so I can protect everyone from pirates, Ichigo exclaimed in confidence. Really, that's right, and all my friends are gonna join up too, they'll be my crew, Ichigo gestured to his friends, only to be caught in a headlock by a grinning Tatsuki. I already told you, I ain't working for anyone that can't beat me in a fight, but cabin boy is still a position when I am a marine, Tatsuki Nugi the orange head until he pried himself out of her grip, sorry, sir, this one likes to talk big but it's all bark, he's too much of a crybaby to be a marine on his own, so we're gonna watch his back, Tatsuki clapped Ichigo on his back with a grin. The man chuckled at the interaction, seeing the group of children surround the orange-haired boy, and a brown-haired girl being held back by a deadpan dark-haired girl with an unamused look on her face while she did it. I wouldn't be too sure of that, young lady, the man grinned when he saw the children's questioning gazes, over my years and experience, the weak are the ones that you must watch out for, the sun shone over the mons glasses, hiding his eyes, because they are the ones that hold the most potential. The mons words made the assembled onlookers eyes widen, the adults smiling at the encouragement to the children, and the children wondering if what he said could be true. I am sure that young Ichigo here will be a force to be reckoned with when he gets older, and I for one would love to see how far he has come at that time, the man mussed the boy's hair, his soft smile still in place. You sure about that, you don't know this kid like I do, Tatsuki said skeptically. The vice admiral laughed, only time will tell, at this point, Ishin decided to voice the inquiry that all the adults had on their minds once they'd seen a vice admiral of all people arrive on their island without any warning or noticeable problem. Excuse me, sir, but I think I speak for every islander when I ask you, why are you here? Is there some kind of problem? Ah, back to business, the man looked across the crowd ready to explain his appearance, I am Vice Admiral Aizen Sosuke. I have been tasked by Navy headquarters itself to investigate strange goings on here in the Southern Sea. When hearing this, the bystanders all began to murmur nervously, wondering what could be happening in the South Blue that warranted such a high-ranking individual to come and deal with the matter. Vice admirals were known to mainly be deployed in the Grand Line because of the level of pirate that was frequented on that stretch of sea, so if one came to a blue of all places, the threat must have been serious. WH what kind of goings on? Are we safe? The scared muttering of the populace began, begging the three marines for any information. That is what we are here to investigate, apparently, two separate islands have been left completely devoid of all life and evidence suggests that the citizens had been present, and, simply put, their disappearances were anything but natural, Aizen allowed the information to sink into the crowd, our investigations on those islands have led us to believe that a dangerous wild beast has been traveling between islands and, devouring their residents. The news rocked the assembled residents, fearing for their lives and wondering how a beast could completely decimate an island's populace not just once but twice. Given that the beast would need to rest, we've concluded that it may appear here in Karakura next if it hasn't already. So, we have arrived to search for the beast's presence or defend the island from its arrival, we would like you all to return to your homes before nightfall, we have reason to believe that the creature is mainly nocturnal and want roam during the day unless disturbed, Aizen announced, making the bystanders clamor to their homes once they saw that the sun was beginning to set, thanking the vice admiral for his help while leaving. Come along, you three heard what vice admiral Aizen said, Ishin scooped up the girls and looked to his son still standing before the marine despite the panic around him. I could help you track it down, I want to help the island, too, Ichigo offered, though still scared as could be told from the slight tremor in his voice. Ichigo. His father called in a slight reprimand for such an idea. Aizen laid his palm on the boy's head with his smile still on his face, crouching down to eye level as he spoke. Thank you for the offer, Ichigo-kun, but even with all of your potential you still have to grow into it. Aizen let the boy down gently, and upon seeing his downtrodden expression the man ruffled Ichigo's hair and continued, but don't let that diminish your spirit, just try even harder to reach your peak that way there won't be anything you can't overcome. The young boy brightened up at that and quickly ran to his family when urged again by his father, waving by to the brave, powerful marines that had arrived to protect his home in his stead until he could do it himself. Sora Ni, are you sure that you should work tonight? Orihime voiced her worry to her brother as he carried her on his back while taking the other children home. You heard what Vice Admiral Aizen said. Sora bit his lip, nothing else would make him feel better than going home and staying safe, but he had no choice in the matter, to make ends meet, working as hard as he did was essential to his and Orihime's survival. Sorry, Orihime-chan, I still have to work, but with the Vice Admiral on the job, I am sure it'll be safe, Sora assured. 
If only he knew, in the Kurosaki clinic, Ichigo excitedly hopped into bed, having to be told in the first place to even head into his room. The boy had talked about Aizen non-stop and the vice admiral's faith in Ichigo had riled him up to insane levels, while a welcome change from his stoic aloofness the energy he was putting out was on par with their father, and no one wanted that. The boy couldn't wait to grow up and reach his dream, now more than ever it felt like he could reach it, if a vice admiral straight from Navy HQ believed in him, there was nothing he couldn't achieve. The boy soon closed his eyes and drifted off to dreamland where his future was laid out before him in a straight line, ending with him being home with his family and friends, the island completely protected from pirates along with the rest of the ocean thanks to his exploits. Ichigo's life could go nowhere but up, meanwhile Karakura streets. Huff huff, Sora ran through the darkened streets of his home in a panic, constantly looking behind him for an invisible pursuer. The evidence that something was indeed there, was the inhuman roar that chased him. This must be the beast. Sora screamed in his mind, Vice Admiral, someone, help me. The monstrous figure leapt at the poor man and bit into his shoulder, making him scream in pain. This scream was a beacon for two parties, the Vice Admiral and his two subordinates, and one young orange-haired boy. Back at the Kurosaki clinic, Ichigo had gotten up to relieve himself in the middle of the night when had heard the bloodcurdling scream. The sound froze the young boy in his tracks, wondering who had traveled out into the night with the danger present on the island. Ichigo wanted to just ignore the scream, believing in the heroes to find whoever was in pain, until he heard the desperate plea for help. He couldn't ignore something like that, child or no. I have to get out there, Ichigo gulped as he quickly, yet quietly went downstairs and put on some shoes for his night trek. Stop, Ichigo, a voice the boy didn't recognize said in a calm, deep voice. Dad? Karen? Yuzu? Ichigo called into the darkness? No, I am not physically present in your home, I reside within you, the voice told the boy. What? What's that supposed to mean? Who are you, unless you want your family to know what you are doing? I do advise you to keep your voice down, speak through your mind and I will hear it. Am I crazy? I've never had a voice in my head before? Ichigo held his head in his hands. You are still sane, Ichigo, I have only formed recently within you and know that I mean you no harm, I am a part of your soul the voice explained. Where do you come from? Ichigo asked aloud, do you remember your conception? All I know is that while I may have come into being recently, I've always been here, the voice ignored the boy's slip-up, deciding to continue with their conversation. And what do I call you, then, is my name, are you joking with me? I didn't hear anything, Ichigo crossed his arms. It appears that you cannot hear me yet, unsurprising, given how young you are, the voice sighed. Well whoever you are, I am going out there, Someone needs help. Ichigo walked to the door. And just what do you plan to do? He'll think of something. I have to, Ichigo argued back. The Marines are here for that reason. What good could a boy do against something that could wipe out entire islands? If you're supposed to be a part of me, then you know why I have to go. The voice sighed, I know, even if I am against it, I know. All I am going to do is see if I can help out in any way. If Vice Admiral Aizen is there, he'll have no reason to stick around. He'll hold you to that, Ichigo, it is sound, if not foolish to do, but because I am against this course of action, I won't be assisting you if you find yourself in a bind, the voice said with finality. Fine by me, what good would a voice in my head do anyway? Ichigo shrugged uncaringly. When you are ready you will know, if I allowed you to use my power, it would put you in more danger simply because you'll feel as if you can accomplish anything. Really? Ichigo wondered if the voice was pulling his leg. Indeed, know this, Ichigo, though we are the same we are also different, what you want to protect isn't the same as what I want to protect, the voice warned the boy enigmatically. Fine by me, Ichigo returned to the voice in his, finally making his way out of his house. Karakura Streets The young boy made his way through the darkness, trying his best to find the person in distress, before long, the boy had come across the man, that he recognized as Sora, crawling on the ground in pain while holding his shoulder, breathing heavily and coughing. Behind the poor older brother was what could only be described as a monster. A drooling maw found on its mask like face with a black body, stalking Sora as its prey, approaching the injured man as slowly as possible, seemingly enjoying the mon's helpless state before delivering the finishing blow. Sora! Ichigo shouted in his mind, ready to burst from his hiding place, behind a building, to go assist the brother of his friend. Wait, Ichigo! Something is wrong with the beast! The voice in the boy's head spoke up, halting his advance. Ichigo made to speak to the voice but covered his mouth when he remembered where he was, instead, the boy thought his words to his mysterious watcher, what are you talking about? He peeked around the corner and saw that what the voice said was true. The masked monstrosity looked terrified as it backed away from the injured Sora, 
it shook with a deep-seated terror when its eyes laid upon three figures. Ichimaru Jin, Tosin Konami, and Vice Admiral Aizen Sosuke. With each step the three took toward the down Sora, the beast would take one backward while submissively lowering its head. See, look I didn't have to come out here after all, the marines have it handled, Ichigo smiled, he decided to stick around and get an exclusive look at the marines in action. The voice decided to stay silent, observing with a critical eye just what would happen next. Thank you, Vice Admiral, I thought I was done for, Sora propped himself up using his arm, a grateful smile on his face as he raised his hand up for the marine to take, I never imagined that the monster would come for me, I thought I'd die here and leave where he may alone, Sora began to tear up, I have to get back to her, she must be worried sick. Yes, you do, the Vice Admiral kept his soft smile on his face. Shunk, as he plunged his sword into Sora's shoulder. It took both Ichigo and Sora a second to register what had just happened, the spurt of blood that came from the downed man had shocked the two back to reality, Sora slowly traced his gaze from the sword to where it was currently lodged in his shoulder and screamed into the empty streets. What's he doing? Ichigo made to leave his hiding spot, only for his new guardian to stop him. Ichigo. There's nothing you can do, you can't expect me to just watch this, Ichigo shot back. I do, things have gotten a lot more complicated, the best course of action is to gather information and report to a higher authority, the voice reasoned, though he could tell that the boy didn't like the idea. V Vice Admiral Huff Huff WHY, Sora asked with his teeth grit and blood leaking from his mouth. Simple, because agitation and heightened emotions make the process go so much faster, the smiling man explained. WH, as Sora started to ask a white substance spewed from his mouth and eye, covering his face before beginning to harden and stretch across it slowly. The process seemed to pain the mane as he clutched his chest and struggled to breathe, veins appearing on his temples as the odd muck continued to spread. You should feel honored, young man, your sacrifice fuels Lord Aizen's research, this bloodshed is not without its silver lining, Tosin spoke reverently, using a different title to address his leader. Though the words were most likely lost on Sora as at that moment the white liquid had finally completely hardened with a final scream of pain from him. Lower. His scream warped into a howl that pierced the night, causing the young onlooker to cover his ears. How is no one hearing this? Ichigo winced in pain. The now masked Sora stood up, looking lost and confused but otherwise, human. Seems like we've got a success over here, Vice Admiral, Jin commented nonchalantly. Aizen observed his handiwork with a critical eye and a straight face, walking around the creature formerly known as Sora, seeming to finish his observation, the Vice Admiral turned to the other grotesque monster with a pitying gaze. With a chilling voice, he said, no need for the obsolete, then cut the creature down where it stood, its body disappearing into black flecks, yet another failure. Jin raised a brow, keeping his eyes slit all the while, oh? His eyes are vacant, he is of no use if he simply follows bestial instinct, Aizen spoke with half-lidded eyes, turning to regard his subordinates over his shoulder, Aizen inclined his head to the monstrous Sora who seemed to be writhing beneath his skin, falling to his knees. Behold, Sora's skin began to change to black, resembling the original beast, and his legs fused to form a snake-like tail behind him, he also grew larger, looking like he'd be able to pick up an adult and hold him in one hand at least. Sora was no more, wow, these guys just keep getting uglier and uglier, Jin said sarcastically, grin growing. Another failure, forgive me, Lord Aizen, Tosin bowed his head to his superior in regret. There is no need for forgiveness, Konami, failure is a much more powerful learning tool than success, Aizen smiled, we're getting closer. Each new strain causes vastly different results and appearances, I don't believe it will be long now, sigh though it is unfortunate that with another failure comes another island lost, Aizen sighed, still, his words seemed insincere. Ichigo covered his mouth, stopping himself from exclaiming in surprise, and attempted to steady his breathing, hiding behind the corner of the building, the boy could only look down on the ground, trying to sort the things had just heard and seen. Another failure? Another island? Has? Has Vice Admiral Aizen been behind those other islands' disappearance? Ichigo gulped, sweating profusely, but, he's a marine, they're supposed to be the good guys, heroes. Ichigo denied to himself, the boy turned back to see the rest of the tragedy and witnessed something that made his blood run cold. The Vice Admiral had made the creature submit to him as it bowed before the powerful naval officer, shaking slightly from what appeared to be the mon's sheer presence. Go forth, and end everyone on this island, quickly. The monster, upon receiving its orders or more like being set loose to sat itself, slithered off and disappeared into the darkness. Welp, guess it's time to head for HQ, Jin shrugged. Unfortunately, with Lord Aizen's position, he is essential to the upkeep in the Grand Line, we should be grateful they allowed him to come here to investigate it all. 
Tosin sneered at the thought of his master needing permission to move about. True, how long do you think before they're all wiped out? Jin asked. A day, perhaps two, it depends on who he gets to spread it and if those souls will be unfortunate enough to be agitated, speeding up the process, Aizen told the two dismissively. At that, the trio decided to take their leave and return to the marine ship for the night, left behind was Ichigo, crying silently and terrified about the future of his home. Now is not the time for wallowing, Ichigo, you have to run home as quickly and quietly as possible and await the morning, when everyone is awake, you'll have to convince someone to report this, the voice told the boy. Is this really happening? Vice, Aizen is behind all this, Ichigo grit his teeth in frustration. I understand how you feel, Ichigo, but you can't protect anyone if you don't act, the voice scolded the boy. Ichigo nodded, wiped his nose and eyes, and after checking to make sure the trio was gone, he fled the scene. With the three marines, Jin was looking thoughtful before he asked his leader, say, Tosin, why didn't you take care of the little kid that was watching us? Because Lord Aizen told me not to of course, if not for his command, that boy would be dead, Tosin said seriously. Oh, and why do that? Jin turned to his leader, I want to see what he will do, hopefully he will subvert my expectations, Aizen chuckled softly, scanning his eyes in the direction that Ichigo had run off to, a soft smile on his face. The next morning, Ichigo had come back to his home in a panic, wanting to wake his family up and tell them all that had transpired over the course of the night as soon as possible. The voice in his head on the other hand had advised the boy to take the rest of the night to himself and regain his wits, if he was panicked and hysterical it would only lend to the incredulity of his statements, and he needed all the support he could get right now. So, the boy re-entered his home, eyes wide, replaying the events in his mind repeatedly with it making less and less sense, he couldn't even get back to sleep for each time he closed his eyes, Ichigo saw the creature in front of him, vividly, with a burning karakura left in its wake. Everything, everyone, dead, he couldn't let Aizen get away with it. Ichigo. Ishin woke his son up with a nudge, squatting down to place a hand on the boy's shoulder. The boy woke with a start, his mind must have been so frayed that he simply passed out since he didn't remember closing his eyes, he had his back against the hallway wall in front of his father's room that way he could get Ishin's help as soon as had awakened. What are you doing sleeping on the floor, Ichi ni? Yuzu asked in worry. Karen was also worried but hid it better than her other family members. D dad, Ichigo grabbed his father's collar, hum, what's the matter? We have to, we have to call the navy before it's too late. We have to get as many marines here as possible as fast as we can. Ichigo sobbed while he shouted. His family shared a look amongst each other, frowns on their faces as they realized something terrible must have happened to throw Ichigo's emotions out of whack. The three turned back to the boy. Ishin putting both hands on Ichigo's shoulders, he spoke. What happened? Last night, I saw Sora, I heard him scream, I thought there'd be trouble and I went out to help. Ichigo suppressed his crying keeping his mind sharp as he recalled the dreadful events. You went out at night? Ishin asked, that isn't the problem right now. Ichigo told his father, Sora was attacked last night. I saw it, the monster that Aizen was talking about, it almost killed him. Sora-san? Or Ihime-chan's brother? Yuzu gasped with a hand to her mouth. So you came home? Why didn't you wake me, then? Ishin moved to get medical supplies. No, that's not all that happened. I saw Aizen and those two other guys with him, Ichigo grit his teeth, he stabbed Sora. The vice admiral? Ichigo you can't just throw that around, you have to be sure. I am, I saw it all, Aizen stabbed Sora, and he turned him into the same kind of monster as the one he brought here, and let Sora loose, Ichigo put his head in his hands, I don't know where either of them went after that, or if he's gotten anyone, but I know they have to be stopped, or Karakura will be the third island to be destroyed. With that, Silence took the Kurosaki family as the three processed the information that Ichigo had given them, the weight of the situation bore down on them as they realized that they were the only ones that knew of this apparent tragedy. Did they see you? Ishin asked, I don't think so, they didn't even come after me when I ran. I wouldn't put it past a vice admiral to have noticed, if they've gotten away with this before, they wouldn't make such a simple mistake, Ishin rubbed his chin. It doesn't matter, all we have to do is call the navy to come get them, Ichigo shouted. Ishin shook his head, that won't work, we're just civilians, without hard evidence of their wrongdoing, the marines would have no reason to believe anything we say, a vice admiral is one of the cornerstones of the organization, they wouldn't get rid of one simply because we told them to. Ichigo didn't hesitate to come up with an answer, then we capture Sora before he can get to anyone else, that should be more than enough for proof, right? If we could get our hands on him, but these things were supposed to have wiped out entire islands on their own, we wouldn't stand a chance against one, Ishin explained but you might be on the right track, 
his kids gave him questioning looks, so he decided to elaborate, if Sora is a monster, then hell have gone missing, and he has someone to take care of, someone head never just up and disappear on without good reason. Orihime. Precisely, Orihime could at least testify to her brother missing even if just for a night because of how punctual he is due to his work, he would never leave her alone without letting her know in advance, and that fact would give us a chance, though small, to convince the marines to investigate the beast and hopefully find a connection between Aizen and the incidents, Ishin finished. So, we should go to see Orihime-chan now then? Yuzu asked. I don't think so, Yuzu-chan. Karen spoke up finally with her own look of concentration, if that vice guy or whatever did all that, and he knew that Ichi-ni was watching, then he might be watching him right now, waiting to see what we do. Karen-chan is right, acting out of the ordinary is probably what they want so they can implicate us in their wrongdoing or silence us if we get too close to exposing them. The best thing we can do is go about our regular day like nothing happened and Ichigo can talk to Orihime-chan about Sora today at the dojo. Once we get confirmation from her that he never returned we can call the marines on a den den mushi and explain the situation to them and get soldiers here to evacuate the island at the very least. Ishin stood up at the point with a nervous sweat on his brow. Ichigo couldn't take it, this plan was much too intricate and slow for his liking and it still wouldn't have Aizen necessarily punished for his misdeeds and the boy let those very thoughts out. This won't work, dad, it will take too long to do it this way. Who knows how long the marines will take to get here, it could be too late. And what do you suggest we do, Ichigo, Ishin asked with a hard look in his eyes. If we tell everybody, then they won't be able to do anything about it, everyone together could fight them back. Don't be an idiot, Ishin scolded his son, getting angry at the boy's suicide mission of a plan. The important thing here is saving all the lives here, not going after Aizen, I understand why you'd want to do that, but none of us are fighters, and even if we were, we could never hold a candle to those three. Going in half cocked and hot headed will only result in everyone paying for it with their lives. Ishin breathed heavily from the heightened emotions that were flaring up before he sighed. You don't just need physical strength to protect people, Ichigo. Just follow the plan and we can get everyone out of this. Ichigo was still unsure about this, but if his father was so sure that this could save Karakura, then he would trust the uncharacteristically serious man. But if his plan looked like it was going south, then Ichigo resolved to himself that he'd make his stand against Aizen, no matter how futile it seemed. The Kurosaki family then had a very awkward and silent breakfast, all of them attempting to steal their nerves, being forced to act like nothing was wrong in their lives and continue their day while knowing that it was anything but normal, it was a painful burden that they all had, and it was one that they must shoulder. Dojo. When they arrived at the dojo, Ichigo immediately went over to his group of friends with his eyes set on Orihime specifically, her presence here had surprised the Kurosakis since Sora would normally bring her but with last night's events, she should NT have been able to come. They planned to visit her home after the dojo visit to check on her and get her testimony for Sora's disappearance, so how did she end up here? Hey, Ichigo. Ready to get your butt kicked again, Tatsuki started but her rival had ignored her and went straight to the orange-haired girl. Oh, hi, Kurosaki-kun, Orihime blushed when he walked up to her. What are you doing here, Orihime? Ichigo asked while grabbing her arm. What do you mean? Orihime tilted her head in confusion. Did those blows to your head knock something loose, Ichigo? Chad asked with confusion tinged in his voice as well. With all eyes on him, the boy knew he had to think his next words over very carefully, I mean, I didn't see Sora-san outside or inside so I thought that maybe you were taking the day off, Ichigo saved himself. Orihime said that Sora worked too late last night and was tired by the time he had made it home, Rukia informed Ichigo with a raised brow, since when was Ichigo so observant about any of their circumstances? Sora Ni Chan asked me to be a big girl and come to the dojo myself and head pick us all up at the end, Orihime smiled brightly, unaware of the effect her words had on Ichigo. Sora came home. That's impossible, Ichigo thought, sharing a glance with his dad who just returned it with his own that conveyed for his son to continue acting natural and they would figure out a backup plan later. Are you alright, Ichigo? Tatsuki asked when she saw him go silent and look down at the floor. Yeah, I am fine, Tatsuki. Ichigo gave a smile, closing his eyes in the process, I was just worried that something might have happened to you too, Orihime, with that monster going around, someone missing could be scary, sorry, about worrying you guys, Ichigo made his way past his friends to the ring, come on, Tatsuki, let's spar. They all knew something was wrong, that smile on Ichigo, it was fake, he never smiled like that, he only ever smirked even at his happiest around them, whatever he was hiding, he was trying to keep them out of the loop and was taking it all on himself. They'd get to the bottom of this, the day went by relatively quickly for the kids, Ichigo still lost to Tatsuki though they could tell that his heart and mind weren't in it as he flew from the ring repeatedly, 
The boy's eagerness to continue challenging Tatsuki wasn't there and he would keep staring at nothing, seemingly forgetting where he was at random moments. By the time they were ready to go, Ichigo and his family had stayed behind slightly and looked to be talking about something serious since the boy and his father weren't acting as goofy as normal, and the atmosphere completely shifted when Sora started walking down the road to come get them. The Kurosaki family had the tiniest widening of their eyes when they saw the man give a small wave and sheepish smile. Hello everyone, sorry I wasn't here today, as I am sure Orihime-chan told you, work had taken a serious toll on me the other night, so I thought it best to rest a little and let her come alone, I wouldn't want her to miss out on enjoying time with her friends, Sora told them. It's no problem, Sora, you should NT work yourself so hard, though, you'll make us worry, Ishin gave his patented dim-witted smile, why don't you come back to the clinic and let me examine you? You've always worked so hard and that fatigue can't be good for you. Ishin suddenly became deadly serious when he posed the question to Sora. Sorry, Ishin san, but I have to work again tonight, of course, I do have to work for a living, Sora politely declined. My door's always open, so don't hesitate, Ishin mentally frowned at the missed opportunity. I do have to apologize again, though, I still fell a tad exhausted, so we won't be able to join you all for lunch today, Sora looked apologetic. Really, Ni chan? Orihime sounded shocked, afraid so, say your goodbyes you all, Sora told the children he was normally tasked with escorting home as he moved off down the road a bit. Dad, your plan isn't working. Ichigo softly whisper shouted, all the evidence we were supposed to have is gone. You said that Sora was a monster, we couldn't have expected this, something is fishy, we need to stay on alert and get back home, now, Ishin grew nervous about this whole situation. No, we should go find Aizen or the monster ourselves, that's all the proof we need, Ichigo urged. No, I told you already, we don't stand a chance, well figure out what to do when we get home. Ishin denied his son, just say goodbye and let's get home. No, dad, you're wrong. I'll just have to do it myself. Ichigo balled his hands into tight fists. Don't you think you should trust your father? The voice made its return. He's only trying to keep you and everyone else safe from harm, Ichigo. He's being a coward. Is it cowardly to think your moves through and try and stop unnecessary bloodshed? When it's failing at every turn, it is, it'll go out and find that monster Sora or whatever myself, Ichigo looked determined, and you're going to help me. And why would I lend my power to this foolish endeavor? If we're stuck together, then if I die you die, and I am sure that you don't want that, the boy smirked. While that may be true, I want help unless it is a life and death situation, and I pray it doesn't come to that, the voice sighed. Ichigo, Chad shook his friend, what, oh, sorry guys, I was thinking about something. What's was with you today? Tatsuki cut right to the point. What are you talking about? Ichigo tried to play dumb. You can't trick us, Ichigo, Rukia frowned with her hand on her hips, you weren't being your typical annoying, hyper, belligerent self during the spars, you had to be snapped out of a daze after each one. I just have a lot on my mind, does it have something to do with Sora? Tatsuki asked, getting into the boy's face, I saw the way you looked at him. No, it's just, you can tell us Kurosaki-kun, we're supposed to be a team, Orihime had tears welling in her eyes because he refused to share his plight with them. The boy was taken aback by that, he felt like an idiot for thinking he could keep something like this a secret from his friends for long, even if he wanted to, they knew him just as well as his family. If you're planning on doing something stupid, we want to be right there with you, Tatsuki crossed her arms with Chad and Rukia both giving resolute nods. The Kurosaki felt touched by his friend's willingness to help him with a problem that they knew nothing about all for his sake, he looked behind them to see Sora still patiently waiting for the kids and behind himself and saw his family having their own conversation. Okay. I'll tell you what's been happening, Ichigo leaned in close to whisper to his friends, I snuck out last night and saw the monster that, Aizen was looking for. Sounds like something you would do, Rukia sighed collectively with the others. Shut up. He hissed, the thing is, Ichigo paused and looked at Orihime. Debating whether the girl would be able to take the information that her brother had, become a monster. Then and there he decided against telling her of Sora's fate, at least until he could figure out whether the person with her was the real Sora or an imposter, I was out there because I'd heard someone scream, I went to go help, and I saw Aizen and those two guys there, they purposely set the monster loose so they could perform some experiment and it worked, the guy that got attacked turned into one of them, Ichigo revealed to his friends. What? They all asked in shock, but why would they do something like that? Orihime looked confused. I don't know why, but it doesn't matter, Ichigo scoffed, all I care about is stopping whatever he has planned, so, I am going to hunt that thing down and use it as proof that he's up to something. You're always trying to do something stupid, Ichigo, Tatsuki spoke up angrily, how do you expect to catch something like that? 
I don't know but I have to do something or else everyone on the island will be in danger. Sigh a crybaby like you, Tatsuki sighed and exaggeratedly lowered her head. Now I am glad we decided to speak up, Rukia crossed her arms with a superior smirk on her face, you'd be totally lost without us. I ill help out too, or he may puffed her cheeks up in determination. And Shad gave a cheesy smirk and a thumbs up, making the stoic boy seem completely out of place. We could get in trouble for this, Ichigo pointed out, knowing his father would most likely be furious for his little excursion going against Ishin's wishes. Like I said, we want to be right there with you, Ichigo, we're a team, and the leaders got to be there for her teammates, Tatsuki nudged the orange-haired boy. Hey, yeah, you're right, Ichigo smirked, we can sneak out tonight, and make sure no one follows you, Ichigo held up a finger to his mouth in a shushing motion. With their plans made, the children all finally got to say their goodbyes and went their separate ways, knowing they'd be meeting in a few hours, unfortunately, they had no way of knowing just what would be awaiting them at the end of the night. Orihime let out a small cough as she was escorted home. Hours later night, ka ka, Orihime sounded a bird call to signal her friends to her approach and got rapped on the head by Tatsuki. Remember that we're supposed to be sneaking around, we can't be making noise, Tatsuki admonished the girl. Hoot, Shad gave a deep hoot in response as he appeared, straight faced as usual. Secret, a secret meeting, Tatsuki growled, squeak. That one isn't even a bird, Tatsuki raised her voice. It's supposed to be a rabbit, Rukia smiled, I was practicing, pretty good, huh? Rabbits don't squeak, Ichigo sweat dropped, well, we're all here, what's the plan, Ichigo? Where do we find this thing? Tatsuki turned to the boy. Well, this is where it happened in the first place, I thought starting here and moving outward would be the best idea, Ichigo explained to them as they huddled together. What does it look like? Rukia asked, it's got a mask for a face and a black body with no legs, like a snake. Ichigo described the beast. Can something like that exist? Orihime asked worried, giving another cough. Technically no, Ichigo said that the vice admiral made them, so they should NT, Chad told the girl. All we have to do is find it. Ichigo pulled a pack from his back and handed out rope, if anyone of us finds it, we should call the others, and then we can all gang up on it and tie it up, he said. How long are we going to be at this? Orihime asked. We can't stay out all night or our parents will get worried in the morning. Tatsuki pointed out. We should have about three hours before we have to worry about the sun coming up, so we should start heading home in two and a half hours. You actually thought this through, I am impressed, Tatsuki laughed. Just be careful, guys, this thing has brought down islands, so we have to be cautious, Ichigo ignored the jab. Alright, the creature capture squad is ready to roll, Orihime placed her hand in the middle of the huddle expectantly, jittering excitedly as she shifted her eyes to her friends repeatedly. Fine. Sure Ichigo placed his hand on top of hers followed by the rest before they all raised them into the air and moving along with their mission. The group searched high and low, never straying too far from their neighborhood as they searched for the beast, in parks, the empty streets, mom and pop shops, and even homes that had left their blinds open, they climbed trees and buildings for higher vantage points and kept their ears trained on any monstrous or out of the ordinary sound in the dead of night. After two and a half hours, nothing, yawn absolutely nothing. Rukia rubbed her eyes as everyone met back up where they started. Maybe it hibernates, or he may offered, I don't think those guys would have such a finicky monster, Tatsuki's head bobbed, forcing herself to stay awake. This doesn't make any sense, he planned to wipe the island out, so I thought we'd be able to find the thing no problem, Ichigo thought to himself. Ichigo. The voice exclaimed suddenly as footsteps were heard coming toward the children. Hey there, kids, what are you doing out so late? Jin appeared with his wicked grin still present on his face, don't you know that dangerous monster is on the loose? A deadly pressure suddenly washed over them as Jin opened his eyes ever so slightly, showing his blue eyes that held no comfort for the children. Why don't ya let ol Jin take you home, where's that monster at then? Ichigo asked bravely, standing ahead of the others, we haven't seen it all this time, so what did you three do with it? Oh, would you be accusing me of something? Jin mocked. Enough playing, Jin. They know too much already, not that it will matter for much longer, Tosin appeared next behind the children. It finally began to sink in, just how much danger they were really in, even more so than if they had just run into the beast, surrounded by adults, marines, on both sides with no hope of escape and completely at their mercy. It was then that another pair of footsteps came up beside Jin, revealing Vice Admiral Aizen Sosuke himself, his gentle smile on his face despite the dire situation, knowing how everything would play out in his favor. Hello children, he said simply addressing them as nothing but what they were to him, children. I it's him, 
Even the brave Tatsuki took a step back in fear. Answer me, Aizen. Where's the monster? Ichigo had enough of the games. Huh, monster? Are you sure you want to address Sora-san in such a way? Aizen looked to Ichigo with half-lidded eyes. What? Orihime felt a pit open up in her stomach, coughing more as her emotions ran high. You didn't deign to tell your friends specifically who had been attacked the other night, Ichigo-kun? Ichigo grit his teeth as the eyes of his friends fell on him, Sora was the one that got attacked, he said difficultly. Then who was that today? Rukia gulped, simply an illusion I created, Aizen explained, no need for any specifics, put plainly, you and everyone around you saw Sora when in reality it was a body double that I had acting as him perfectly. Then, Ni Chan, Orihime didn't dare say it, he is dead, nothing more than a mindless beast, as Ichigo kun said. Aizen smiled when the girl fell to her knees in a coughing fit with tears running down her face. Orihime. Tatsuki ran to her side in an instant, why, Aizen, what did any of us do to deserve this? Ichigo swept his arm out to his friends but it extended to every victim that met this fate. A god needs an army, Aizen answered, you are trying to play a god. Ichigo roared, taking a step forward, but Chad stopped him before he could go too far. No, not playing, the vice admiral answered, I fully intend on it, but I need numbers, soldiers willing to fight, the man looked to the night sky, these mindless beasts aren't worth anything, perhaps it's because, I need better subjects, Aizen looked Ichigo in the eye at that. Aizen. Ichigo brushed Chad off him and rushed at the marine, intent on striking him with all his strength. Ichigo, stop. The voice called too late, Ichigo was caught by the man, his fist inches from Aizen's face. Bringing the boy up to meet his eyes, Aizen grabbed Ichigo's face and spoke, thank you, Ichigo-kun, for acting just as I expected you to. What? He mumbled out through the squishing of his cheeks. Acting brash and hot-headed, ready to take me on if it meant protecting all those precious to you but it all amounted to nothing, Aizen turned the boy's head back to his friends. Orihime was still sobbing and coughing. Tatsuki was trying to comfort her, Chad stood at the ready, though for what, he wasn't completely sure, and Rukia kept her eyes on Tosin. Your choices have only made the destruction of this island hasten, Aizen kept the struggling boy watching, you observed the process for yourself, did you not hear me, did you not see what happens to those in a panicked state after being attacked by my hollows? Ichigo just glared at the man from the corner of his eye, struggling to pry Aizen's hand from his face. And you foolishly brought the sister of said monster to this little gathering. What are you talking about? Did you do something to Orihime? Tatsuki shouted. No, her brother did. Aizen chuckled. I want soldiers that have nothing but power, no memories, no morals, hollows or what I would call mangled corpses that move, scurrying and devouring in a vain attempt to reclaim what was lost to them, and one way of doing that is going after loved ones first. At that, a familiar white liquid burst from Orihime's face, shocking those that hadn't seen it before but filled Ichigo with anger and dread all at the same time, he knew what was coming, and it was happening to one of his friends, damn it. Orihime. A funny thing, without intense emotion the progression of my virus can be rather slow, it's normally nothing more than a trifle seeing as most feel that intense fear being attacked by a hollow, but since you had to snoop Ichigo-kun I had to intervene and overwrite what Orihime-chan had seen the night prior, when her brother had bit into her. Aizen said without a hint of remorse. You bastard, Ichigo kept trying ever harder to escape the mon's grasp and make him pay. You were the one that allowed her to come along, refraining from telling her the truth that led to her predicament, her intense fear of me, the extreme sadness of knowing the truth, it sped up the process. You, Tatsuki stood up, or he may face down next to her with the white muck bubbling in time with her breathing, turn her back, turn her back right now. There is no cure, that would be foolish on my part. There is only one way to be immune and you kids wouldn't have access to such rare means, Aizen explained. Then what if they turn on you? Rukia looked over her shoulder at the man. Hollows are beasts, if they sense someone stronger than them, they are brought to heal. Aizen's smile grew slightly as the moon glinted off his glasses, just like your friend in just a few minutes. You liar! Tatsuki ran at Aizen, jumping up to kick him in his smug face. Just as her leg was about to reach him, Tatsuki gasped in pain blood coming from her mouth as her eyes widened and she flew backward, no one had seen anything happen, nothing flew at Tatsuki, nothing knocked her from her charge, yet somehow a hole had appeared where her neck met her collarbone. Behind Aizen, Jin had sheathed his blade, Tatsuki, Ichigo cried. The girl laid motionless on the ground, but it didn't stop the detestable white liquid from shooting from her face. It was all falling apart, and Ichigo couldn't do anything to stop it. By that point, Orihime's body had finally picked itself up the white gunk has almost completely covered her face, only one eye was still left uncovered, 
her normal brown eyes had become pitch black with a crimson red pupil until that was covered by the mask as well. Without a moment's hesitation, the monstrous Orihime attacked Chad from behind, sinking her teeth into his side. The gentle giant didn't have any time to react, falling to the ground in a heap, his blood spilling onto the ground and dripping from the former young girl's masked jaws. Roared. She roared standing over her friend's body. Orihime, stop. Rukia reached out to the girl, taking her eyes off Tosin which was a major mistake. The dark-skinned man was upon her instantly and ran her through with his sword, sliding her body off it as if she were trash. Stop. Ichigo wailed, falling to his knees when Aizen let him go. You should feel ashamed, Ichigo-kun, look at what you have wrought because of your impatience, Aizen taunted the boy. Ichigo. Rukia struggled out one last time and she joined the other children as hollows, a final look of horror on her face when the liquid burst from her. No. Ichigo pounded the ground, tears flowing in fury and anguish. Man, kid, if you're this broken up, I'd hate to see your face when you get home, Jin offhandedly mentioned. The boy perked up at that, his eyes red as he turned to the silver-haired marine, what do you mean by that? What did you do to my family? The same thing that will happen to you, Tosin calmly told the enraged boy, those that know of our secret needed to be dealt with first, Tosin turned his blind gaze on the distraught boy. Did you not find it odd that Sora-san was not what met you and your band out here this night? Aizen asked. A cold shiver ran through Ichigo when he heard that, his fingers dug into the ground as they formed fists. If you want to see, I'd suggest that you hurry along, I only led Sora-san to your home, I can't control his new nature, Aizen offered the boy. You stay away from them, Ichigo stood up, we're actually heading over now to make sure the job has been completed, Ichigo-kun. Aizen turned away from the boy and began walking in the direction of the Kurosaki clinic, you're more than welcome to come, that is if you make it through those friends of yours without succumbing yourself. Looking behind him, Ichigo saw that all his friends had become grotesque monsters just like Sora, nothing in their eyes but an intense hunger that shook Ichigo to the core as they looked at him, or more appropriate, through him. Don't do this, Ichigo shouted to them, taking a step backward, glancing behind himself, he saw Aizen and his followers' backs getting further away. Ichigo, move. The voice alerted the boy, making him dodge, the voice debated with itself before it made a decision, I don't like this, Ichigo, but we don't have a choice, you're going to have to draw me. Draw you? Ichigo asked, yes, the culmination of your spirit and the embodiment of my power, the voice took a pause, but know this, once you draw me, I can't be returned, the only way it'll disappear is when you die. Fine then, Ichigo resolved, and with his permission given a blue aura burst from Ichigo's chest followed by the hilt of a sword plunging his hands to his chest, Ichigo drew an oversized katana from his chest that Ichigo slightly struggled to lift. Hmm, now I see, Aizen cast a look back to the boy and saw the spectacle, I wondered why he hadn't yet transformed despite his great anger, a lucky boy indeed, to have eaten a devil fruit, Aizen chuckled in amusement, never slowing his stride. How am I supposed to use this thing? I am not a swordsman, you know, Ichigo shouted in his mind. And who's the one that wanted to come here in spite of my warnings? If you had taken this slowly, we could have had a few lessons, Ichigo could imagine the voice with a stern I told you so expression after that sentence. So, what am I supposed to do with it? Ichigo sweat as his friends stalked toward him. You'll have to strike them down, the voice didn't mince words. You can't be serious, I can't do that, they're my friends. Not anymore, the voice stated, they aren't human anymore, the best thing to do for them is, put them out of their misery. The hollows lunged at the frozen boy who managed to block them with his blade but the strength behind it sent him flying back, he skidded to a stop, afraid for his life and that of his friends. I suppose it is too much too quickly to expect him to do something like this, he's still only a child, the voice thought to itself, at the very least, you have to defend yourself, Ichigo, the voice conceded, you have to find an opening and flee back home, the voice compromised. Fine, Ichigo looked to his former friends and did his best. The boy defended himself from their animalistic attacks, taking a few nicks along the way while trying his best to keep the damage to a minimum, the destruction roused the populace of Karakura, and that caused the monsters to abandon their pursuit of Ichigo in favor of the weaker meals. Ichigo looked down as he sped through the streets, doing his best to ignore the screams he heard, he couldn't save them all, he wasn't even sure if he could save anyone, but had be damned if he didn't try. Looking behind him, Ichigo saw that had ran a fair distance farther than had anticipated, and he didn't feel fatigued at all from his evading. What's going on? You didn't think all you're in my power would be as a sword, did you? The voice chimed in, you aren't just a human anymore, you've only scratched the surface of your abilities, but that can wait until this tragedy is over. Ichigo nodded, 
gulping when had arrived in front of his home. The Kurosaki clinic had a gaping hole on its upper level and its windows were shattered, Sora was here, maybe he still was, he had to find out if his family was okay. Dad! Ichigo burst in and gasped, directly in front of him was his family, all of them laid out in the putrid, disgusting white matter of hollow masks had already begun to spread on their faces, and at the end of the hallway were the three detestable marines that had started all of this. You've arrived, Ichigo-kun, but as you can see, you are too late, shadows stretched across Aizen's face menacingly. Shame, they could have really used your help, kid, when we showed up, they didn't even care about the hollow, they just wanted to know where you were. Jin put a hand to his cheek in mock concern. If you had gone with your father's plan, you wouldn't have found yourself here, boy, there would have been casualties of course, but lives could have been saved all the same, Tosin looked to the downed Kurosakis. Ichigo grit his teeth and readied his sword to fight not caring if he'd die or not. No, Ichigo. Ishin grabbed his son's foot, you can't fight them, you'll die, you have to run. Get out of here before we come after you, Ishin pleaded. No, don't talk like that, I have to save you, I am sorry I didn't listen, Ichigo cried. Then listen to me now, you have to get out of here and live, or else Karakura will disappear entirely, Ishin shouted. Aizen appeared in front of the duo with his sword drawn, wise words, Kurosaki-san, if only your son had paid attention to you in the first place, perhaps you were disappointed in naming him he who protects since he has failed so spectacularly, Aizen looked down at the two, raising his sword. Of course not, Ishin smiled, getting up and standing in front of his son, everything he's done was to protect everyone on this island, he did his best but he's still just a kid, hell grow up to be greater than either of us realize, not a hint of doubt was in his voice. You dare talk back to Lord Aizen, Tosin growled at the pathetic man, taking a step forward. Stay away from Ichi Ni. Yuzu grabbed the mon's foot and Karen followed as she grabbed the other. Don't touch him, impressive, you're all going to die, and you'd rather help the person that made it happen? Jin asked. Don't lie, Ichi Ni would never hurt anyone, it's all your fault, Yuzu shouted. And even if he did do it, were his family, Wed help him out of any trouble he's in, Karen yelled. Ichigo dropped to his knees and cried at his family's declaration, he couldn't hold it back any longer, they were defending him after all this after his actions caused the widespread chaos that was happening on the island much more quickly than if had stayed put. A nice sentiment, that you can take with you to your grave, Aizen coldly stated, his glasses gleaming as all three Kurosaki were cut down. Ichigo couldn't muster the strength to move as he saw his family hit the ground again and the transformation process speeding up, he let out sobs as the tears flowed freely from his eyes and snot dripped from his nose letting his sword fall to the ground. Goodbye, Kurosaki Ichigo, Aizen walked past the boy with his subordinates. Normally, all witnesses would be dealt with by the virus. But you are lucky enough to possess a devil fruit the only thing that makes you immune, it should be considered a blessing, but now it is a curse, I won't kill you because there is no need, the people you worked so hard to save will do the job for me, unless you survive, Aizen stopped at the door and looked to the crying boy, the odds are stacked against you, but I meant what I said when I told you, you have potential so live and show me that I wasn't wrong. With that Aizen, Jin, and Tosin all took their leave the hollows of the island all keeping their distance as they hunted the stragglers down, the destruction didn't phase them in the slightest, walking calmly through the wreckage and rubble. Ah! Ichigo's cries could be heard even from where they were, the boy lifting his head and looking to the heavens as he bawled his eyes out powerfully. His friends, his family, his island, they were all gone, and he was the only one left. Ichigo! You have to pull yourself together, the boy shook in place, crying. TCH. The voice saw through the boy's eyes that his family's transformation was almost complete, and if Ichigo was here to witness it, there would be no chance of survival. Ichigo, I know that everything seems bad right now, the voice began, I know that you probably just want to lay down and die, the click of the voice's teeth were heard, but if you do, then who is going to avenge them? Ichigo twitched a bit when had heard that, you have to survive, so, you can save everyone from this existence, so you can prove Aizen wrong so you can avenge their deaths. Ichigo wobbled, forcing himself to move, you can't do any of that if you die here. Still crying, the boy placed his hand around his sword's handle and made his way out of his home, not bringing himself to look back at what had become of his family, he saw the wasted town, devoid of life and completely taken by the hollows, yet pressed on while wiping his face. On Aizen's ship, we wasted all that time allowing you to hunt this monster, yet it all amounted to nothing? A voice that was not pleased spoke on a den den mushi. It's unfortunate, but that is the truth, sir, we weren't able to stop the spread of its disease, so, Karakura will also have to be closed off to the populace as well, Aizen spoke. Three islands, Aizen. You said you could handle it and cure those afflicted, 
yet he see no results. You will have to be punished for failing to save those lives. A vice admiral should have pride and urgency. I will accept any punishment, we are turning for headquarters now, Aizen kept a level head. Very well, Ka Chok how dare he speak to you like that, Tosin growled. It's fine, the fleet admiral trusted me and I failed his expectations, but he'll be able to get out of punishment. You always did have a magic touch when it came to Sengoku, and I didn't think he played favorites, Jin smiled. There's nothing magic about it, Aizen gave a genuine smile, not giving away anything. Come, always so enigmatic, so, Jin looked back to the dead island, why leave the kid alive? That's pretty cruel, even for you, better to kill him and put him out of his misery, trapped on an island where everyone you've ever known is trying to kill Yaw. Aizen just stared out at the sea before he answered, he reminds me of someone that found themselves in a similar situation and managed to come out of it stronger, it would be a waste if he died without seeing where he could end up. You mean you weren't just taunting when you told him he had potential? Jin rose a brow and lost his smile. Aizen turned with his own smirk, no, I wasn't, back in Karakura. The sun had finally made its way into the sky, the silence in the town meant that Aizen had told the truth when saying hollows were nocturnal unless provoked. Ichigo leaned against a wall, cleaning his face with his knees hugged to his chest and his sword leaning by his side, the deathly quiet of his home unnerved him, no bustling marketplace, no pedestrians. No more dojo, you can relax for now, but we'll have to find shelter before too long and stock up on provisions, the voice spoke up. Why you said that I have more power, right? Ichigo asked. After a moment of silence, the voice answered, yes. Then teach me how to use it, I won't be pulling any punches. Fine by me, I need to get stronger strong enough to beat all these hollows and give everyone peace, strong enough to beat Aizen, Ichigo took in a deep breath and shouted at the top of his lungs. Strong enough, so I can protect everyone, then I'll teach you, until you learn my name, call me sensei. End flashback, after ten long years, Ichigo was almost finished with his mission. Looking back, there were times had almost died to hollows that he wasn't ready for, times where he was weak from hunger because he couldn't travel to certain sections of Karakura without running into more hollows than he could count, times he had to rest and recover from injuries, hiding from the hungry beasts. And there were good times as well, when he finally learned Zanjetsu's name and unlocked his Shikai and, the time he had finally cleared an entire sect of Karakura, allowing him to return home and shoddily rebuild it, when he found the book of the populace so he could start marking the names down, and see how close he was to being finished, learning just what had eaten from the library. Had had many ups and downs in the past decade, and now it was all culminating to this final bout with these final hollows, of his family. The only thing that stood between him and leaving the island to hunt his greater prey, is you. Ichigo pointed Zanjetsu at the hollow across from him, he was ready to be free, the end, thanks for watching, also remember to subscribe and like this video, see you in the next video.